and it is 10.01. Um, I want to welcome everyone for the public that is watching that like to participate in the work session. Um, we have a dial-in number, and we will repeat it during the meeting. The number is 1-888-788-0099 or 1-312-626-6798. You'll need to enter the meeting ID number, and it is 891-5473-4082, and then you hit pound. We will repeat that during the meeting, and we will ask for public comment after each item on the agenda. I'd like to welcome the new board. Um, I will be your chairman until January, and then in December we will vo vote for um, chair, vice chair, etc. Um, I would like to have to go around to the new commissioners or even really the commissioners just to go quickly around the room because during our elections as many here know they were district races and other people in the community really didn't get to meet you and 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 hear what you know what what your profession is etc so I'd like to go around and just have everybody introduce themselves for the public I'm going to just start with Reggie. Might as well just go all around to everybody. Reggie's been here, but can you just sit what district you represent, what you do for a living, et cetera, <laughs> besides morning. this? Good morning, everyone. For the, for the record, my name is Reggie Bellamy. I'm District 2, Manatee County. I'm also the Executive Director of the Palmetto Youth Center, and I impact the community for a living. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin Van Austinbridge. Good morning. My name is Kevin Van Austin Bridge, and I represent District 3, which is West Bradenton, Anna Maria Island, and Longbow Key. Uh, I'm a realtor with Boyd Realty, and I am a native, actually, I'm a third generation resident of Manatee <coughs> County. Great. Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa Baugh, as Mickey Palmer said, I'm the seasoned veteran of the new <laughs> commissioners. Uh, District 5, which is out east, um, out to the county line. So nice to have all the new commissioners here today. Oh, that's right, you're not going. Uh, <clears throat> George Cruz, uh, District 7. That is one of the two at-large districts, so uh, I represent everybody in Manatee County. Uh, my background is commercial real estate finance. I've got a, a debt fund for that, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Good morning. I'm Misty Servia. I represent District 4, which is South Manatee County, and my background is urban planning. Good morning, my name's James Satcher. I represent District 1, the north side of the county, and uh, my background is as a pastor, and I'm excited about being here this morning. And welcome. My name is Carol Whitmore. I'm um, a registered nurse, still working, and I think almost everybody up here still has a second job, so that's good. Um, so we're out in the community, and I've been on the board, as you all know, since 2006. And I'm honored uh, to be here with all the new commissioners. This is my 12th election, so I've been through new commissioners before. And um, it's great to have different ideas and um, move things forward. And it was a great election, so welcome, everybody. Uh, I do want to um, remind every, uh, the commissioners that are here, the best thing uh, that I've learned since I've been on the board is to read all your material before the meetings, if you can. That, uh, and if you have any questions, what my practice has been, and I have brought this up at the commission meetings, I do my um, agendas, and I know George seems like you do yours early too. Um, and I write, I email my questions to the county attorney and the county administrator, usually on Sunday night, because we always meet Mondays before the meeting with any questions. So they're kind of prepared. They can find out from staff if they don't know the answer, and that just helps our meetings go smoother, and it helps, um, you know, get the correct information and not at a fly at a meeting. Um, all seven of us here today represent 411,000 people. We all have our districts, but we represent everybody, as you all know. Um, I just am excited. We are, we are going to project leadership, respect, and compassion on this board, and I know we will. And um, those of you, we all went through a tough race, some of you. You re the people that were vocal against you, you, re you represent them today. We represent everybody. So it's always hard after an election and people trash you and then, then you got to work with them. 
but you can do it. Everybody can do it. So again, I wanted to welcome the board. And um, with that, our first item on the agenda is Children's Services Dedicated Millage. And I'm going to have Sherry start out with that. And Sherry, I would like you to tell the commission, because there are new commissioners here, your history with Children's Services. <laughs> Okay, I'll be quick about it. Good morning, uh, Madam Chairman, Commissioners. I, too, on behalf of the County Administration, want to welcome back Commissioner Ball for her new term and the new Commissioners, <coughs> Commissioner Sasser, Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Van Austinbridge. Thank you very much for uh, participating and wanting to get on board. Uh, you have some uh, various work session items today. The first one you'll be starting off with is the annual report from the Children's Services Dedicated Millage update, and we have staff here. This is a program that was started through referendum back in 1991, so it was voted by the voters, a very slim margin, but at the time there was a number of citizens who came forward and encouraged a creation of this so that it would help to fight uh, for abuse, neglected, abandoned, and at-risk children. Um, I do know some things about it. It was, um, we helped write the ordinance, that 91-42. I don't want to take away the rest of the thunder from the staff because they're going to go through a lot of this history. But you do have a 13-member advisory board. So you have a group of people that spend the entire year studying the effects of the um, programs that are funded and do a good job for this board and for the citizens of making sure that um, you are getting results. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Director Ava Eady of the Neighborhood Services Department and her staff. Good morning, County Commissioners, and welcome new commissioners, and glad to see all your smiling faces. Um, it's been a beautiful morning already with the weather, and I'm glad to be here. County Administrator and County Attorney Clegg, um, glad to be here. Ava Eady, Neighborhood Services, as Sherry mentioned, and I'm joined this morning by Susan Ford, our Human Services Program Manager for Children's Services, and Debbie Tapp, who is our United Way Sun Coast representative, and she is our CSAB, Children's Services Advisory Board Chairperson. And as Sherry mentioned, this dedicated millage serves the at-risk and neglected, economically disadvantaged children of our community. And to really see the work this board does to prioritize the need, bringing their expertise to the board, is very important. So they have an update, and uh, Susan will talk today a little bit about Results First, which is our initiative to ensure that we are having human gains in this area, and we have some demonstrable gains. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Ford. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, county attorney, and county administrator. Um, we're here this morning to talk about our, our children's services. I um, want to start with a little bit of history. I'm going to go ahead and. Um, the Manatee Community Council for Children, a concerned group of local professionals and volunteers, spent years looking for ways to help our children at risk. Uh, the council wanted a program that was accountable to the public, didn't create another layer of bureaucracy, and would add to existing funds. The children's referendum was our answer to that. The Children's Services Dedicated Millage was established in 1991 with the adoption of Ordinance 9142. The ad valorem tax referendum passed by 51% of voters. The purpose was to invest in programs, as been, has been said a little bit this morning, <laughs> to serve abused, neglected, at-risk, and economically disadvantaged children under the age of 18 and their parents. In 1991, there were seven programs, and the cost was $300,000. Today, in 2020, the investment has grown to $12 million for 56 programs. Go ahead. The adoption of Resolution 9169 provided a mechanism to establish the Manatee County Children's Services Ordinance, known as 9142. The purpose of the ordinance is to implement the provisions of Resolution 9169 and provide for the dedicated millage for children's services. 
some of the some of the uh, parts of the ordinance are to establish general terms and conditions for funding, development, and provision of the operation of programs, to include enhancement and expansion of existing programs, as well as new and innovative programs for the prevention and treatment of Manatee County's neglected, abused, at risk, or economically disadvantaged children, and provide essential and necessary programs to serve them. These funds may be used for programs which may include, but not be limited to, programs that provide guidance and psychological care for children, programs that provide for the care of dependent children, and to provide other services for children as the county determines are needed for the general welfare, and to provide funds for agencies in the county which are operated for the benefit of children, provided they are not included under the exclusive jurisdiction of the public school system to provide services directed toward developing, maintaining, and restoring the integrity of the family, to provide programs that benefit the prenatal care that will serve to reduce problems of potentially at-risk children, and to establish the Manatee County Services Advisory Board, their memberships, and their scope of authority to recommend funding to the Board of County Commissioners. Next. The ordinance provides the makeup of the board, which includes a representative of the United Way, our chair, Debbie Tapp, who's here today, a criminal justice representative, our vice chair, Connie Shingledecker, who's in the audience today, a DCF representative, Kim Kutch, a school board member, Charlie Kennedy, a pediatrician, Dr. George Van Buren, a licensed mental health professional, Kelly Hunt, an NAACP representative, Ms. Rita Smith, Five child advocates, Extavia Bailey, our former chair, Amy Diss, Janin Pierce, Dr. Sandra Stone, our former vice chair, and Gail Wynn, and a judge of the Family Law Division. That seat is currently vacant. These are all great folks with a vast knowledge base who are dedicated to the children in our committee, community. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Debbie Tapp, our chair, to talk about the powers and duties of the CSAB. Uh, I think they have to wipe the other mic. Yeah. Debbie, you may want to tell everybody how long you've been on this board. <laughs> I don't remember. I know, I think maybe since the beginning. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, not quite then. Uh, well, thank you. Um, commissioners uh, for this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the Children's Services Advisory Board. Uh, I'm Debbie Tapp. I've been a longtime Manatee County resident, raised my kids here, and um, been on this board for several years, probably nine-ish, I guess, uh, but been involved in, the, in community nonprofits all my life, basically. Um, as you heard, we have a great group of uh, people on the board with a wide range of expertise and a very important part of our duties is to um, review and evaluate data gathered from various uh, sources uh, to determine the ongoing and emerging needs of children and families in our community. Uh, then we have an annual retreat, usually in October, where we look at the data and the facts and uh, each member brings forth uh, expertise from their area and uh, we determine um, our investment goals and priorities and develop a plan and report which will be coming to you in December, so look forward to that. This includes the uh, long-range priorities and uh, any special initiatives that we determine are needed, a uh, breakdown of the current fiscal year investments, and uh, reports on uh, last year's investments and demographics of the children and families served. Then comes the evaluation period, and this is a very important period. Um, the application for funding is usually in uh, January and February, and then in early March we start our review uh, process, and uh, that takes quite a bit of time and effort, 
and is over uh, eight or ten weeks we we meet weekly and review the applications that are provided this past cycle we received uh, 54 applications uh, and requesting a total of over 14 million and as Susan stated we had about 12 million to um, invest so you can see that some hard decisions had to be made uh, following the review process, we bring our recommendations to you all for approval. As I mentioned, it takes a lot of time and effort to review um, each application, and I can assure you that all the members take this responsibility seriously. Uh, we use a scoring matrix, which has about 30 different scoring areas that are broken down into these four main categories. First of all, agency strength, we look at um, does the agency um, have the capacity to bring forward a, a good uh, quality <coughs> program, uh, their financial condition, their leadership, and how sustainable it is. Then we look at the difference made, and this is the result. Um, what human gain is made from the, the program? How clear and impressive are the results? and uh, what verification tools do they use. Uh, this area has seven different components that we score on, so it's very important. Then the likelihood of the difference being made, uh, they, they give us their proposed results and we have to judge uh, will they be able to deliver those results. So we examine um, various predictive factors, their, their past success, um, are they continually learning and improving their key staff uh, and program staff and essential partners? Then we come to uh, decisions of the best use of the money. And so this is where we look at the big picture and have to compare uh, one investment to another and the results that would be provided. So each CSAB member reviews and scores uh, separately. And then weekly we have a, a full discussion, a robust discussion of the uh, merits of each program. And then at the end we look at the big picture and try to um, recommend to you the investment portfolio that we think will accomplish the desired community results. So we know that uh, some of the issues for children are complex and they take time to move the needle. And we wanted to be able to measure results over time, so we've come up with some long-term established priorities. Um, so they are, the first three priorities are related to child welfare. And you can see including uh, gaining a permanent stable home after being removed from their home. <coughs> Uh, remaining in their home free from abuse and neglect and families formed by adoption are stable and supported so these this deals with the most vulnerable children the fourth one refers to a countywide um, priority of reading on grade level by the end of third grade and for those of you who haven't heard about this I can't imagine that anybody hasn't but uh, the third grade milestone is very important because up until third grade, up until through third grade, uh, children learn to read, and then after that point, they're expected to be able to read to learn. So if you're not on grade level at the end of third grade, you're going to get behind her and behind her. So, um, and then the final priority is regarding children learning age-appropriate social skills and uh, emotional uh, behavioral well-being. So even though uh, programs addressing these priorities get first consideration, we do fund a lot of other programs that are outside these priorities. So I'm going to hit you with some data. Um, this is the child welfare data that we do monitor. And um, you can see the top uh, left hand is children exiting foster care within 12 months of entering and you can see that we're a little 
below the um, state standard on this. But the next one to its right <clears throat> indicates that children exit foster care in the 12 to 23 month period. And you can see we're a little better than state standard on that. So even though we don't quite meet the 12 month, we get them within a few months after that. The bottom two um, are rate of uh, placement moves over a thousand days and not re-entering foster care after within 12 months of, of being in a permanent home. And you can see that we have some work to do there. It does kind of vary mm -hmm. year to year. <clears throat> the next one is the educational data that we monitor. Uh, this has to do with the, the grade level reading. And you can see students scoring kindergarten ready district wide has increased, so that's good. Um, we want kids to be ready to enter kindergarten so they don't start out behind. But you can see um, that in our Title I schools, we still have some work to do because only about a third of our kids in Title I schools enter kindergarten ready to learn. The bottom chart is the third grade <coughs> reading. And as you know, there's a standardized tests at the, in third grade. And you can see going down is good because we're, we're counting the ones that are below grade level. So we want that to go down. And we've made some progress, as you can see. Uh, we still have a long way to go because obviously there's about half of our kids that are not reading on grade level at the end of third grade. Um, and you'll notice that um, testing was not done in the 1920 school year, so it's not showing there because of the uh, lockdown for COVID. But hopefully we're still on the right track. Next is a disciplinary uh, data that we monitor, and this is from the school board. Uh, it, these charts refer to uh, referrals for aggression, bullying, harassment, and uh, respectful or inappropriate <clears throat> behaviors. And you can see it, it kind of varies up and down. But I, I wanna remind you that we have um, about 50,000 students in school, so it's, you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at these statistics. The next one is uh, more disciplinary data. And uh, this is for out of school suspensions. And you can see that for middle school and high school, it kind of varies, stays pretty much the same. But um, what we're very concerned about is the incidence of out of school suspension in elementary school, because that yeah. appears to be increasing. Wow. And um, that's, that's a bad way to start out your school career uh, if you're getting out of school suspension. So that's um, very concerning to us. And again, the numbers for um, the 1920 year are not available at this time. <clears throat> so we do have a couple of initiatives um, with the adoption preservation and also um, results first, which you already heard about. Um, if you'll remember back to our, one of our priorities was that families formed by adoption are stable and supported. And several years ago, uh, we had quite a few adoptions that were being dissolved because of family problems. Um, so we took this on as a special initiative and did an RFP. And we're proud to say that uh, the RFP was answered by a collaborative of three agencies working together. And um, you can see that out of the 79 adoptive families that they've served, there's been zero dissolution. So Good. this is uh, really a success story. <laughs> the next initiative is uh, the our results problem first. child. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The next initiative <laughs> is the results first, which is a countywide uh, initiative to focus on results. Um, so we are now investors in results rather than just funder of programs. Uh, used to, we would, you know, report how many kids attended an after-school program. And 
you know, so what? What did they learn? How was their life made better by this program? So that's now what we're focused on, is measuring the human gain rather than just how many people were served. Um, and we're requiring agencies to track their milestones as steps to the, to the results so that they can um, know if a, if a child is making progress toward the result. And I'm going to let Susan tell you a few examples of some of the program highlights. Um, before, does anybody have any questions on what's been presented, or do you want to wait till the end? Wait. I anybody? I don't have okay. a question. I have a comment. Uh, sorry, Reggie, go ahead. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Um, and obviously, everybody knows I have a school district background. And I don't think last year, um, the ATOS programs were, were funded, and those are um, alternative to out of school suspensions. Uh -huh. And I think there's a reflection here. I got an echo for some reason. I, I think there's a reflection here when we start talking about incidents of out of school suspension. And, and my, my comment is when an individual has been suspended from school, right, and their parents still have to go to work, the school district did a great job in providing the ATOS program which allow the um, students to be, to more like receive an in-school suspension, not ISS, a timeout, but those were, that were suspended, they actually were allowed to go to a school with, with, with stricter confinement because they're suspended. And I don't think we funded that last year, and I, and I just think we need to, and I may be wrong, I may be wrong, um, because there, I received some questions, but there's a, a reflection there, and I just want us to kind of be mindful of that um, when we start talking about incidents of out of school suspension because obviously if they don't have nowhere to go and their parents have to go to work it's going to be a domino effect of issues um, and they'll probably be out in, in the community doing um, mischievous things which is what we want to prevent um, so I, I just want to make a comment on that on how that kind of connects and the importance of the ATOS program and so everybody can kind of be mindful of that thank you uh, thank you and what we're seeing in the elementary that that's uh, glaring when uh, an elementary school kid is getting suspended from school. So you'll tell us more information if there's been anything addressing that. I know we all as a board look every year at something that's glaringly in front of us and then we ask you to look at programs to resolve that or you know to help that and uh, to me I'm shocked that 3,000 kids 18, 19 years 18 and 19 were suspended in el from elementary school. <laughs> Yeah. So to me, that was the most glaring thing so far. And, the, and that is the number of, ex, ex, uh, the number suspended rather than the number of kids. So you, it may be the 20, 80, 20 year rule that mm -hmm. a kid is getting suspended several times. So we do need to look at that data. And Reggie brings up a good um, example of the decisions that we have to make. Um, you know, we, we want programs that address these problems, but we want quality programs. Right. So that's always a discussion in, in our meetings that, you know, if, if a program is not getting the results that we, we need, you know, we have that decision of whether to go out and do an RFP for the results that we want or continue funding a program that that is not, uh, maybe not up to par to where we want it to be. So that, that's Thank you. part of the hard part. <laughs> and I asked for questions because before you left, I, before we wiped the mic, instead of going back and forth, right. I figured that's why I did that. All right, then, uh, Madam Chair? Yep. If I may, a couple of questions. Um, on the number of referrals for disrespectful, disruptive, and inappropriate behaviors for secondary schools. I see it's gone up. Mm -hmm. It went up substantially from 18, 19. But I know with the school year, it's been kind of strange because of COVID. So I'm just curious as to uh, if you can give us any more insight as to the jump for the disruptive, inappropriate behavior, et cetera. Because it seems to me right now, we probably don't have as many students in school some are not attending, I don't think, because of COVID. So 
why do you think it went up so high? Do you have any ideas on that? I don't because this is school district data, so you know we would need to um, depend on the school, school to interpret this. Um, okay. The only reason I ask, I know it was high back in 17 and 18, but then it came down substantially. So I'm just curious if maybe some of that is COVID and I'm just not picking up on it or whatever. Um, I just found that interesting. All right, thank you. Probably because most of them are going to school. I'm not well, going to school. Well, that's not what I'm going. Yeah. It went up. Well, I know. It's, Commissioner Bellamy. Now, just remember, I used to be a dean. All oh. Right? So just remember, it's, it's, it's a lot going on that has to take place when we say that a kid is going to be suspended. Um, some, of, some of it is their, whatever their act was then. Um, some of it was, you know, the matrix that the school district um, has, depending on the, the type of infractions. Um, but I will say this, um, there, 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 is some, there, there are some issues where um, just clear um, understanding a child and their issues and being able to connect and relate to them has also created some problems in the school district. Now, with school having hybrid and e-learning and things like that, the discipline um, has become a little bit more challenging because I learned um, of some cases last week where students were being suspended because they didn't have their mask on. Well, and, and that data is not even here yet, is what I'm saying. That, that, that data is probably not even here. So when you have an inf infraction, when you have an infraction, it depends on how many different times you've had that infraction, which will lead to a suspension and things of that nature. But I don't think we got to get into those, should get into those weeds right now. I'm just speaking from my own experience. There's a lot that takes place for kids to be suspended. And there's a lot of tolerance <laughs> that takes place from the administrators and everything like that. They don't want to suspend. Yeah, Sherry? Madam Chair, if I can. Okay, Sherry, and then continue. Um, then Commissioner Ball after. I was just, uh, thank you. I was just going to mention these, this great dialogue, and you have representation on the advisory board from all these different areas, school board included. Questions like this, if we're not able to answer today, we'll, we're sending them back through Debbie and Susan. And that's, this is what your advisory board's there to do, to try to go dig a little deeper in these programs. And I'm sure you'll have other questions too. So please feel free to not think that you have to have an answer today, but we definitely can make sure that they do a little bit more research on the, what's actually happening. Thank you. Okay, and Commissioner Ball. Yeah, I, I'm just, um, I'm curious. I look, you know, we look at these figures every year. Sometimes we see them, they fluctuate mm -hmm. every year. But obviously this is something that, um, you know, we're hoping that we can get a grasp on and, and start reducing the figure. So, uh, Commissioner Bellamy, I find it very interesting that, you know, and, and you you certainly know more about this than I do, um, but I'm, I find it very interesting that you feel that some of it just might be how the children, how the interaction is going. Is that correct? Did oh, you definitely. you say so. that? Definitely so. As, as, as well as, and this is an issue that nobody wants to touch, you know, there, there are a lot of mental health issues that kind of lead to suspension also. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's very true. And right. I, I know that <clears throat> there, the reason I'm asking is exactly because of that, because I know there's programs out there um, to, to try and figure out what we need to do. And, and if there's something that we need to improve upon, you know, that's why we're having this meeting. So I really appreciate the figures. I go through this every year, as we all do. Right. And, um, you know, I'm glad the reading seems to be improving. Mm -hmm. That's really good mm -hmm. for third grade reading. Uh, but, you know, the, the uh, disruptive and inappropriate behaviors, elementary school uh, and secondary schools, it, it's concerning. So thank you. I, I might also mention that we have the handle with care system now and Connie's shingle, shingle decker is back there and she uh, with the sheriff's office and if you don't know about that you you know you can find out more about it uh, but that does key the school into children that have had a traumatic experience so that you know some of the behavior can be explained by by what they've been through the night before maybe right exactly so, yeah. commissioner satcher Commissioner Satcher, I get uh, looking forward to saying you this for the first time to you guys. It's official now. Um, so I don't necessarily need answers, but I was just I'm going to be very curious as far as what we're doing to 
get more families, and I had mentioned this uh, before the meeting, more families uh, set up for adoption um, and long-term foster care. So I'm just excited about that. I think that we as a community can kind of uh, step up to the plate and get mm -hmm. more of these kids. All these issues we're talking about, it's going to help them if they're in a stable home. And I think that uh, Manatee County has a lot of uh, wonderful people out there that uh, that might just need a little bit of encouragement, uh, maybe a little recruiting, and um, to, to get them to step up and take these kids because obviously a lot of uh, great things come uh, when you invest in a child's future. Good point. And uh, I'm just going to say something because it doesn't bother me anymore, but... I had a very violent family, and my mom would beat the heck out of my dad that night, and then I'd have to go to school. And I just kind of didn't say a word to anybody. I was afraid of everybody, but my sister was entirely opposite. She would get suspended all the time. So there are always underlying issues, usually, what's going on. And um, I think the data, like Commissioner Boss said, uh, from the school will help us when we make those decisions, but it's not easy. So. Okay, thank you. Um, can we move on? We're all okay to move on? Okay. I think she might have, Madam Chair, I think she Oh, con do we want to do that now? Um, yeah, okay. Um, I was going to, okay, Connie, go ahead. I think she's uh, Connie Shingle, just introduce yourself and say where you're from, and then after that we'll move to Ms. Stone. Okay. I don't know. I guess the mic is on. Hi. I'm Connie Shingledecker. I'm a retired major with Manatee County Sheriff's Office. Um, I still am affiliated with the agency in the reserves, but I, I am the vice chair of the Children's Services Advisory Board, right. among other boards that I sit on. Uh, and uh, Drug Free Manatee introduced Handle with Care into um, through drug endangered children into Manatee County back in 2018. So we have been recognizing that children that are exposed to trauma do not, uh, the learning switches off in many instances the next day. And so um, Handle with Care has been in effect since 2018 and, and it's about law enforcement recognizing when they um, go to a call and a child is present and that the child has been traumatized as a result. It can be a traffic crash, it can be a domestic violence incident, it could be a search warrant, it could be a drug overdose. And as you know, we on average have between two and five overdoses a day. And many of these children are in fact um, traumatized with the things that are going on in that family uh, situation. So the whole idea for the officer is to identify the child. We, that information gets sent to the school, not the details, just the fact that this child was exposed to trauma. Okay. So they don't know the details of the fact that it was a domestic violence or what have you. We have been working with not only the schools but the daycares because they asked for this information as well. So we did some training. Your schools are now becoming more trauma informed and they are more aware of the behaviors that will come with being um, exposed to trauma. So now rather than a punitive action, we are asking the school to recognize that this child's behavior may have been associated with the trauma and to deal with that child in a different context if possible. So I think you may start to see in some areas of the country where Handle with Care has been going on, they have reduced out-of-school suspensions by 50% and some of these disruptive behaviors Good. by over 50%. So that is our goal as we continue to train officers throughout the county and have that information sent and then the school to be more sensitive to the child exposed to trauma so that, again, that will hopefully reduce some of these behaviors. And we do not know, but it might stop the next school shooting incident because you won't have a child that's so angry uh, wondering how come nobody knows what's happening to me. And we work in silos, unfortunately, and so this is a way that we can have an MOU and break out of some of these silos and share this information, not the details, but um, so in, in the hopes that children will be able to learn in school the next day. Great, great, great information. Great. Commissioner Servia. Yes, Connie, I have a question for you. Thank you for that information, and it's such a good program, Handle with Care. But we're identifying children who have been subjected to trauma through the law enforcement uh, aspect. And there's so many other children who face trauma that haven't yet gone, the parents haven't gone through law enforcement. And so is there a way that we can 
identify them based on what we know from the other group of people. Okay, for example, child protection is also sharing that information. So in our county, uh, our child protective workers are able to share that information. A parent can certainly share that information. And we had an incident where a child came to school. She is a Manatee County student, but had gone to Hillsborough County to visit a father over the weekend, was kidnapped and raped. And so when she came back to school, because uh, Hillsborough County is not handled with, scare, with care trained at this point, they did not share the information. When she came back to school, she started talking to her teacher about her experience. So we, we are telling the teachers, when a child um, tells you that they have been exposed to a traumatic event, you can initiate the handle with care. So yes, we're working on ways that we can recognize that and share that within the school system and uh, so that every teacher and principal and assistant principal and nurse will know to handle this child with care. Thank you. Thank you, that just breaks my heart. Um, it's not easy anymore or ever really. So thank God we have programs that we're hearing about. Okay, sorry, okay. we're ready, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. We're trying to preserve uh, the I'm wipes glad there's on the discussion. mics. That's great, this is what we're here for. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap up our update with some examples of a wide range of our program results from fiscal year 1920 res uh, investments of the dedicated millage. Um, the very first one uh, is a centerstone of Florida program called Children's Community Action Team. This program serves kids that normally would be institutionalized because of their behaviors and not be uh, out in the community. Um, their result statement is of the 63 youth served, who were at high risk of an out-of-home placement, 60 improved self-management of their mental health and were able to remain in their school, home, and community. Uh, that's 95% success rate there. Uh, the second program is Family Resources. Uh, this program is called CERTAIN and it deals with truants. So that one, the uh, result statement is of the 87 youth served who were truant or at risk of truancy, 60 were not truant for 90 days following completion of the program. Uh, this one had a little bit lower rate, uh, but it was also because of the pandemic. So it kind of cut off their services at the end of the year when school was cut off. Uh, the next one is also that same agency, Family Resources. Um, it's a shelter called Safe Place to Be. It's a temporary shelter that deals with children that are runaways or just not fitting into, they're not, gonna, they're not able to stay in their home for some reason or another. Um, in that case, it's of the 123 youth served who were in need of temporary shelter, 111 were able to safely exit the shelter by returning to their guardian or another guardian approved placement. So that one was a 90% success rate. Uh, the last one on this one is Manatee Children's Services Child Advocacy Center. This one serves children um, to prevent abuse. Um, of the 198 high-risk parents served, 146 had no verified findings of child abuse for 18 months following the completion of the program. It's important that they don't just measure at the end of the program, but that they follow through to make sure this, uh, these children are still in a safe placement. Okay. Um, the last three here, uh, we picked Healthy Teens Coalition of Manatee County, which deals with teen health educators. The purpose of this program is for them to avoid risky behaviors and encourage their peers to do the same. This one had a 92% success rate. Okay. Um, the Sarasota Manatee Association for Riding Therapy, uh, this one is therapeutic horseback riding. Uh, it works with children with special needs. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I have a child with autism. Um, this program, sorry, I'm gonna get emotional That's here for okay. a second. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You're all right. Um, this program has saved my child's life. Mm -hmm. um, he is now 20 years old, um, went to the program for five years. He can, he has a full-time job at FedEx as a package handler. Cool. Not what he was trained to do in school, but <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's saved his life. So I can testify this program is great. Um, their results there don't sound all that wonderful. They were a 69% success rate, but with some of these kids, they don't speak. Right. They don't you know, tie their own shoes. They don't do anything like that. So you know, some of them, the goal for them is a very tiny goal, mm -hmm. but it may take something off the parent that they had to do for them before. 
Um, and the last one we picked was the family shelter at Salvation Army. Um, that one deals with homeless families um, and gets them into sustainable housing within six months of entering the shelter. And that one had a 60% uh, success rate, and not because they didn't get them all into successful housing, just in that year's time, they didn't get out and get into the successful housing. And that's all I have. Um, there's an error on our slide presentation. It says therapeutic horseback riding. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> we caught it on your printout. You were just saying if we were correct. reading it. Okay, you were saying <laughs> yeah. if we were reading it. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Any questions or comments? Um, so what's our next? Oh, I heard you said you're coming before us in the future, I guess, to look at you after you're going through all these. And these guys work hard for our new commissioner, Sherry. Um, I know they have knock down, knock, knock out, drag out, whatever, knock down, drag out discussions about trying, because they're going to have to cut, what, $2 million at this next session of, of the applications, correct? Could and be. they spend, this is all volunteer. Yes. And these people spend, what would you say, six weeks every week, yeah. or six to eight weeks to go through these applications? I remember from the last time you told us you also make visits to every, it's mandatory, correct? No, the staff does that. The staff goes That's out every 60 days, but the um, advisory board doesn't do that but anymore. But our staff does go and check, and, and that's important, I think, for um, transparency and where our money's going. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think the commissioners, I think some of the great progress that's been made by Susan and Debbie and the members here, I think um, there's a couple other members out in the audience. Yeah. Uh, uh, Charlie Kennedy from the school board, mm -hmm. and I can't see behind me, but others, but um, is that this is a real hands-on advisory board. They meet at minimum monthly, as you mentioned, during the funding cycle, sometimes six weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. Um, going through each and every application, but I think what what should be known by this group is the staff and the advisory board have worked diligently over the last four years to institute results first so that these these particular recommendations are based on this criteria. It's not easy to get there and it takes years to do it and they're working on your adult service programs as well, but it's an assurance to the community that these these dollars are going to programs that are making a difference and so we, we really appreciate that hard work and uh, commend that advisory board. They're probably the hardest working board that you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hands down. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Ava, did, would you like to say something? No? Okay. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you in December. Mm -hmm. And what will that be? The presentation? We'll of have the annual plan, uh, which you got parts of that um, today. But yeah. there's, there's some of it that's not finished because we can't gather statistics that were just reported at the end of October. So and some what, of that we couldn't finish. And what we will do then is when we get the plan, when it comes before us, we will look at your recommendations and then vote then whether to move forward, correct? Not for the funding recommendations. Those That's are what done I'm talking at about. the budget time. Yeah. Yes, okay. and then what happens is at the first of the year, if you adopt in the report and the recommendations, then staff move forward with making an announcement to the community of what your priorities for the next year are, and the application process begins again. Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay. Good job. Thank you for all your dedication. Thank you. Okay. Does. Um, we don't have, do, let's just take a five minute, what time is it? It's um, 1049. Why don't we take a five minute break? Because then we have the Energy and Sustainability Division. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, sorry. Uh, is there anybody in the public that would like to make a comment regarding this issue? And um, Seth, do you want to mention where they can call if somebody's watching this for public comment via the phone? Yes, Madam Chair, absolutely. Our friends at METV, do they have the phone number that we can place on the screen? Um, but public comment is available today via Zoom. We have our standard phone numbers, and this week's meeting ID is 891-5473-4082. And all this information can always be found at mymanatee.org. And there is no public comment at this time. Okay, and we have Mr. Gibellina up there. So, Glenn, feel free to make a comment. For the record, uh, Glenn Gibellina. And uh, Sherry, great job. You know. You are the, uh, the Michelin of administrators. I give you three stars. Um, I want to bring it, you know, I'm a numbers guy. So my deal is housing and homelessness. In the state of Florida, we have 95,167 homeless students, several hundred here in Manatee County. 
and it's going to con the Sadowski funds, and I noticed you mentioned that, so uh, on the Monday meeting with the uh, Affordable Coalition, there's $224 million sitting in the Sadowski funds that the governor vetoed. So it is now time for this board to act with emails to all the new representatives to get those monies released to fund programs like we have here. And I guess my other question is, is how do you, if you're promised that money and it's not there, how do you, who bridges that gap? Do we cut programs? Do you do a bridge loan out of the general fund? So I can't put those dots together yet. Uh, you know, if you look at the Alice report, you know, it's like beating the drum here again. 44% of our community, our 411,000 people, can't afford rent. Homelessness. You, when you're a student and you're homeless, your learning button goes off. They just, they just can't. They can't sleep. They can't study. They're under stress. It's a terrible way to try to go to school. It just can't be done. So until we wrap our head around the homeless population and what we can do about it, and you know what the answer is, they're spending you know, 40, 50% of their money on rent. They can't sustain market rents. We need to do affordable housing for this group. They need housing. You can do all the Band-Aids you want. You can give them psychological evaluations. You know, Project, Ho uh, Project Heart, the school district, does a good job. They provide uniforms and some other stuff. Those are Band-Aids. Until you get a roof over, those, over their heads, nothing's going to change. It's going to be, it, those numbers won't go down. They'll probably get worse. So that's my, that's my spin on it. And... Uh, we need, to, we need to just continue on. I urge you to write your legislatives. There's a lot of changing of the guards in Tallahassee is now. And by the way, even though it was vetoed, those monies, that's $224 million, is still sitting in the Sadowski Fund. And they don't know what they're going to do with it, so I urge you to email it. And if we get this year's uh, allocation, we're going to have almost a half a billion dollars to work with with the 67 counties. Thanks, Glenn. So it's huge. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public would like to make a comment regarding this issue? Seeing none, we're going to take a break for five minutes. Five minutes okay or ten? Vicki? I mean, five should be good. Five's good. <laughs> James, you want me to help you get on your agenda?
Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, we are um, at our work session and our next item on the agenda is energy and sustainability division presentation. Sounds like an exciting topic. <laughs> <laughs> Who's giving it? Oh, okay. Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. Um, members of the board, uh, next up, as you said, Eric Kaplan from our property management department run by Charlie Bishop, I think is here somewhere. There's Mr. Bishop. If you'd like to introduce your staff. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Sherry. Charlie Bishop, Director of Property Management. Uh, we're here to talk about financial efficiencies and some of the uh, exciting things oh. we've done <laughs> over the last several years. Uh, we have a small division in energy and sustainability led by Eric, uh, four people, uh, but it's very powerful. And uh, we have a lot of benchmarks around the county that we're successful over. And a couple of them, uh, just to bring you uh, up to speed about, is uh, two ESCO projects, energy service contracts that we did starting in 2013, 2014, uh, the major one being downtown. Uh, where we cooperated with FPLS and uh, we spent $12.3 million on a downtown energy plant and other energy efficiency projects. That downtown chiller plant serves the property appraiser, the administration building, uh, the records building, and the central library. We also uh, sell chilled water to the city of Bradenton in their chamber of commerce and parking garage. We're very proud of that. Along with that, we entered into a $7.3 million contract with Amoresco out at the jail and uh, numerous projects saving us water conservation and energy out at the jail. Uh, these projects are just a few, uh, led by our Energy and Sustainability Division, which started out in October 17th of 2014 with Diana Robinson as our very first and only position in that division. Uh, Diana decided to move with her husband to Washington, D.C. and relocated, and uh, that left us uh, with the ability to hire Eric, uh, who we were very happy. Uh, Eric Kaplan serves as the manager of the Energy and Sustainability Division. He oversees energy management and efficiency projects, sustainable initiatives, GIS projects for the property management department, uh, and the county's drone program. Some of the projects Eric manages include solar infrastructure research, greenhouse gas um, inventory, sustainable agricultural GIS applications, internal sustainable building standards, energy consumption benchmarking, and drone inspection projects concerning building repair and park irrigation systems. Before joining Manatee County, Eric worked in the environmental field with both the Florida Department of Health and the Environmental Protection Commission of Hillsborough County. Eric is born and raised in St. Pete, Florida, and has achieved a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of Central Florida, and a double master's in natural resource and policy and environmental engineering from the University of Florida. With that said, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Eric. Good job. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, county leadership. Again, my name is Eric Kaplan. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Division Manager. Uh, along with our team this morning, we're excited to be here uh, in front of you to introduce our team and to speak about the various projects we are completing as the Energy and Sustainability Division. So I would like to briefly introduce our team. Uh, we have Leah Harper, who is right to my left. She is our GIS Analyst 2 or our Geographic Information Systems Analyst 2. Leah works on a plethora of GIS projects and asset management projects. She's also very instrumental in our county's drone program, and she's one of the leads on a research project that we are completing with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council that I will speak to later on in this presentation. We have Wendy Edwards, who is back corner here, who is our newest GIS analyst too, also works on a plethora of GIS projects, including a local agricultural map with UF IFAS that I will speak to later on as well. And she comes with a lot of drone knowledge and is very instrumental in our county's drone program as well. We have Halmar Pachas, who is right behind me. And Halmar, uh, his title is the Buildings and Facilities Technology Coordinator, which is a mouthful, but really it just means he's a jack of all trades. Uh, Halmar completes a lot of building inspections for the county, including thermal roof inspections. Uh, he's very instrumental in our county's drone program as well, helps manage our uh, energy management program. Uh, and he's the keeper of our preferred, preferred building materials manual that we'll speak to later on this presentation as well. Okay. So the purpose or our goal here today uh, is to introduce our team and the many ways we have promoted organizational sustainability, efficiencies and innovation, and continue to do so as we move into the future. We are conducting this presentation in a results first fashion, which I know was mentioned earlier, and it will make Sherry happy. This is a philosophy we're introducing across county departments, 
And really the idea is to outline targets of this presentation we would like you to receive and just to do it in a clear, concise, and direct manner. So our targets for today's presentation are we will speak to some recent team accomplishments, speak to our county's energy management program, talk about a regional solar ener energy research collaborative project, our Florida Green Building Coalition certification, and then our county's drone program and some varying GIS projects that we work on that you may not know. So starting off with some recent sustainability projects that I have been fortunate enough to be involved with over the past year. Uh, we had two collaboration projects with the University of South Florida, their Patel College of Global Sustainability. Uh, these both were completed over the summer and one was specific to creating the county's first greenhouse gas inventory for our county operations and then also creating a solar siting study uh, looking at feasibility of different uh, buildings. Both of these projects were very successful. This was completed during uh, COVID time, so the presentations were online, but they were still very well attended. And the reports that the graduate students presented to us were very robust and comprehensive uh, and very successful as well. So we certainly intend to kind of keep the momentum we've gotten from those projects. And the great thing about these are these are normal projects you would usually have to hire a consultant to do, but fortunately we were able to partner with USF to complete these. We also work with our University of Florida IFAS Extension Office or the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Every county throughout the state has a UF IFAS office and we certainly work closely with ours. A couple of ongoing projects that we're working on is a food systems directory GIS map that Wendy is a lead on. Essentially the idea behind this is creating an interactive GIS map that can showcase our agricultural services throughout the county. Uh, this includes large and small scale farms, farmers markets, local produce stands, and aquaculture areas, among many more. So not only is this a benefit to our local agricultural community to showcase the services they provide, but it's great for our residents as well to you know, find where these services are located. Um, we also are at the very beginning stages of a community compost pilot program. We initially applied for a grant over the summer that we unfortunately weren't awarded, but we're intending to work with our UF IFAS team uh, to move forward with this project. And the idea is to set up a local compost area at one of our county parks to provide compost for the public and to provide some education as well. We also, again, are the keepers of our county's preferred building materials manual that Halmar helps manage. Uh, essentially, this is a manual for our building and construction materials. It's the manual we provide our vendors whenever they're providing work or projects for the county, but there is sustainability language intertwined within the manual as well. Uh, some sustainability language includes, we do all new construction and renovations to lead silver building standards. We encourage the purchasing of Energy Star rated products, whether that's uh, appliances or IT technology. And anytime we are installing new lighting or retrofitting, we install LED lighting. So moving on to our county's energy management program, I do want to spend a couple of slides talking on some past energy saving measures that we've completed as a division. Uh, first, I just want to talk about some central, uh, centralized energy efforts. Uh, a lot of this includes just bringing appliances out of ind individual office space and putting them in common areas to make uh, more energy efficient use of them. Uh, we have window covers, sun shield window covers throughout all of our buildings. This reduces the temperature internally up to 10 degrees. Mm. We uh, generally purchase buildings that are EPDs or have an environmental products declaration. This includes anything down to the carpet squares that you see throughout our common areas and office spaces. And property management also maintains our county's green cleaning sustainable supply list, which I'll give Charlie the credit for the green cleaning. Uh, essentially, this is just a list of our more sustainable maintenance supplies. So this is anything from green sealed certified all-purpose cleaners, 100% recyclable paper products, and sustainable hand soaps and sanitizers, which you can imagine we've been in steady use of of late. We also have completed a couple of waste management inventory projects uh, over the years. In uh, 2015, we completed a waste management project in the auditing of 58 different waste management accounts. This resulted in savings of $86,000 of taxpayer money per year. And the idea behind this is we audited 58 different waste management accounts. So that's our dumpsters and receptacles throughout the county. Um, and we were able to either eliminate services that we were paying to that we no longer used, 
or revised uh, scheduling and services to better fit our needs, which resulted in these savings. From there, we were uh, able to install 11 cardboard recycling dumpsters for the public, in addition to 60 solar-powered big belly trash compactors throughout the county that you can see at our various parks. Not only are these solar powered, so they're energy efficient, but they do send an automatic, automatic signal to our parks and ground staff when they're ready to be picked up. Um, it used to be our staff would have to drive around, see if these things were full, and then have to pick them up. Now uh, they get an automatic alert, so they can use a lot more time devoted to other projects, and it saves on driving, using gas, driving around the county as well. We also completed a smaller waste management project that we call our Return to Sender project in 2016. This is when our team uh, audited over 2,000 different counts of junk mail that we were getting into the county and either uh, eliminating or revising those counts as well. Uh, we were able to recycle those materials and drastically eliminate our waste consumption as a county, which certainly helped our uh, record staff as well who was sorting through them. Now I want to move on to a couple of larger energy saving projects. These are the uh, ESCO projects that Charlie was referring to earlier. Um, we completed two, and for those who don't know, ESCO stands for Energy Savings Company. Uh, an ESCO project is a cost-effective project provided by an energy service company that aims to save energy, reduce energy costs, and decrease operation and maintenance costs. So we completed one in the uh, year 20, I'm sorry, 2015. Uh, and this was specific to a water-related uh, ESCO project at our county's central jail. This was specific to plumbing operations throughout the central jail and our common areas and living corridors that help drastically reduce water consumption throughout these areas. Uh, as this project was ongoing in the fiscal year of 2013-2014, we saw about $90,000 in savings. And by the end of the project in 2014-2015, we saw $140,000 in savings through this project. We also completed an ESCO project that Charlie was mentioning in 2014-2015 in uh, installing the chiller plant in downtown Bradenton. This is what we call our central chiller plant. This is around the corner from our county administration building, and it provides energy efficient chilled water to help cool our administration building, our uh, property appraisal building, and our central library. It also has connections uh, at the chiller plant for other areas throughout downtown Bradenton other businesses or facilities to hook up if they wish, so it could provide future benefit to the local area as well. And by the completion of this project, we saw over $100,000 in savings of taxpayer money. All right, now we'd like to move into just some current energy saving projects that we are working on. I'm excited to announce that we are at the very beginning phases of drafting Manatee County's energy management policy. We did have a, a shell document of a policy in 2011 created by the energy and sustainability team, as well as our internal green team. So we are using a lot of that language, but we're certainly uh, revising it, making it more robust and making it more, more relevant to 2020 and beyond standards. Um, just uh, some, it's gonna be very comprehensive, but some things that we are including within this policy include consistent energy auditing and benchmarking, encouraging energy saving measures, whether they be future ESCO projects, the purchasing of Energy Star rated equipment, uh, or the maintaining of our greenhouse gas inventory, am among many more. We are doing current energy auditing. Right now we do it about quarterly based on staff time. We would like to do it monthly. We use a software called Energy Star Portfolio, and this helps track our energy consumption over time, able to uh, look at trends and spikes and see if we have areas where we need to improve upon. We also are now able to do energy and water consumption benchmarking. And this is thanks to a results first internship that we completed over the summer. I do wanna give a shout out to our intern, Jenny Jagel, who did a great project for us and had a great presentation to the board. She was able to dive further into Energy Star portfolio to see how we could better use this program. And she was able to teach us how to provide benchmarking measures for our county. So now we're able to compare our facilities to other like-minded facilities throughout the area to see where we have areas where we need to improve or to see areas where we are doing well in. We also manage our county's solar arrays. We're able to track the energy they are producing. And if there's ever an issue, we work with the vendor on the back end to help resolve those issues at the arrays. We've got two solar arrays throughout the county. One is at our Robin Preserve area. This is next to our visitor center at the Robinson or at the Valentine House by the parking area. 
And then we have a rather large array at the Child Protection Services Building out in our Sheriff's Office area. So I used the last bit to talk about solar to move into a solar energy research that we are partnered on. This is being led by the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. They received a grant from an entity called NREL, which stands for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, we were one of eight teams throughout the country to achieve this grant, um, and we are part of the Tampa Bay team. So the project is called Clear Sky Tampa Bay, where Manatee County is one of the lead partners, along with Hillsborough County, Pinellas County, and the city of Largo. We have an academic partner in the University of South Florida, and through this grant, uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council was able to hire a consultant named Converge to help lead this as well. I've included the link to the website of the project that has a lot of language to it, but in the general gist of the research project is we are working to create an interactive toolkit, kind of the first of its kind, to both site uh, various areas and the feasibility of areas for solar plus storage, and then once those areas are sited, it will provide an all-encompassing cost-benefit analysis. So not only does it look at costs and cost savings, but it looks at FEMA lifeline information and other various impacts to the local communities as well. Uh, I would be remiss to not speak to also the Regional Resiliency Action Plan. This is another Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council-led project. Manatee County is a very integral partner of. About once a month, uh, all the partners of the RPC get together to meet and to speak about this Regional Resiliency Action Plan to ensure that we have the language that we would all like within this plan. Uh, this includes anything um, from making us more resilient and mitigating the impacts to whether it's sea level rise or hurricane impacts, uh, looking at our vulnerable communities, our low income housing, and trying to protect our agricultural communities and our tourism industry as well, among many others. So the idea is once this regional plan is created, all of the entities that are part of the RPC then can take some of that language and incorporate it into our own local plans as well. So now moving into our Florida Green Building Coalition certification. Uh, for those who don't know, FGBC is very similar to LEED. A lot of people are very familiar with the LEED process. So FGBC is similar, however, it is specific to the state and climate of Florida. So FGBC is the state's leading certifier of green residential and commercial projects and local governments. So it's similar to the LEED process where you have uh, lots of different categories that you need to achieve a certain score in in order to receive the certification. And these scores are based on the sustainability efforts you are making towards them. So Manatee County's history with the FGBC is in 2012, we submitted our first application and received a gold certification, which I think is a great accomplishment for a first application. And these certifications lapse every five years. So by 2017, we submitted a brand new application and were able to achieve platinum certification. And we were the first government entity in the state to achieve platinum certification. Good. So that's a really large feather in the county's cap. This is mentioned in a lot of FGBC calls. It's mentioned throughout their website. I've been in RPC meetings where this has been mentioned. So really it's a great feat for uh, the county to accomplish and to be one of the leaders uh, in sustainability efforts throughout the state. So I'm speaking about FGBC as, out, as we're getting into the 2021 year. We are starting the process of recertifying with, of course, the goal to maintain our platinum certification. This is going to be a multi-departmental effort as we need to kind of have all hands on deck to ensure we are still making the sustainability efforts we were doing prior. We will be audited on seven different sustainability-related categories. This includes anything from leadership support on sustainability-related projects, agricultural services, energy use reductions, affordable housing, community outreach, public transportation, among many others. So we are certainly going to go through all these categories to ensure we're still making the efforts that we did five years ago and include any of the newer sustainability measures we've been doing in the past five years. So now we'll be moving into what we're calling our outside the box slides. These are our last couple of slides speaking to the county's drone program and some varying GIS projects that you may not know that we are the lead of. And I will be turning these last few slides over to Leah Harper to speak to you further. Thank you. Eric, before you uh, turn it over to yeah. uh, Leah, uh, we use a lot of acronyms in the uh, government, one yes, of them being GIS. <laughs> Uh, GIS stands for Geographic Information System. It's a framework of gathering, managing, and analyzing data. It's rooted in the science of geography. 
Thank you. And before we switch mics and wipe down the mic, did, did you have any questions? Anybody have questions for Eric right now? You want to wait? Okay. Good job, Eric. Welcome. Thank you. I know you've been here for a little bit, but welcome. Well, good morning. It's my pleasure to be able to talk to you guys about some of the really cool things that we get to do within our division that are maybe a little bit more outside the box based on the basic standard definition of government. So in 2018, the county established a drone program that, pun intended, has really taken off. The program started out with about 30 pilots from all different departments, and what this allowed them to do was complete once time-consuming tasks in a really quick and efficient manner. Within our department, we use drones to complete building and roof inspections using thermal imagery, and this allows us to search for water intrusions and other inefficiencies so that way we can come back and draft a report to make mitigation efforts and propose different solutions to fixing that. We have also used drones to collect assets, such as irrigation, which sounds really weird, but it's a lot easier than having to go out in the field and manually capture each head one by one because we can do a single flyover, come back in the office, and capture every single point right then and there. Yep. Another technology that we love to use is GIS, as Charlie alluded to. It is a geographic information systems. A really simple way to put it is it's a mapping software. But in the last few years, it's really become so much more than just mapping. So our department has a program called Envision, which is our facilities and asset tracking software. Assets being those that are essential to daily operations within the facilities, such as HVAC and water tanks. <laughs> Don't mind me. You OK? <laughs> Um, so it's really handy. It ties in with our work order system as well as our document management system. And what it's allowed us to do is really bring the department together all on one page, working with the same information and really keeping that communication consistent. When we're not using Envision, we are building a ton of really cool apps. If you're familiar with our public application, Breezing Through Manatee, this was something that we released in 4th of July last year and it allows residents to find parks and amenities that are near them. We've also created a number of tools for our teams within the department to help make their life easier and be more efficient with their time. We have mobile field applications, so our parks and grounds crew can complete playground inspections and boat ramp inspections right there with a tablet, have pictures and everything right in one spot. We've also created tools such as the County Owned Property Viewer, which our land acquisition team has done a phenomenal job in really making it a real knowledge powerhouse. And when we're not doing stuff for our team, we love to pitch in and help other teams as well. So Eric alluded to, we've worked with the IFAS office, we've done a community gardens project with them, and Wendy is currently working on the food systems directory, which will be really cool when that's said and done. We've also partnered with the Convention and Visitors Bureau with their business and industry partner data to turn it into a GIS application so it would be a lot easier for them to manage that information. But one of the bigger and badder and cooler GIS presentations and projects that we've gotten to work on was the county's climate adaptation portal. And this started in 2018 with the Peril of Flood grant project that the RPC brought over. And they actually recruited our team to help them come up with tools that would help other analysts and leaders identify potential sea level rise risks in their community. So what the portal does is it serves as a one-stop shop of data, maps, and tools to help others answer the same questions we were about the who, where, and what. These applications were all created in-house, and they use NOAA's sea level rise data, as well as the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel's recommended projections to help us identify those possible infrastructural, environmental, and social impacts in Manatee County. Also on this website, visitors can see tools made by other organizations such as the U.S. Geological Survey or the Army Corps of Engineers. And probably one of the most rewarding things to kick off is you do all this really cool research, but you want to see something done with it. So that's exactly what we did with the capital improvement projects. 
On the screen, you will see the internal version of the Capital Improvement Project dashboard. And what's different with this compared to the public one is that it goes a little bit further to include some automated features for analytics and communications. If you notice, there's a red box. That red box is actually an alert to say, hey, at some point, this project could potentially impact or be impacted by sea level rise, which is a really valuable tidbit of information to have on hand because we can prepare and be, prepare and be preemptive in trying to allocate resources so that we can be more efficient and get the most life out of that project. We also have other alerts on this application, such as saying, hey, these projects are geographically related. And we can also get signals that let us know if we're close to another organization's project. This could be really helpful if, say, the FDOT would be in the area. We can reach out and coordinate schedules so that way we're getting the most resource use for what we have and working together. And that's it. And thank you. I will turn it back over to Eric to close everything up. All right, thank you all. And we did want to end with, uh, oh, you can't see it, but it was the last shot of our, uh, a shot that we got from our drone technology uh, out at Coquina Beach. So just kind of showcase that as well. And we will open up to any questions or comments. Uh, I have a, I think last year you came before us and you guys did mapping. Is it, was it you guys at the parks? So that people could go on our website at the county and actually go down the pathway. Map Rui. Yeah, correct. Um, and I think you guys gave the presentation, correct? Yeah. Yes. And how is that going? I'll have to turn this over to Leah. This was before my time, although okay. familiar with it as well, but she can speak to it further. Sorry about the back. Sorry. Might as well stay for just a second unless I'm the only one. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll field some of the uh, drone and uh, GIS questions. But yes, you're referring to the results first project that we had last summer with Maggie Gone. She worked with Carmine D'Amelio and used an application called Mapillary. And what was really cool with that is that she attached four cameras to either a gator, like an ATV type thing, a golf cart, uh, or she walked and she had a helmet and she would hold on to these cameras and just walk the paths. And what that enabled us to do is in that Breeze and Through Manatee application, we actually added that in so when you click on a park, residents can see the trails before they actually get there. So it's kind of a cool preview to what they can expect once they go to a site. Thank you. And um, the other question I had, uh, the chiller plant. Charlie, maybe you can make a comment of that. I know that was right near the first union building, I call it that, that's being torn down. Uh, when we were going to sell that and, and the I think it's the property appraiser's office is nearby, so we had issues where we, you know, it's 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 connected, so we couldn't um, move it. So can can you explain the logistics of where our chiller plan is? And again, I would reinforce that about we we sell our chilled water to um, the city, yes, and how much revenue do we um, generate from that? Yeah, I don't actually have the numbers on top of my head as far as the revenue, but it was a great efficient, financial efficient project. Uh, we had individual chillers on the uh, central library, the administration building, the property appraiser that were all failing. Uh, and a chiller on a roof in Florida with lightning strikes is, is, is not a good idea. And uh, we decided to centralize these chillers into a central ch chiller plant, which is located um, east of the property appraiser's building. Uh, with 14-inch HDPE pipe underground, uh, we connect to the property appraiser. We bought a, brought a stub to the first union. We're not in the first union, but it's to the property line. Uh, the developer is required to connect to that uh, chiller line in his uh, uh, commercial area, so we'll be selling that water. We've brought it to the Merrill Lynch building. However, we haven't connected it yet. It is in the administration building. We brought it to the central library. And along the way, we put tees in various locations. And when the Chamber of Commerce in the parking garage went up and they put that commercial property in the parking garage, they connected as our first customer. Oh. And uh, we're prepared. If uh, you notice in the slide, it was hard to see. There's two chillers actually in that uh, plant. And uh, we 
we built it for efficiency to grow in the future. Uh, in some time, we could add a third shelter for expansion. Okay. Yeah, it's been a very successful project. It it brought the uh, the central library. Uh, I, just off the top of my head, it seems like we're saving like. Thirty, forty thousand, uh, almost a month. Is it some unbelievable number really? that we're saving in that library? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sherry, and then Commissioner Sir. Uh, just while Leah was still up there, Leah, would you just go back to the capital improvements dashboard slide? Absolutely. Especially for the new commissioners and those watching, just kind of give just a quick uh, re response as again where you access that at and how people can use that to look into any capital improvement projects. Absolutely. So the public. Uh, capital improvements dashboard can actually be accessed through the financial management department's website on the mymanatee.org. There's a section there where you can go and it'll talk about the capital improvements and there's an option to select view map. And what it does is it lists all the active projects or those under consideration depending on the time of year and gives you a really detailed scope of what to expect, uh, budgeting, and it gives you the status. It's a really incredible project that my coworker had created when he started in it's only gotten bigger since then. I think the other positive for that is as time has gone on, we've continued to try to match up the current status of these projects with the online version and to incorporate other departments such as public works, utilities, property management into making sure that that's real-time data and we're working on that. Um, it'll just continue to get better. So any, kind, any citizen can look for a project on there and get a current status, it, it shows starting dates, current, um, uh, currently what program, what particular process we're in, and there's also cost and a, and a description of the project as well as that location on the map. Commissioner Servia. Yes, um, thank you, Eric and Leah. Just a fantastic presentation. It's so exciting that the work that Manatee County is doing because it's really state of the art. I mean, we are really leaders in the state of Florida. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited by what you're doing. I loved when Charlie said uh, that the definition of GIS, because I think I was the first class at Florida State that ever took a class on GIS. So that's how old I am. But I remember that it was the wave of the future. Um, and your junk mail project, I don't remember that one. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's excellent. It's one that we could all practice at home, right? Really, really great stuff. Um, I want to uh, put a plug out there for IFAS and their mobile irrigation lab because that fits right along with what you guys are doing. And uh, the water conservation that they're doing through that program is amazing. Uh, it is a free program. Every citizen uh, homeowner who has an irrigation system is welcome to schedule uh, someone to come out and show you how to more efficiently use your water <coughs> for your landscaping and the correct landscaping. And we have seen our water bill go down since we did that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's pretty standard, happens with everyone. Um, I also am so impressed about the silver lead standard that we have. Uh, for people who don't understand that, that is a huge, huge deal. I mean, to get to silver lead is, uh, is quite an accomplishment, and for Manatee County to target that with every building is incredible. Um, one of the things that I learned through the irrigation program uh, that I forgot to tell you is, and I hope I get this right, they told me that 3% of our water is fresh water in the world, 3%. And of that 3%, 2% is in glaciers and things like that. So as it melts, it becomes salt water. So then really there's only 1% of the water that we have that's fresh. And that's why it's so important to conserve as much as we can. Um, oh, and I also wanted to bring this up and maybe just food for thought for our next um, group of, of summer interns that we have, but I think it would be a great program if we could get together some junior sustainability um, students, maybe high school students, maybe a collaborative project through the county and the school board, and uh, you know, really educate our local kids uh, on sustainability and why it's important and how it saves us money. Uh, so just throwing that out there for something to consider. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, first, 
the uh, the information you put about the, the central jail, the chiller plant, it's showing savings through 2014-15. In fact, both of them end at 2014-15. So I was just curious, while we're doing these different sustainability programs, do we audit them on an annual basis to see if they're still creating savings? Do we uh, do them every five years? Is maybe that line ends in 15? Or is that just a initial one to two year, let's make sure we got the savings we thought we were going to get, and then we just kind of assume they're working going forward? Charlie. Yeah, I'll speak to that, sir. Yeah, the ESCO projects, uh, we're, we're liable with that for the next 15 to 20 years uh, because it was an agreement we made between the two ESCO companies, and they get it audited yearly to include our FMD uh, department and the clerk of the court. So they're audited annually Thank to you. ensure that we're continuing the savings. Uh, the idea behind this project is the project pays itself off. It's a return on investment. And so we, we put an initial uh, uh, benchmark into the project, but the savings over the 15 to 20 years pays off the project. I think, uh, uh, Commissioner Cruz, uh, since it looks on your slide, it's like till 15. If you have that, those audits, probably just copy us in an email to see what it's been since 15. Yeah, yeah I was just curious if it, if it was just every five years yeah. or every year. I can guarantee you my CFO, Maggie Daniels, is listening. We'll have that information. So we'll probably have today. it by the time we leave the meeting. <laughs> Check my phone. We're not going to, no pressure. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, the, the other question I had, uh, a couple of the slides had to do with, with solar energy, and obviously that's, I mean, half the houses in my neighborhood seem like they're slapping solar panels up based on some sort of discount program right now. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at that on a, a larger basis? And I know it's it's been talked about, um, you know, from a roof standpoint, like they're doing it in individual houses, but we've got a lot of roof space here, uh, especially with things like with the school board, with the jail, with libraries. Are, are we looking at that as a, a bigger program? And, and you had mentioned affordable housing. As we're building these, or hopefully we're building these kind of housing trust group, places like that, they've got roofs as well. And I'm sure some programs that we can offer them, which not only get them savings on their energy, but get them some credits, uh, would probably be well received. Is that a program we're looking at expanding? Uh, the, the last one about affordable housing, uh, I haven't particularly looked at that, although I've heard of uh, regional programs that do look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council has a lot more information on that. When it comes to solar for the county, this uh, regional solar research we are doing with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council is definitely with the goal and idea to encourage future solar projects. Great thing about it is it looks at the feasibility of actual buildings because that's a feat in itself, especially with some older buildings if they've got HVAC and things on the roof. Um, so it looks at the feasibility, but it also looks at an all-encompassing cost-benefit analysis. So it looks at the benefits to local communities as well. So by the end of this year, we're hoping to have that toolkit to be able to use essentially in perpetuity for the county and be able to share it where we'd like to, to hopefully encourage future projects. Nothing else, George? No, I'm good. Commissioner Servia and then Sherry. Oh, just a response to Commissioner Cruz's comment about affordable housing, and Sherry m might have been willing to say the same thing, but in working with Habitat, they're including a lot of the um, lead aspects of construction and development. I don't think that solar has been found to be at the point that it is um, financially feasible uh, yet, but I think that that's coming. Um, and go ahead, Sherry. Did you want to no, say I more? I was going to add two things. I was going to mention that we have had done two affordable housing projects with Habitat for Humanity with many of the um, energy savings um, information, and um, there has been a great deal of effort made there. But I'm not sure if across the board there has when we talk about full range of incentives. So made a note of that because that could be something to really look at. Secondly, our new East County Library project is a solar based project and you'll see solar um, on that particular program. Good. Good. I can follow up uh, with one additional thing uh, that I forgot to mention, but we did encourage uh, FPL solar together program that was initially uh, approved, I think, uh, about March of this past year. And for buildings that cannot hold solar, whether they're aged or HVAC, it's the option to still get a lot of your energy from solar. They're uh, installing larger microgrids throughout really the region of Florida to be able to provide solar energy for uh, customers that wish to choose that option. And there is a little bit of upfront cost, but 
There's about a five to seven year payback in that program as well. So options that we do not have to put solar on rooftops as of now, we could look at that avenue as well. Uh, Commissioner Baugh? Uh, real quick, not to keep this going, but in talking about resiliency in the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, one thing that I, I um, want to bring up on that is that, you know, it's great when we talk about um, solar and so forth, but also with resiliency, that's really, you know, you look at it from the standpoint of how long would it take uh, our region to recoup from a major hurricane, for instance. And that's really what resiliency is. So um, I know that the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council has a great video out about, uh, I've mentioned this to the board before, um, about a, a Category 5 hurricane that hits north of Tampa. And it kind of gave me the willies after what we just went through mm -hmm. last week. You know, had that hurricane been stronger, it could have been a totally um, devastating impact on all of us. So have you seen that video, and is it something that you could bring? I would love for the whole board uh, to be able to see that video. It's, it's, it's an eye-opener. I haven't seen that particular video, but we've got a pretty close relationship with the RPC that I can certainly get it and share it for sure. I do know that uh, there was a research project done by a research entity called 427 mm -hmm. that actually listed Manatee County as one of the most vulnerable counties in the country. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it was just, resiliency is really, I think, the big focus of the Tampa Bay region. Mm -hmm. That's why that Regional Resiliency Action Plan, I believe, is so important. Mm -hmm. And it does look like everyone's really on the same page with that and collaborating in a really nice way. And the one thing that I've been very impressed with being with the county for the last year is how integral Manatee County is with the RPC. We are definitely one of the, I'd say, leaders of a lot of these projects and we're very integral. So it's been great to see, you know, Manatee County as, you know, one of those leaders as well. So yeah, we're certainly looking at a lot of these resiliency projects moving into the future. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and you know what, it is a great organization and, and I know that Manatee is very involved. And if you could bring that forward to this board, that would be of great assistance. Sure, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Great, pro yeah, great, uh, uh, and from, yeah, it was really good, Sorry. Eric. Very good. Yeah, um, from somebody that actually sat through the storm on the island with the highest winds of 62 sustained, and for the first time in 51 years, seeing the bay come up around my house, I went to walk my dogs at 10, and it was a river flowing. I live in a corner lot on both sides. So, the bay had uh, come over. I don't live on the water. So, um, yeah, it made me a little nervous. I was uh, actually, it's actually the um, down the street from where your family grew up, Kevin. Um, Sherry. I just wanted to follow up with the board just as a reminder then. this. Uh, thank you, Eric and Leah, Halmar, Wendy. Great job, and Charlie for leading this group. And this is a, an area where we have the opportunity to make um, a lot of innovative um, projects happen and they've done a great job of doing that both on a regular basis and when Leah mentioned uh, building apps um, believe me they they can build apps in a short period of time uh, when red tide when we had our problems two years ago with red tide they jumped in worked with the um, global company Esri and put together some red tide maps and really really helped from watching that system and with some um, some applications um, this is our internal or manatee county's internal program and as a reminder to the board at the december 8th work session we'll be um, traveling off-site to another location and you'll be having a panel presentation on sustainability and resiliency that is both you know external or other community related um, areas and so you've got this program and that program by the time you go through those two work sessions should be ready to roll back around at the first of the year so Eric and the team can continue to um, build on the certification program that's going to take place uh, beginning in the spring. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I will. Any other commissioners? I'm going to open this up to the public. Anybody in the public would um, like to speak, and I can about guarantee my paycheck, my first speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and Glenn, well, oh, no, Glenn, come on, don't fall. No, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, Nan's here. Hey, Nan. Okay, good morning. Hi. Nan's back. It's Didn't recognize you behind that mask. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is my dog, Carol. 
Oh, yeah. Nice Aww. Aww. <laughs> and she was kind enough to take care of one torn. Uh, I'm Nan Summers. I'm founder of High Impact Networks and previously was the uh, grants coordinator for Parks and Natural Resources in Manatee County. And I'm here to support the work of this team. I am most impressed with and pleased to be a part of collaborating with your group. And uh, the work that they've done in this short period of time is just phenomenal. Not that there wasn't a great foundation to build on, but I think you've taken it to the next level. So I want to just touch on one of the things that uh, Eric's, his background in UCF, where he graduated from the environmental studies, that's one of his many uh, programs. We, I am now working with that group. They um, have 51 capstone students who are graduating in the field of integrated studies and environmental studies. And Commissioner Servia, you really teed it up. I caught the ball that you <laughs> threw mm -hmm. out there. I am passionate about education at all levels, beginning with children. That group, we're creating, lead, producing leaders of creativity that have a wide range of backgrounds, not just expertise in one level, but a lot. So two of the programs that the students are working on in Manatee County under my direction one of them is working with taking the home energy rating system, which is part of the um, assessment of how compact and tight your home is, which is extremely important in terms of wind and water issues. Mm -hmm. And what they want to do with those ratings is to combine them into the multiple listing services that realtors use. So you can begin to assess before you invest in a home what the um, risks of that. And there's so many things that can be done easily to reduce that. One of the things that we did do, talking about the affordable housing back in when the neighborhood stabilization program happened in 2008, there were 1,000 foreclosed abandoned homes in Northport, and we undertook one, and my role as sustainable communities uh, faculty for uh, University of Florida, to see if we could, what we could do with the same budget that everybody else had using the home rating system, the HERS system, analyzing that. And we were able to achieve 36% savings, which received national recognition. So I have all the data from how that house was able to do that, which you, you're Anne. more than welcome to. Thank you. And so the other, one other thing is that in the Easter Seals property, next to it, Operation EcoVets runs a regenerative agriculture program for veterans to help them re-energize their economic ability and to learn about sustainable agriculture. And so Operation EcoVets has a new program that we're doing called Food Fitness and Fellowship. So we want to surround the veterans with all of the systems. Um, we're going to take recipes and make food from what they're growing. We're going to have uh, trauma-informed people who will come and help them work through exactly what Connie was talking about, the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences all the way to PTSD, and fitness, core fitness. So thank you. Yeah, that's what's happening, and it's so nice to be part of you. Kudos to you guys. Uh, thank you, Nan. Thank you, Nan. I, I forgot to do the time limits, but um, Glenn, won't, Glenn will be, um, he knows kind of, so Glenn, maybe four minutes. I know. Well, I knew you would do that, so. After the after this, from now on, the rest of the day, three minutes. I just figure you knew. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Let's start it right now. So, it'd be, uh, Glenn Jubilina. Okay. So, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much, Charlie and staff. That was absolutely uh, enlightening. I do have a couple of questions on the compost. One, what was the amount of the grant? And we also have a compost out at the landfill. So. I got one at home, and I made mine out of six free pellets. So I don't know what the big deal is on making a compost at the parks. At the very least, we should encourage wood chips to go over there because they're going to break down naturally anyways. I'm a big proponent of wood chips. Uh, the other thing is the I, lo I love the, the thing, project pays for itself. That was about the chiller. That also happens to be with solar. And uh, I would like to know yeah. on one of the things here, five to seven year payback for who? For FP&L investors or the citizens of Manatee County? <clears throat> so I think we can, we can look at solar. It, we're way, way overdue for solar. Uh, there are ports around this country that are net zero. Uh, we've got millions of square feet of roofing uh, that, needs to be, that need to be addressed. Um, I think every building that we put up should have a solar component, at least an analysis of it. 
And every retrofit building uh, should have an analysis as well. So when you look at a solar panel and it covers your roof, without the panels, you might get 20 or 25 years out of a shingle roof, if you're lucky. With the solar panels, you'll get 30, 35, maybe even 40 years. Is that analysis being uh, computed into re-roofing any of the county projects? I don't think there is. And I think that's, that's going to be the breaking point of where, hey, this is a good idea because in 20 years we're not going to spend a million dollars for that roof. We're going to get another 15 years out of it. There's a lot of little stuff that you're not putting in there that solar benefits, uh, including uh, the longevity of the roof, you know, rainwater harvesting system, stuff like that. Um, the chiller, I remember that deal. That was 12 million bucks, and I thought FPNL financed us on that. So I'm a little confused that the NESCO took it over, but if it's a good no, deal, it's ours. a good deal. Yeah, um, the, the housing that we brought up, absolutely. Uh, there's, no, there's no additional assessment for solar, and if your uh, energy bill is cut by half, you got a hundred dollar a month energy bill and it's 50 bucks that other 50 bucks can go towards mortgage to buy that house a lot of a lot of banks recognize that so there's a big plus to that as well um, what else wood chips I'd like to know what the grant is and uh, uh, that's it you guys did a good job and uh, it's nice to know we have so many certified drone pilots I'm still trying to get mine. That's the young, the young Three ones. Three minutes on Thank the money. You. Oh, yeah. I'm proud of you. <laughs> My first day as chair. Thank you. <laughs> um, you did a very, very good job. Um, and uh, the questions that he asked, if you could just put those in an email um, to somebody will give you Glenn's email address, but also copy the commissioner's. And we've got Glenn's email address. Oh, yeah, oh you got <laughs> Glenn's email address. <laughs> Need I say any more? Okay. Yeah, Madam All right. Chairman, what we can do is have staff put it in the memo, the work session update memo, and then provide it to the board and back to the citizen. Great. Thank you. And we have nobody on the phones. This is your last chance. Okay, seeing uh, nobody on the phone. Thank you very much. You did a great job. I know you guys were nervous and you don't need to be. We really appreciate it. Carol? Yes. Uh, one more thing to add about uh, being uh, fiscally responsible and being efficient. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, have a groundbreaking session for a new pool. And uh, that pool Thursday. has geothermal in it. We went above and beyond to ensure mm -hmm. efficiencies and added that into the pool. That means we're putting this water in the ground uh, so it will be uh, more efficient to uh, keep the pool at a, a certain temperature. We, as a, as a division, as a department, as a, as a county, are always looking for efficiencies. Thank you. Good job. Good job, Charlie. We, uh, you do a good job. Okay, with that, we are adjourned till, no, we are on recess till um, 1 because we have a time certain, and it is 11.55. Thank you. Thank you all.
Welcome, everybody. We are back uh, at our for our work session. It is 1:03 p.m., and we are for our one o'clock time certain. And who uh, it looks like Mr. John Osborne is going to do a great presentation for us. <laughs> Go yes. for it. Yes. Uh, let me just say, Madam Chairman, I'm just going to mention, especially with the new commissioners here, John Osborne is one of our two deputy county administrators with the county administrator's office. John is going to be helping to coordinate the next two sessions. And off to your left here in the corner, Karen Stewart is your second deputy county administrator, a fantastic team that, that helped me and helped the commissioners and all the departments make sure we follow through on projects. So thank you. Take it away, John. And before, I just want to introduce uh, Mayor John Chappie from Bradenton Beach is in the audience. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, John Osborne, uh, Deputy County Administrator. So the first thing on your afternoon agenda today is uh, Bradenton Beach Microtransit. And this uh, came up actually a little while ago. And this was a proposal from the city to do uh, a microtransit project. Think of like uh, uh, golf carts, think of like jitneys, think of like some of the things that you get on at Bush Gardens to get from the parking lot to the front gate, those kinds of things uh, to basically put out in the city of Braden Beach area to uh, pick up folks and have a little more of a, a smaller uh, area footprint of transit circulation uh, around Bridge Street and south to Coquina. And you can see a little picture there of a concept uh, may or may not look like that some at some point but it goes back actually to 2019 when we got a memo uh, from the clerk of the city of Bradenton Beach uh, basically describing what they were proposing in the process what they're going through and in December uh, on December 17th 2019 uh, Mayor Chappie and his team presented to the Board of County Commissioners the concept and uh, since then, we've also had another item uh, on our Board of County Commissioners agenda on June 16th, where we had a discussion of parking availability on the island. And uh, the direction from the board then was to <laughs> draft a letter for the chair's signature to the city and ask them if they're planning on using our property uh, for this uh, microtransit project that they asked for permission. And also be a little more descriptive about what they want to do and where they want to do it and that kind of thing. And we also had a discussion at that time about uh, the city's removal of many of some of the on-street parking uh, that's been out there for years. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the second part uh, after the microtransit. That's the second presentation today. And we're also going to be talking a little bit about um, the discussion of overall beach parking. And uh, back in June, we also talked a little bit about, you know, uh, the concept of a parking garage out there. So today, uh, focusing on microtransit again, uh, a small scale transit project that would be in the Bridge Street area and run down, down south to uh, South Coquina. And it, this is something that could increase the mobility uh, in the Braden Beach and Coquina area. We do have the MCAT uh, trolley system, but this would be more focused in a, a smaller geographic area with more stops. Uh, the concept by the city is to also reconfigure some of the parking along Gulf Drive, which would provide some space uh, for their microtransit. Also, they're proposing to add a little more parking on, on South Coquina. And this is something they have grant funding from, so they're asking for any uh, direct financial contribution uh, from the county for this project. But we are going to talk a little bit to them, we have talked to them about some of the future, what the future changes could be, what the maintenance responsibilities would be, and things like that, if those, if it substantially change how we maintain <laughs> And that area. So the graphic on the screen before you, um, we can see my cursor here. I'm going to find my cursor. Here we go. So you can see the area in yellow is the proposed route of the trolley. And these are sort of like the, the, the graphic on the left is really kind of stacked on top of the graphic on the right. In other words, the trolley is supposed to loop around uh, the Bridge Street area. This is the roundabout on Bridge Street right here. If you can see my cursor there in the lower left-hand corner. So there's Bridge Street, and then you can see the trolley route in yellow. And then it runs, uh, proposed to run south, and that south line connects up here on the upper right side up here. And again, the trolley <coughs> runs down the, uh, the intercoastal side to Fifth Street, runs west, gets back on, crosses Gulf Drive, and runs back behind uh, the parking area that runs along Gulf Drive. Now this parking area, the proposal is a little bit different here. You can see this zoom in. And what the city is proposing is a new type of parking that you may or may not have seen. It's showing up more and more around the country. It's also showing up more and more around the Tampa Bay area. You can find it uh, in some of the city of Tampa, city of St. Petersburg, and places like that, and some public parking areas, some on-street parking areas. 
And this is a back-end angled parking. It's a little bit different than we've seen in Manatee County before, but it is starting to show up more and more. It's kind of like you know, 10, 20 years ago, there wasn't that many roundabouts around, but now they're, they're more and more common. People are getting more and more used to them. And this type of parking is a little bit different too. Uh, it's got some getting used to perhaps to, to, to make it more of a, a prominent thing, but it has some advantages in terms of safety. Uh, it's one of those things where it, it, it provides an opportunity for when you get out of your car, your door is open, and all your kids and your people are sort of focused to go back towards the sidewalk or back toward the grass area away from the traffic. So it's, if you have kids and stuff like that, when you open your car doors back when my kids were little, kids all pile out and start walking around, you know, and this kind of focuses everybody to the back to the safer side of the street. Um, it does... Uh, it also does have some, uh, it has a lot of positives about it in terms of safety. There are some cons about it as well. It's not something that uh, is common out there that much today. Uh, but you know, like parallel parking, if you remember back in the day when you took your driving test, that was a big hurdle to overcome is that parallel parking thing. And if you're parallel parking in traffic, like if you've experienced in a, in a city environment, you know, kind of, you kind of have to have some help from the person behind you if you're in traffic. So the idea, of course, is if you remember your parking test from back in the day, you know, you, 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 there's an empty space, you, you, you basically stop, you turn your blinker on, you kind of try to get the guy's attention behind you, you pull up and then you, you back in. But if the knucklehead behind you keeps, you know, scooting up in traffic, you're kind of stuck and you lose your opportunity. So this is the kind of parking too that does require a little participation and help from yeah, the sure. driver behind you. So it's also one of those things too, we ask yourself, is this the type of parking that you want along Gulf Drive, our major, you know, point of tourist area, your major point of, of your major place where folks are from out of town visiting, uh, they may or may not have this back home, may probably not uh, for, a lot of, for a lot of folks that come here. Uh, so it'd be something new, not just for our own folks that live here and visit the beaches, but for those folks and our tourists that travel here to visit our beautiful beaches. So again, back to the graphic, uh, you can see the route, uh, again, goes around Bridge Street, runs south down Gulf Drive, and it continues south down Gulf Drive. Again, it has that proposes that back end angled parking and back as you, if you drive down, imagine your mind, you're driving south down Gulf Drive, and as the road starts to turn a little bit, uh, the parking actually proposed to change back to parallel parking because the right of way gets really tight in some spots. And then it opens back up to some, back to the back end angled parking. And as, as you approach the North Coquina uh, boat ramp, the trolley will cross Gulf Drive. And then actually propose to run down an access drive. And this access drive is usually gated off. Uh, it's not something that we allow the, the public to park in normally. During uh, our major uh, beach holiday weekends, we use this area for dumpster roll-offs and maintenance activities. And we have additional staff working on the island. This, we let them park over these kind of areas because uh, we have a, it's all hands on deck for us on the beach holiday weekends, as you can imagine. Um, but this is an area they're proposing to actually change over to not the back end angled parking, but actually to utilize it for one, but basically pull in and just straight angled parking like a normal, you know, parking lot kind of thing. But it would add a significant amount of spaces. They're proposing to add 332 spaces all along the east side here. So it continued down, the trolley would continue down all the way to this loop. And just south of the loop, right off the picture, there's if you can envision where the Marine Rescue Building is. That's about where that parking area in that building is located. And the trolley is proposed across Gulf Drive and loop over uh, to where the MCAT is, uh, the transit facility is over there by the beach and that area. So looking at just at some road cross section, what would this look like uh, conceptually? Uh, the bottom one is you can see if you're driving south down the road, this is what that back end angled parking would look like. If you're driving down the road, you can see the car there backed in uh, that way. And of course, over to the right here would be you know, the beach if you're driving south. And the, the middle picture would show you the, what the parallel parking cross section would look like. Again, that's pretty typical of parallel parking, kind of like you have almost downtown. And this top picture is what you would see if you're driving south down the access road where we would propose to have um, some parking there. And this parking area uh, is something we could also propose to be limited to uh, the people that perhaps work on the Bridge Street area and things like that. And that's something we're going to talk about a little bit further on in the presentation. So I um, uh, almost called him Commissioner Chappie. Mayor Chappie and his team submitted to us some, some of the more detailed plans for this, like you've seen in the, in the presentation. 
And uh, this does require the use of not just our property, but also a little bit of FDOT right away as well. And there's not much uh, additional right of way beyond the edge of pavement that FDOT controls. I think it's in some places it's as little as six or seven inches off the edge of pavement, and the, the rest of it is, is, is ours, especially like the picture you see there on Gulf Drive. So we took the plans, we routed uh, them to our, our stakeholder departments. These are the departments that have it's basically something to do with this area uh, in terms of um, we have public safety, which obviously our marine rescue folks work in this area. Uh, public works and property management. Property management maintains our beaches uh, and the parking areas of, of the beaches. And our parks and natural reserves uh, also is responsible for uh, this area as well. And public, the public safety folks, again, the marine rescue folks, and their getting around is also important. Property management, um, they maintain the area in terms of making sure the dumpsters are empty, the trash cans are empty, the areas are clean, the restrooms are clean, and we have a positive experience you know, for our beachgoers. So overall, you know, staff, we, we uh, you know, certainly applaud the city for being proactive about this conceptually. It's a really interesting proposal. It's an opportunity to uh, you know, take a bite at some of the parking issues out there and also dealing with some issues with pedestrian safety. And you can, you can see just where the parking is today. Uh, if you go out there and visit the beach and park like that, you, if you park like, like me, a normal person, just straight pulls straight in, and there's a, comes a time when you got to back out, right? So when you're backing out on, on the Gulf Drive, it could be a potential safety issue. There's a lot of people around. There's still people walking up and down this area, this, even though this is a parking area. It's a very busy place. Um, so one of the things we were looking at, um, as you know, the proposal from the city was to do the back end angled parking. But this is the condition today. You can see the aerial of it there on the left and what it would look like. And one of the things that we were talking about is looking at it from this way, where instead of doing back end angled parking, using the angled parking, I my mouse here, but also you, perhaps reconfiguring it so it is a, you would pull in off the road having a one-way drive aisle and just pulling in. This way, it would eliminate the need for backing out onto Gulf Drive. This is something that we could address with uh, parking bollards, uh, some minor landscaping and things like that. Kind of similar to what you experience, how we direct parking and handle parking like at the Kingfish boat ramp. Uh, still have a, an unimproved uh, you know, shell or uh, sand environment, parking bollards and things like that a little more direction and perhaps up where the, where the one-way pull-in would be. But there'd still be room for parking. There'd still be room for uh, driving and a drive aisle for the Jitney or the tram, or microtransit facility run down here. And of course, the uh, shared use path, which exists over here, the walking and biking trail, what could still remain in place as well. Cross-section, what this would look like. Here's Gulf Drive over here, uh, the bike lanes. And in this section, there's a little bit of a, outside the bike lane, there's a little bit of a concrete pan for uh, stormwater, uh, so you have a little bit of space between that and the uh, edge of the parking area, so it would be a regular angled parking uh, one way. Drive aisle, of course, here's the existing uh, shared use path or wide sidewalk kind of path we have over there on the uh, beach side. So in terms of staff recommendations, going back like segment by segment, uh, we don't have any recommendations by for the main loop area, the north extent of the proposed transit. Uh, again, for the area that has that back end uh, parking scenario, uh, we, we think that maybe a good option is, the, is the creating a uh, off street parking where you have the, where you pull in and you just normal angled parking, like I just mentioned. Uh, so that would be something from essentially 4th Street up here, uh, all the way perhaps down. And it would, that would continue all the way down uh, back to about 11th or 12th Street. And then it would transition consistent with what the city proposed, being parallel parking again. And again, as it transitioned, the right of way gets wider again, where it could facilitate uh, the angled parking, again, creating a, a pull in angled parking situation instead of a back end situation, all the way uh, running south uh, to and through the, the boat ramp. Uh, over here on this side, uh, one of the things that we thought may be helpful is um, the angle of parking that's proposed is, is certainly uh, fine. We think it, it would work well. And we think it would be maybe appropriate too to limit the amount of, of parking over here. One of the things that we are uh, sensitive about, I'm sure, as is, is y'all are, um, is sort of the, the aesthetics as well of creating you know, a massive you know, parking areas. Um, we could create, limit this and create an area that's specific uh, for the employees of that area of Bridge Street. Um, we also could gate it so it could be electronic access, it wouldn't just be something that's you know, kind of open to the public kind of thing. We could uh, 
have it uh, lease situation or an agreement with a city or CRA. Uh, let them let them designate who gets to go in there, control that access point, but perhaps maybe limited a bit more in terms of the amount of space. Uh, there's also the ability too. Some of the vegetation on the east side um, is isn't. Uh, there's nothing you know special about it. Let me just say, some, in some places, in some of those places, we could actually expand it and make more of a, a designated parking area, more of a little bit like a parking lot, kind of consolidate the parking a bit instead of the long linear strip of parking. Just kind of break it up a bit. That's a possibility as well. So the city was proposing 30 through 332 spaces, and we think we could probably maybe about half that much, maybe something to start with with them and seeing how we could. Re reorganize it a bit, break up the mass a bit, and uh, still put it in strategic locations where it serves everybody, everybody well. We do have um, and also a need to kind of maintain this area again. Like I mentioned, we have um, during the beach holiday weekends, we put a lot of extra stuff over here. Uh, we also have a, a utility crew that we keep on the island uh, during the during the busy weekends, so we don't have to fight traffic to get to a line break. We also have a lot of extra property management folks on staff. We have extra public safety folks in the area. And also during some of our uh, weekends where we have parades on the island. This is the primary staging area for a lot of that kind of stuff. And you know, farmer's market and all those kinds of things that typically happen in our great beaches. So this is an area that we utilize for a lot of those other special events as well that we may need to keep open and keep uh, available. You know, code enforcement could also be something that we use uh, or the city or us for this specific parking area to police it a bit to make sure that if we do enter agreement with the city that it is used by the folks uh, who we designate can go there. Um, talked about the parking lot thing. So our recommendation is um, looking at the city and the CRA to assume also perhaps some responsibilities depending upon what we work out in the end design wise. If we work out something in the end where uh, it causes a lot more maintenance, uh, right now, like when you on Gulf Drive on Coquina, where the in the parking areas along Gulf Drive, if there's after rain events, we get potholes and we get some other issues. Perhaps over time, we'll go in there and you know put fresh dirt out, fresh uh, shell out, and, and motor grader it out. Uh, but if you create a parking area that has a lot of parking stops, bollards, turn ins. We can't use our heavy equipment to get it done really quickly. If it's a little more of a manual labor kind of thing, it could be a little more expensive. So those kinds of things we need to sort of talk through with the city about what maintenance responsibilities are they willing to do versus us. Also, um, Americans with, with a Disabilities Act is also a thing we, we constantly have to address on the beaches and dealing with those kinds of issues. And also, if there's any uh, lighting that would uh, ever come out of that, not the, I don't think anything is proposed, but that's uh, also something we'd have to work with the city on if that was something they wanted to look at there. But finally, we do applaud their efforts. It is uh, very proactive for a city uh, to take a stab at beach parking. I know having grown up in uh, Pinellas County, going to Clearwater Beach and Reddington Beach and all those places, uh, it's, always, it's a challenge no matter where you go. If you live in a place that's beautiful and a place that's attractive, uh, you're, always, you're, gonna, you're gonna have the good problem, I guess, of, of, of beach parking. It will, uh, we think overall the concept will definitely add that sense of place, another great thing for us to do, participating with our tourists on, uh, complement our existing transit operations, and uh, we think it'll also help us out with you know, freeing up some parking, perhaps in those uh, fun areas uh, like uh, Bridge Street. So just a summary of our recommendations. Uh, we'd like to continue working with the city um, on their design, uh, but more consistent with uh, our concept of perhaps an off-street pull-in parking situation rather than a back-end situation. Work with, let us work with them on creating an area of, of city uh, and CRA uh, for the employee parking of Bridge Street, limiting the spaces to about half of what they're proposing, perhaps. Uh, we can work with them on perhaps looking at some parking lots as well along that uh, east side. Um, we can continue to coordinate with them on that design. And once finalized uh, with the city, uh, we'd have to update our in local agreements. This would come back to the board. And of course, the, the city and the CRA would be responsible for the permitting, the easements, and the construction, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so we just wanted to open this up for a conversation with our county commission. And uh, I know Mayor uh, Chappie is here as well, who perhaps could address any questions that I cannot. But thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Yes, thank you, John. Um, is this on? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Turn them up. There you go, guys. Thank you, thank you John. I appreciate the presentation. Um, and. <clears throat> 
Bradenton Beach is obviously in my district. I've spent quite a bit of time in Bradenton Beach. I had an aunt who lived on 8th Street South when I was growing up, oh. and I spent quite a few summers out there. Some, some quality rites of passage took place during those summers. So I, I have an affinity for Bradenton Beach. Um, I do, and it's, it's come, and Bradenton of, Beach has come a long way. The mayor's rights of passage. Rights of passage, said. absolutely. Yeah, I grew up out there. I was like yeah, 14 okay. to 16 okay, out know. there hanging okay, out Okay, you, the you don't see it yeah, anymore. Yes. <laughs> you know, these things, these the things are, are lifelong memories that were created in Bradenton Beach. That's priceless. Uh, <laughs> I have to remember that. So, and she had a condo, like, right on, she had two condos right on the beach. But uh, anyway, and, and Bradenton Beach has come a long way since that time. Um, I love that we're trying to create more parking out there. The island obviously needs as much parking as we can possibly get out there to, to an extent. Um, and Bridge Street, or sorry, Bradenton Beach at this time, I don't believe they offer on-street parking, or it's very limited where they do. Um, so I like that they're thinking outside the box. A couple of questions. Um, one would be, there, there, sometimes people, locals, get upset when you start to change things, particularly in my district. And so my question would be specifically what types of shrubs, what types of you know, grasses, and are well any Australian pines be removed? <laughs> or do any of those stand oh, in the way? Do any, of these, do any of these things stand in the way and yeah, have to be removed to make this happen? Yeah, Madam Chair, I, we don't have an answer to that specifically yet, Commissioner. Uh, as the design progresses, we'll be able to answer more of those kinds of questions, but the board has any thoughts on that kind of thing or what kind of you know plant shrubs and, and we can sure. provide that information also to our, our city uh, representatives as well uh, but in terms of, for, as far as the design goes at this point it's, a, it's more of a conceptual design sure and uh, as we work through some of those issues we also have the opportunity to work with them on avoiding certain areas of certain trees and that right. kind of thing and we certainly uh, would do that and uh, they, they have the, the lead on design and where we'd be a sort of a commenter and help them uh, guide them a bit, but we certainly would work with them and if the board has any you know, direction on that We certainly would, would take that to heart and share okay. that with them um, I'm not a huge fan of the idea of gating it. I would rather just see us do permits I mean, it's, it's for employee parking. I feel like you can easily just give your employee a permit mm -hmm. uh, And I love that it's going to be for employee parking um, Lots of you know, there are lots of teenage girls who are employees and waitresses and hostesses and that sort of thing down there so if they're going to be trolleyed all the way down, it's dark at night down there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, would, I wouldn't mind seeing lighting um, and cameras down there as well. Okay. Because you have to consider, you know, it could be your kid, right, that mm -hmm. works at, yes, you know, but, well, I guess the Sun House isn't there anymore, but you get the no, idea, the bridge tender old. or whatever. Yeah, my cousin worked at the Sun House back oh in the day, so let me think of that. Yeah. Um, because she was young when she worked there. Um, are you looking at Shell for this parking lot as well as the angle parking along Gulf Drive? Or are we looking at the porous concrete concept that we have at Coquina Beach? Yeah, at this point, I don't think we're looking at anything different than what we have today, perhaps a shell. And I'm looking at Commissioner Chappie, Commissioner Chappie, Mayor Chappie, I'm sorry, old habits die hard. Uh, we'd probably be looking at the similar material that's there today. Shell. Okay. Um, it, it does have a park. higher maintenance interval requirement. Every rainstorm, you know, as you know, <laughs> there's sure. potholes and things totally. like that. And our, our biggest concern is just from a heavy equipment perspective, how much we change it. Can we get our, you know, do it real quick with a motor grader or do we need to, if it's designed differently and there's more curbing and there's more, um, you know, parking stops, there's more stuff in the way, then it's a little more of a manual process for us or a, small, a different machine type. Why are you looking to limit the number of spaces compared to what the mayor is requesting? Uh, for us, it's really just the, the, there's two reasons why that. One of it was um, looking at the, the aesthetics of the area. We maintain that area. How much uh, how much mass of folks we also add and bring to the beach area? It's great that there, that is proposed in an area we have uh, lifeguard capabilities. Uh, not to say there's a you know a carrying capacity of the beach, but we were more uh, concerned about the room also too for our equipment and our needs during those heavy beach use weekends. We like, again, we have roll-off dumpsters, we have utility crews, we have extra sheriff's folks out there, extra police presence, extra property maintenance people, and we need some room also, too, to put that stuff. Okay, you're going to have to really sell me on that one because okay. I want as many beach parking spots as <laughs> humanly possible. I understand. Thanks. Um, I have some comments to make. Sure. Uh, uh, and the people in the uh, and uh, they kind of probably know where I'm going to be coming from because I did last time. Um, the people on the CRA are lifelong friends, and I've had major issues with this. I don't know if the majority of the board did last time. I think we did because we asked them to come back. I I think they're already operating the jitney, 
and mm -hmm. um, but not the parking part yet, but they're already operating it. And um, I only know that because when I ever read the newspapers, do I know what's going on or I hear. But, but my thing is, is I don't support the back end parking, as you don't. Uh, there's a there's a Fifth Street crossing. Uh, there's no uh, that's to me is a safety issue. Uh, there are no lights around Fifth Street because you know the beach turtle. You got to remember the turtle lighting. Um, uh, there's a picture in the elevator of Manatee, the, the, that, the three piers beach, and there's a lifeguard stand and two girls in 1976, and I'm one of those girls on the beach sitting on a towel. And so that's around A Street. <laughs> so um, you never, you know, whatever. But anyway, um, I, I, and I grew up and I lived on top of the surf shop. I brought this up last time. This area is very important to me. If we're going to put a parking lot in front of those piers and enlarge it and offer all those parking spaces, to me, I have major issues with that because I live out there now 51 years, but I represent the entire county. And when we brought this up at the last time, there were a lot of citizens and recreational surfers and all that really upset about this. Our citizens were. Um, we're providing, and uh, you know, you know, I'm sorry to my friends. But you know, I got a job to do too, and I take it seriously. But we're providing a parking lot for the Bridge Street, our business district, district in Bridge Street, for their employees and the customers. And I was asked by the mayor of Holmes Beach, and and I talked to the mayor of Anna Maria. This was a while ago. What about us? You're providing a parking lot for their business district, but what about us? Um, the major I represent the majority of the citizens, all the citizens of Manatee County, and I have to think about that. Uh, this is the CRA. I don't know if it all is in the CRA, but we provide between four and five hundred thousand dollars reimbursement back to the CRA because they are a CRA. So they receive that amount of funds for us for revitalization of Bridge Street and the area wherever that is. Um, I I just and then to have us take the down by the boat ramps at Coquina and make that into another parking lot. Um, again, for the employees of Bridge Street, which I know they need, I don't go to Bridge Street, and I've told John I love him to death, but my husband's on a walker. It's almost impossible for me to find, find a parking spot. So I've never even been to the Daiquiri deck yet. I want to go. I heard it's great, but I just can't get there. And now they're, you know, we're, we've built all these businesses, and now they're so successful, there's no place for clients to park. And I don't think that I should be giving up the county's properties for just one business, one street, or one area. You know, um, the positive side of it, side of this, is uh, Clint Miller. Some of us know Clint from way back. He called me one day, madder than heck, because it took him an hour and a half, and he couldn't find a parking spot. So him and his wife left. They wanted to go to Bridge Street. So this may help something like that. And also. From what I understand, Coquina is, I mean, um, Brainton Beach is going to maintain all that, so we don't have to. But I got to look at the citizens of Manatee County, and I just can't see doing this to benefit a CRA that we already pay for $500,000 a year to, to improve it. And what about the rest of the island, and what about the rest of the citizens of Manatee County? And I'm sorry about our surfers in Manatee County. I, we, we're losing stuff every minute from our character. And to me, I, I just don't want to see a parking lot. Well, Madam Chair, if you don't mind some quick, quick dialogue. We're not, originally what I heard is that they were looking at removing parking spaces um, along three piers. And that was going, that was the original proposal that I It was going to be a pull-in, you're correct. correct. And, but that has been, that has been discarded from what I understand. And we're looking yes. to, they're going to create new parking spaces where currently parking spaces don't exist down by the EMS building, which would be east of Gulf Drive, correct? On the east side where the boat ramps are, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah, and the lifeguards. Right. And as you know, we stage our all our parades there every year. Sure. And we have functions there, and we're going to be giving that up for a parking lot. Um, and actually, the project's already started. I don't even know why we're talking about it, except I guess they have to, they need our parking. It's a pilot project right now just to see if there's going to be an interest in utilizing the Jitney. And so they're not utilizing parking. They're doing a tram, a I'm tram sure there run will right be. now. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. The employees will be able to have a place. But uh, 
they have the monkey bus, they have the trolley, but this is another way to benefit our, the CRA and the businesses. And that was what about next, the rest of the citizens in the island? That was going to be my next thought is, is can the trolley, I mean, the trolley is every half hour, isn't it? It's not every 20 15, minutes. Every 20 I minutes. Know that okay. For a fact. So, Okay, so the, the tr it's, it, they say every 20, but I'm telling you, I, I've well, had, anytime I need it, season. two of them pull away and I stand there for an hour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, is the trolley not something that we could utilize for this? Do we, does, do we require an additional vehicle to make this run? And another thought was, what she was, Commissioner Whitmore was talking about the back end parking that she has an issue with. I, I like aspects of it, I dislike other aspects of it. Could the, could the tram run between the, the cars and Gulf Drive? I feel like it's actually safer to worry about this jitney coming, you know, this little tram coming by, you know, what every 15 minutes versus constant traffic on Gulf Drive that you would be back, trying to back, you know, back up into and pull out into. You would have sort of this little lane where the tram runs, and you could pull into that and then back into your space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cer certainly an option that we could bring up, up with the city yeah. folks. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, those are my concerns a while back and really I never got them addressed. Uh, nothing's come before the board since then except what just, you know, what we read in the paper and what actually what I've read in the paper. So, right. and this is the time to discuss it and it is gonna be a pilot. Sure. And I understand that, but once you start a pilot and are we okay, are we leasing the property to them? Are they paying for our property or are the citizens of Manatee giving up property? Well, and that's part of the discussion today is what okay. would you like to see uh, that arrangement look like? And we could approach that with our update to our local agreement that would come back to you. Is that something you'd be interested in having a lease agreement with a city or CRA? Uh, or would you rather just let them use it? Um, that's and they that, maintain it? Correct. And I think no matter what, we'd like, we would like them to maintain that designated parking area. Again, we're talking about the area that we would designate on the east side of Gulf Drive over here. Uh, for the employee parking. So what about the west side? Because they'll be changed, configuring our parking. Are mm -hmm. we going to, um, they'll maintain that? Uh, if, it, if it's appreciably different, again, where we, we want to work with them on is the design of it. If it's something we can still maintain like we maintain today, that's it's, really is any different for us. But if it's something that we can't utilize the same ease of equipment, the efficiency, we will need to ask them to, to maintain it. So as we proceed with the design, we'll know more. And when we come back with your local agreement, we'll have a recommendation for you on that one. And Madam Chair, are, you didn't mention anything about the initial capital outlay. You said the city of Bradenton Beach would maintain this. But what about the initial capital outlay? Is that on? Is that supposed to be on the county? No, no. sir. City of Bradenton Beach. City of okay. Bradenton Beach. So they're paying for all of this. The yes, CRA, sir. right? Exactly. And that's my kind of deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, I have no dog in this fight, but I had to bring this up because I still wanted to make sure whatever happens, there are no stops in front of the three piers. I guess right. if somebody wants to be picked up for a second. You know, I mean, I don't want that to be um, not being able to be used traditionally, historically, for well, 60 or more years. If you're three peers, you can make the walk to Bridge Street. Yeah, I know that. I'm talking about the surfers. <laughs> oh, okay. With gotcha. surfboards and all that right. stuff. And, you know, the parking has been, I don't know, and the mayor can tell us, the parking has, I thought um, John had... Uh, added more parking in in the city along the side streets or something but maybe not with jet skis if he's still i know he's here and he'll probably okay. tell us what what's going on with that because i don't remember anymore vanessa uh commissioner ba you can call me vanessa it's okay. well i'm trying to be formal today so they can get their commissioners out and then we'll um, i i like the idea of more parking i mean we hear all the time how people want to go down to the beaches and they can't once they finally suffer through all the traffic to get there, there's no place to park. So I don't, I'm, I'm not saying I'm okay with all of the details that we have yet. I think there's still questions. I think Kevin <coughs> brought up some good points. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I think we should look at increasing the parking. I'm glad to hear that you're not gonna go with concrete, uh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, that would not be amicable to me, but um, I think it is, you know, we've gotta remember whether we like it or not, the whole county's growing, including the island. And, you know, we're going to have to figure out what we've done in the past we can't continue to do because we have a lot more people here than we used to. And, and that's one of the items that I was talking about in, in contemplating how to move forward in the future. It seems to me that we really need to think about what type of county we need to look like with 411,000 people today, knowing that, you know, only a couple of years from now, we're probably going to have close to a half a million. So we're growing rapidly, and we're going to have to change 
uh, to, to make sure that we can do what we need to do. But that being said, I also think about, you know, it's a, the surfers. I mean, yeah, there, there's the old town touch that we really don't want to lose. But I think if we're smart about it, and I think the guys are, and I think you guys will come up with a good plan, I think we can have both. Um, but we certainly, I think, do need more parking. I thought it was a great uh, presentation. I was, I was really pleased with what I was hearing. So yeah, he did a lot. They did a lot of work. Yeah, a with lot Brain of work. to Beach. Brain to Beach did a lot yeah. of work too. I was impressed. Commissioner Servia. Yeah. Yes, thank you, and great presentation. I agree. Thank you, and I'm, I look forward to hearing from Mayor Chappie on his thoughts. Um, John, is there a difference in the number of spaces between the backup angled? Parking and the staff recommended recommendation. Yeah, there, there was commissioner and maybe perhaps uh, Mayor Chap when he comes up can address that. I forgot what the difference is, but the, most of the additional spaces were on uh, the intercoastal side. Obviously, the that's where the ramps. biggest addition came from. If yeah. we did back up angled to. parking, correct? Yeah. Th well, this on the east side was the straight pull-in uh, parking spaces. This added 332 on the intercoastal side. Uh, but I don't. I probably don't recall the what the number side. is on the yeah. west side. But may, perhaps Mayor Chappie will have that number off the top of his head. And then, um, have you communicated with DOT? This, this is a DOT yes. road, right? And Correct. DOT is good with either option. And the city's been in communication with DOT. The edge of right of way extends about six, seven inches in places outside of the edge of pavement today. The rest of it is county right of way where the most of the parking is. And the city has been working with them on this. And it's be it's through them as a grant. Uh, working with them on this microtransit project. So they are in communication and the design guidelines will be consistent with what the DOT would permit. Right, and mm -hmm. as a member of the MPO, <clears throat> I really am excited about the Jitney project. I hope it's very successful. Um, it because will be. any ways that we can move more people with less vehicles is, is what we're looking for. Um, can you explain to me, um, do you know of a county or city that has changed into the backup angled parking and how difficult was the learning curve? Your alma mater FSU near the stadium, there's some back end angled parking. Have okay. you been to a game recently? Um, <laughs> but there's also uh, some back end angled parking in downtown St. Petersburg. Yep. Uh, and there's some in downtown Tampa now. Uh, if you go uh, further really? out of the area, uh, Washington, D.C., places there's some back end angled parking in some of those major <laughs> metropolitan areas now. Uh, but it is, but you also find, you find all the great information from all the city traffic engineering and urban planning stuff, what a great thing this is. But also when you search it out on Google, you can click the news button, you'll say, oh my gosh, these people, what are these people thinking? This is the craziest thing ever. So you get kind of both sides of it, but it's just kind of like roundabout. It's new, it's different. There's probably going to be a time when more and more cities do more of this because it does have a proven safety benefit, but it is a little tougher to get used to for drivers that aren't used to it, certainly, just, just like a roundabout. Yeah, so the learning curve is going to be a little bit painful, mm -hmm. but, but in the end, it sounds like it can be a really good um, way to park cars mm -hmm. and maybe safer. Sounds like it's safer. Mm -hmm. Is there less encroachment for, if you have your backing in, then you're not encroaching onto the walkway as much? Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so your parking stop is sort of behind you, and you have to have, you design it a little bit differently, where the nose of a vehicle extends by beyond the front tires an average length. Same thing. Sorry. Same for thing for the rear tires when you back into something. So fortunately, these days it's easier to back in. Everybody has back end cameras on their cars now. It's a little bit. It's not as tricky as it used to be. But if you're not as skilled of a driver, uh, sometimes when you do this type of parking, you'll tend to, when you pull forward, you'll pull it in an angle, putting your nose into the oncoming traffic lane. And that's what you have to be careful about when you're performing this maneuver, is you gotta get sort of taught how to do it and used to, used to doing it and doing it correctly so you don't endanger yourself at the same time of you know, doing this kind of parking. You know, I've been out to Bradenton Beach probably twice in the last few months, mm -hmm. and it took us a long time to find parking. So um, they are very successful, and I would like to support the success of those businesses by providing them with parking. And I was listening to what Kevin said about the permit parking, and that's interesting. We should think about that, but I, I think um, if we gate it, then you're talking about less patrolling or no patrolling. Right. You're going to require patrolling if you permit park. So oh, I'm sorry, Sherry. Sorry. So higher operating costs, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, that that was the only point I was going to make was the reason for the suggestion of the gating was for two things. One is that the patrolling of that extra patrolling, um, the parking passes and the gating is because um, when when you pull together our group, which is Joe Westerman in charge of our marine rescue, Chad Budsow, who's our public works director, I think he's behind me here, Charlie Hunsicker with Parks and Natural Resources, and Charlie Bishop with property management, we get all the staff together along with Mayor Chappie and all of his folks, what you find is that beachgoers are going to park in that extra parking that is for the employees. You'll, you'll never, they'll never be able to find parking. And so right. for, for any kind of dedication for the, if that's the purpose is to use the jitney is that um, a parking gate um, allows for that to be used by just the individuals meant for otherwise there'll be um, additional patrolling. Um, Commissioner Sir, did I see you push? No, James, were you raising yours? Um, sure. So I guess the first, I, I'm assuming that the pull through versus the reverse, we have the right of way and it's not gonna change the numbers of sp number of spaces, except for maybe that one little spot where you have to get going closer to the beach as you're coming south. I believe it increases the number of spaces, Commissioner Bullet, the Mayor Chappie, um, who probably has the numbers right off the top of his head. It does designate the spaces better when you start putting parking, parking bollards out there right now, because uh, right now they're really, uh, they're, they're not as obvious, or in many cases they're not existent. So you mm -hmm. just kind of pull in and you take a guess of how far you should be spaced away from each other. And if you have a, probably a nicer car than I do, you probably you know, <laughs> give yourself a lot more room than some people. <laughs> Uh, but when you designate the spaces, you add the certainty to it, and typically you increase the amount of spaces when you put the bollards out there and the parking stops, excuse me, the parking stops out there, not the bollards. And Commissioner. Then, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Just, keep going. I'm just talking. in general, I was just going to put out where I'll probably stand is that, um, especially if we're not giving anything up long term um, and we're not laying down concrete and, uh, you know, if we're take, keeping things relatively um, low impact, and I'm going to be in favor of, you know, of mm -hmm. as much parking as we can get mm -hmm. within within reason. So maybe not 340, whatever it is they're asking. I haven't seen it, but uh, I say let's get close. We've got the county's growing. People want to go to the beach. That's not going to change. Uh, why not give them a place to park? So. Commissioner Bellamy. Yeah, I have a couple of comments. I was just thinking about, <clears throat> about what Commissioner Ball is saying. Um, we really need to begin with the end in mind. Uh, we know that. Uh, we're projected to grow um, here within the next next few years. And to piggyback off what Kevin was saying, we probably need to make sure that we, we're getting the best bang out of this and get as many parking spaces as we possibly can get. Um, we already know a lot of us, you know, pass up the opportunity to go out there because we don't want to deal with the traffic and we don't want to deal with the headache mm -hmm. um, to, to try to find somewhere to park. I mean, that's two hours out your visit right there. Um, to, to, to be honest with you. The, and the other comment that I want to make is about the back end um, parking. It's kind of trendy. Um, and I was just telling, telling Kevin, and he, he brought up a, a point about the public safety uh, approach. Um, it's probably safer for a, a vehicle to bike in and, and try to dismount all the things that they take to the beach than it is for them to park in straight and then they have to manage the kids and then they have to manage the cars parking by as well as trying to dismount you know, their, um, not balloons, all the things that you take to the beach. Floats. Yeah, Everything. All, all the noodles and things of, that th things of that nature right there. So I, I really think the bike-in um, parking is, is, a, is a public safety strategy. If, if, if we look at it from a different focus lens, it's an opportunity for us to assure uh, public safety from a different uh, perspective. So I, I, I like where this, where this is going right here. It sounds pretty good for us. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, since it's a work session, I just want to kind of back off everybody uh, in terms of what, what they're saying to give you some idea where I am uh, super fast. One, I, I kind of feel like the, the next presentation almost should have come before this presentation because we're going to talk about the need for beach parking. That may have cleared up some of the discussion about how much parking we need. Or we're just going to have it's a discussion on it in 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I hate Band-Aids. Band-Aids always waste money. You know, if we have an opportunity to put more parking here, and, and I get the, the concept of, of keeping it the way it looks and how it used to be, and that's great, but we are growing and people want to use these beaches. We have places like Daiquiri Deck coming here because of the people that we can attract to to the island 
and right now we're kind of uh, capping it, if not uh, decreasing it, just based on lost parking in other cases. So, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of kind of that last mile transportation with this Jitney, and I think that'll uh, do a lot for Bridge Street, and I, I think it'll do a lot for the rest of the island. I, I get that this is kind of targeted towards Bradenton Beach, but we do have that trolley. And if I want to go someplace up in Anna Maria, if I want to go to Holmes Beach to, to go to the beach, I'm not finding parking there either. Mm -hmm. And if I knew I can you know, spend an extra five minutes driving down the road and park down at Coquina Beach and hop on a trolley, it'll still take me to Holmes Beach, still take me to Anna Maria. I, I can utilize the entire island by parking down here. So effectively, the other cities are kind of taking advantage of this themselves is not just exclusive to to this area while the jitney may be the trolley and the monkey bus certainly are not mm -hmm. so um from that standpoint i i agree with with a few people's comments that you know i, I don't think we should band-aid this because otherwise in a few years we'll be coming back saying how do we get some more parking over here mm -hmm. just because these parking spots fill up by 10 o'clock in the morning and we're driving around mm -hmm. um and finally, just based on that back end, I've never seen that back end parking, but I think it's it's really cool. And that's my personal, I've never used it, so I haven't actually hit anybody yet, but I, I thought it was a cool concept when I read the presentation. Okay. Um, I'd like to see it in action, but you know, I, I think it was a pretty cool idea. Okay. Although um, I am curious how you go back north. Because yeah. <laughs> you're, you're facing <laughs> south once no, you're back you're, in. You're so you just got a lot of people trying to U-turn it out of that thing yeah, and call, you know, stop up traffic once you figure that out. That's a good point, too. Um, the, um, as far as I'm, I'm almost positive, the trolley doesn't allow, I know you even have to wear shoes on it, and I don't know if you're allowed to bring coolers and um, lawn chairs and stuff. So I, I'd like somebody to check that out. I, you think I would know that, but I don't think you can. So that would be because that would be a great idea, but um, but and I'm not sure if the monkey bus either, but I don't ever ride that. So they'll let you do whatever. You want. They'll let you do whatever as long as you <laughs> give them a tip, right? Exactly. <laughs> Look at you guys, you know. Um, and, and you know, guys, I uh, I've heard the comments about well, we aren't going to do it like Carol with the what the way it used to be. Well, the, I'm I'm okay with what we're going to do, but what. It used to be is what brought all these people here. This is the quality. This is what they don't see. I've heard so many times, why would I go to um, Sarasota and, you know, and get that experience or St. Pete Beach and all that, where we were always a little bit different. So, um, you know, think about that. That This is the character. This is what attracts people here, the quality of life. I'm going to support this if you guys do, of course. But I just had to make my concerns because I hear from a lot of people that had issues with it when it first came. Well, I hear your concerns, and you're going to echo the concerns of a lot of my constituents, I think. So I guess my question would be, you know, as it is right now, I think the, the quality of life is negatively impacted by what everyone has said every time they go to Bradenton Beach. It's, you know, a battle to find parking, mm -hmm. and I don't think we're going to cure that today, but hopefully we can ease it to some extent. But I don't want it to negatively impact the south end of the island either. Uh, I don't think Mayor Chappie would want to do that. Do you feel like turning the east side of Gulf Drive down by the boat ramp and, and by EMS is going to change the culture of the island that much? Do you think it's going to have that great of a negative impact? No, I was more or less, because again, that's for employee parking. I'm sure. cool with that. I was more um, worried about um, the citizens of our county not being able to find a parking spot when the surf's up, and, and you know that the Bridge Street's busy because everybody's in the bars, par bars partying, which is great, sure. and it's good for business. Surfers are there, and then they go down to Bridge Street. That's fine. Fishermen, when the um, cold front comes in, that's where they all are. You know we're, that. We're actually, both familiar with going to Bridge Street. Yeah, and the court. <laughs> so am I. I actually lived on Bridge Street on the only hotel. <laughs> I lived there. Um, the only, it's called Magnolia Apartments. So I lived there when I was 14, <laughs> so I, I've had that experience, too. Um, I just want, you know, the character of, sorry, Vanessa. No, I'm that's the truth. I'm going. Okay. Yeah, Kevin and I have Thinking a really Bridge good relationship actually. with the island. Um, but um, I just wanted to make sure, remember why everybody goes to Bridge Street, why everybody goes to the islands well, is because of the character of it. Sure. And we were a little bit different. Um, I'm fine with if we can work something out with Brayton Beach and we don't have to incur the expense of maintaining the parking. Um, that's what I heard yesterday when I was talking to John. That's wonderful. And um, if uh, this jitney's another way to get the people um, a parking place, you know, we're, we'll be adding more parking spaces. And um, 
keep them moving instead of walking in the middle of the street, looking up at the sky and looking at the sure. beach and not seeing where they're going. When the mayor comes up, I would like to know about Fifth Street, how you're how you've planned that. Is there going to be so the tra the tra um, what do you call it, the jitney can cross the street? There right. may even be a pedestrian crossing there already. I don't know, right. but that may be a safety issue. Well, hopefully this adds spaces, and so the locals that you know you and I are both worried about have a little a little easier time finding parking spaces. And how we how we not sell it, but how we educate your district is just that that we are going to be able to we are going to provide you parking spaces so that you can enjoy where you live because you can't get there now right my goal is to ease the traffic burden right. in Bradenton or the parking burden in Bradenton Beach right. without negatively impacting the quality of life in Bradenton right. Beach any other commissioners want to speak I'm going to not I'm going to ask Mayor Chappie to come up is that all right, John? Yes, Lee? Madam Chair, Charlie Hensicker also had a comment. Oh, I'm as sorry. A, I didn't see Charlie. So either way, whatever um, order you Let like. me let Charlie speak real quick, John, and then or Chad, and then. Yes. Madam Chair, I, I was just going to offer that uh, Chad Bussell could uh, provide some professional perspective on the uh, parking. On the backup. And, and the backup parking versus the pull-in parking. And uh, okay. Mr. Butso, uh, you're up. Okay, Chad. <laughs> um, Hi, I just wanted to. Uh, provide some information related to the trolley. As we all know, the intended and planned schedule uh, based on the three trolleys that run out there is for a 20-minute cycle, but everybody also knows that Traffic either jams. March or peak summer season on a 4th of July or something, it, they go as fast as they can. And then uh, what Commissioner uh, Van Osterbridge mentioned was it's all about spacing. Mm -hmm. So because of whatever stopping and letting people off or getting them on and off, we magically get bunched up. So it's almost like it's not two left. One went backwards to try to re-get the spacing again is how we try to run it. During the peakest of peak times, we try to put a fourth out there as long as our uh, uh, on-call drivers are still available. Uh, we're able to put a fourth vehicle out there and try to help out. As far as there's not a prohibition of what you can carry on to the trolley, typically what you'll find is they're so crowded, or at least pre-COVID, they were so crowded it is not a terribly inviting sight for somebody dragging two coolers and lawn chairs or something, because a lot of times during those peak times it's standing room only. But we would not prevent anybody from carrying a cooler on board and uh, taking their stuff. What about uh, shoes? I think you have to wear shoes, right? Yeah. We, oh, no. yeah. we leave no one behind. We ask that you wear shoes. So you, uh, the, the plug that I would come back to, COVID's going to make it a little interesting. Last year was our first year. This year, beginning again Saturday, December 5th, is the state incentive grant on weekends and holidays to encourage that we have an extra vehicle that runs on the Manatee Avenue corridor between oh. 75th and Manatee Beach, trying to encourage a park and ride, uh, awesome. uh, free rides from 75th out to the beach on, on that, just as a plug. Where do they park, Chad? Where do they park on 75th and Manatee? On which side of the road? There's ample parking in the uh, mm. parking lots Kmart. on the north side, north side of 64. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we're going to wipe it down, and then Mayor Chappie's going to come up. Thank you, sir. Well, first, I'd like to thank you all for giving us this opportunity to come to you again. Um, John, great job in the presentation. Um, you're, you have a great staff. We've met with them and talked with them for the last several months uh, and um, listened to, of course, listened to what they had to say and just back and forth, and it's really great. Um, I can go right down the list if it's okay. I'd be pretty quick about it if you want. Um, Take Just, your time. Um, as far as uh, Kevin, I like this Kevin guy. I haven't really talked to him too much, but uh, <laughs> I like what he's saying. Um, I lived on 8th Street for nine months. Uh, oh, when there I first you go. Came here Another 8th uh, Streeter. 74. <laughs> um, I think I know where the condos are. Where, where you? Seagrave. Not that many. Yeah, Seagrave. right. Yeah, right there. Um, okay, uh, as far as plants and stuff, it, there's really not going to be a whole lot. Uh, the Australian pines, we don't want to touch no stinking Australian, I'm not stinking, but Australian pines. Thank you. Uh, that's a good way to get into a battle. So, you know, and this, what we're proposing would not 
mess with any Australian pines that I'm aware of anywhere in there. Uh, I know Carol had, has a lot of concerns, and, and we, we, we appreciate and respect the, 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 the feedback that we're getting from Carol. Uh, a couple things. There, there is a light, a crosswalk light, at 5th Street South right now. Okay. Um, that gets into the route. We've, we've kind of adjusted the route to some degree so that um, uh, if, if they're coming in and going out, the first option is always to use the roundabout on Bridge Street. If traffic backs you up when you're heading north, then, then you try maybe 3rd, 4th, 5th would be the very last street you would turn on as you're going north but uh, and then the, the route goes around there but you know it's about public safety it's about that last mile uh, points real uh, well taken and, and that's really key to get people to where you would like them to be um, as, as far as the the um, uh, providing I know it's a concern providing parking spaces for the for the merchants so uh, w right now during the the timing is what's key to understand is when the beaches are packed that's not the busiest time on Bridge Street, and we have parking spaces on Bridge Street typically d throughout the day. It's later on, after 5 o'clock or 4.30, 5 o'clock. That's when things start to change. Uh, Kevin, you're very familiar with it. I know you are. Uh, so, so there should not really be any problem. Our biggest problem right now, one of our biggest problems, too, is, is of course, the, uh, the um, employees parking in areas that we would wish they wouldn't. We have increased our parking area, parking lots throughout the CRA area. And then the other big problem that we're having is the beachgoers love to come down on Bridge Street and park early, set up camp, and then they just go out to the beach. So they're taking up some valuable parking spaces throughout the day. So, um, so the ti and the timing is just different. So I, I, I really don't think timing uh, uh, is going to create a problem where you're taking away from the beachgoers at Cortez Beach and, and further down at Coquina Beach. So um, uh, as far as... Um, um, I, I, I appreciate the fact that the, the, the discussion about the back end parking, it's different and people don't like change, um, but boy, it does eliminate a lot of, of, of um, uh, visual problems that you have. Uh, it, it's a big difference. I know they had the same discussion years ago when um, Bradenton was talking about back end parking on Manatee Avenue uh, right out there, and really? they decided not to go with it. Oh. Um, the, um, this is a CRA project, so you know it's it's the, the so the funding would be through our CRA, which we're allowed to use CRA funds for things that are not directly in the CRA, but will be benefiting the CRA area. And I appreciate all the comments about what we've been doing in Brayton and Beach with the Community Redevelopment Agency, and with the incremental tax dollars that are taxes on property in Bradenton Beach in the CRA, this is a little bit towards Carroll. So it's not oh, the I county know. giving us the money, it's, it's tax dollars that these people have to pay that come back for direct revitalization and, and uh, improvements in our, in our community, similar to uh, some of the great things that you're, you're doing throughout the county right now in what used to be called your CRA area. So, um, and, and we hope you all will continue to visit our areas uh, and look at that. Um, Let's see. Uh, really, I, I, you know, unless you have some other questions, uh, I, 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 I've heard what you said. I, I, I think uh, they're all very important, uh, and we want to work and partner. Um, some of the new one, newer people might not realize uh, Bradenton Beach one, is one third Manatee County property. Mm -hmm. One third. That's a lot. We're a small town to begin with, and we have more traffic than just about anybody else. It's, a, it's a, one of the widely, widest used facilities in, in Manatee County. We get people, location, location, location. It's a crosswalk for Longbow Key. It's, it's, um, uh, so and we don't get taxes off of that either. So we have to have a 10-man police force when, when uh, you know, because of what we have. I'm not complaining. I love it. I loved it some, since day one. Are you holding that up because I have three minutes? Or no, no. I oh. wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you to bring up your parking lot. You haven't mentioned the west side. You asked. I've, if, I've known her most yeah. of my life, so I, I get that look from Caroline. We're like brother and sister. But no, will you? You had. You asked if there's anything you hadn't brought up. The west parking lot, John. Are, is your CR going to pay to do all that and maintain it, or we don't know all that yet? Or we're, we're working through the details. As, okay. as, as John said, if it's it's a, if it's a substantial changes to what you're used to and what you're doing, yeah, uh, and, and we plan on doing that. We don't want it to be a cost 
to the to the county. This is a CRA project. It's using the same materials. I know you have some people heard that before, but uh, right now, right now we have a situation, uh, a public safety situation at Cortez Beach, and we talked with the county people about that uh, quite a bit. Backing out on Golf Drive is not a good idea. Totally. Uh, especially in an area where you have bikers going by, you got mm -hmm. a, a bike lanes, you got people in the parking area with their bikes, and you have cars moving up and down on the in that parking area, uh, and it's just kind of everybody at, at their own uh, uh, risk. Uh, this um, this will give some structure to it, give some definitions to where you're supposed to be. I, I think it's a tremendous improvement for public safety. It's it's about a net gain. It's, it's, it's really not a gain or loss, I don't think. It's about the same for the parking number of parking spaces in the Cortez Beach area, which is okay. from basically 4th Street, Street three South three 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 to, to uh, 13th Street 13. Street South. Uh, but it's just going to make it a heck of a lot safer for everybody. Uh, and, and that's key. So, you know, with little ones at the parking lot, it scares me to death. I live right across the street from there, and it's, you just never know when, when some little guy's going to dart out someplace. Um, so, um, and, and it is illegal to back out on Golf Drive. It's a state highway, so. We, um, don't leave. They, we have questions for you, Kevin, no, go ahead. and then Misty. Well, one, how do you feel about my theory, my concept of putting the, the tram way, or whatever you want to call it, between the parked cars and Golf Drive instead of between the beach and Golf Drive. That way, we're eliminating people having to back from Golf Drive. I mean, I understand there are poor drivers all over the place. I mean, a third of the Michigan plates I see, they just drive with their left turn signal on all over Manatee Avenue. So right. I, and you'll, never, you'll never solve the problem, right? But at least if we can try to ease the problem up a little bit. I like the idea of backing into the spots because it's safer for kids and unloading and unloading. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe if they weren't having to back on Golf Drive, you could pull over to the right into the, the lane where the trolley would be, and then you could back into your space from there. You see what I'm saying? So the, the trolley lane would be between Golf Drive and the parked cars. I, I think one of the safety things that we're looking at is to keep that separation of the parking lot from Golf Drive yeah. and the, and the um, traffic moving up and down on Golf Drive along with the bike lane that's right there where we sure. have these bikers uh, not just the casual stuff, that because they're on the multi-use trail probably sure. most of the time, but it's those bikers going up and down on the on the bike lane, mm -hmm. and to have the tra the tram going up and down on that side, I think would create a danger. But we can look into that. Uh, uh, the, the idea of just having one way in and then one way out about midway and then and then the same thing you know maybe divided into two sections um, it, it, it's trying to create not trying it's creating a much safer environment for when you have the pedestrians the bikers the walkers sure. and the cars and the unloading and loading um, uh, and I, I you know the, Okay. I think that's what we're really trying to accomplish. But uh, we can look at that absolutely and get some more feedback yeah. from from county staff. Uh, you know, we're here to try to work with y'all to figure out the best possible way, the safest way, not take away parking, but add parking as we're trying uh, proposing down at uh, Luffus Key area on the east side and that that access road along there to have some parking in there. Right. The, the the right of way at FDOT is only about 50 feet along that area, Cortez Beach area very narrow so we're very limited with the spaces okay. that we have I'd be interested to hear Commissioner Servia as a planner has to say about that too but also where are you on lighting and cameras in the actual parking lot I'm glad you mentioned that a couple things we've talked about that at, at our staff level and um, what we're and we're talking with the merchants around there for the uh, areas that would be set aside for employees the for the shifts we would be aware our police department would be aware of the shifts that would take place and then we would have the opportunity to make sure that a police officer was in that area right there when it's happening cameras there are ways and we're looking into uh, um, adding some cameras um, the Wi-Fi camera however they sure. do it nowadays mm -hmm. to our existing system that we have right now it's very limited and we need to modernize so we're looking at that and that, that would be something that I will be taking back uh, as far as lighting uh, I don't know I don't recall any lighting at the north boat ramp right now no. um, we are we are uh, uh, we have a two million dollar appropriations grant that we will be starting in a couple months it's already started but to bury the utility lines from from longboat key all the way up to the cra area good. so we'll be getting rid of any wires that are down there and um, uh, 
Good job. And that would be the time to look at some sure. extra lighting down there in the parking area that might be needed and something that the mm -hmm. uh, county might want to add at the boat ramp facilities mm -hmm. down there as well. So, um, yeah, but I'm glad you mentioned that. I, almost I appreciate forgot. it. And if you'd keep me in the loop as this progresses. Absolutely. You're our, you're our guy now. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, Misty. Yeah, great discussion, <laughs> Mayor Chappie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, underutilized parking lots. For example, the post office. Uh -huh. Do uh. does Bradenton <laughs> Beach have a contract with the post office? to use those spaces on off times? No, yes, we do. do. Okay. We, work, we work that deal with them um, um, Seven about months. a year and a half, mm -hmm. almost going on the second year right now with the post office that, that um, after hours we're allowed to utilize the front from four, it's either four or 4.30 when the doors close, mm -hmm. we can utilize the front parking area where the asphalt is. On the side, it's after six o'clock because they may still have to have use of that area. Um, and on weekend Saturday, the post office is closed, so we're allowed to use it there. And the agreement that we made with them, we're not ones to come in and just ask uh, with not giving anything. We always like to have our, 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 our money in the pot as well. You know, it's, it, it's a partnership. You have to work together on these things. So one uh, part of the deal was we would maintain a beautiful, you know, put a landscaping. We already resurfaced the parking lot there. We're doing landscape. They were out there today. Uh, we're trying to finish up the landscaping aspects of our latest project on, in the CRA with trees and shrubbery and bushes and everything else. So, um, yes, we do have that. Uh, uh, I know uh, we're, uh, we also allow parking uh, in our um, city parking lot on weekends, of course, uh, and even after, and after hours, we've added some parking over uh, near the PD area. We have parking at Lou Barola Park, which is across the street. There's a few more. Any, t any place we can, we've been able to pick up parking spaces. There's a space for anything we try to, we, we're, we're, we look at it and we try to add, absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you, you are currently working with all those areas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so it's a DOT road, and you know how we see the DOT electronic sign on the interstate that tell us about accidents that are coming up and things like that. Is there an opportunity for a messaging sign like that to talk about parking? Um, you know, where the message could change. If, if we decide to do the back end angled parking, there could be a little, you know, uh, animation that describes how you do it. Have we thought about any of those things? I, ha I, I don't think we really had a serious discussion. I know, um, how many years ago was it when they had those, uh, those uh, messaging signs that oh, they put right. on the overhang yeah, and they, took them down. they weren't uh, engineered properly and those things would go like this mm -hmm. and then they finally took said it's off. not safe. And then um, have you guys explored yeah. any carpooling incentives for, for the you know, businesses and the people who are on Bridge Street? Are, are there any incentives that the CRA could offer that well, would help to um, reduce the cars? One of the th well, the CRA now is is uh, uh, footing the bill for the pilot program for the uh, the um, jitneys that are running right now. We have two of them that are running. Um, don't ask me the hours, but it's you know in the starting in the afternoon and then they they go forward with that. Um, also, the Dacry deck is required to have its own it, its jitney to operate with for the uh, to get the permission to build that structure they have there. Uh, AMA, the Anna Maria Oyster Bar. They weren't required, but they do have their own jitney as well. They're hoping to get off of that and and utilize our um, our tram system that we're setting up, the micro transit system. Uh, we have advertising on that that's hopefully going to, at the end of the day, it would be nice if it would cover all the cost for the to run that. So uh, we're trying to raise the money uh, uh, through advertising as well, similar to what the trolley is doing. Right. And years ago, we did try to see if the trolley could go down Bridge Street. It doesn't. It's tight. It can make it, but it's not tight. safe. Yeah. Right. Not safe at all. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I just have one. Uh, Kevin, I've actually seen a person fall from a golf cart. I think a little inebriated. So I would be nervous also about looking at going, uh, being right next to um, Golf Drive. I've actually seen it. So... Um, let the record show that was probably Holmes Beach or Anna Maria not in Bradenton. <laughs> Actually, it, it was in Holmes Beach, but it doesn't matter. Everybody's on vacation party and having a great time. Um, when you are, due to sunshine, we know that, but if you are sending updates on it, because the only time I ever know what's going on really is when I read it in the newspaper, 
So if you could at least copy the commissioner, George and I at least, because we're your district, he's your district, we're your others, but we won't respond, but just so we're in the loop, okay? Absolutely. And also, thank you for doing the underly underground lighting for from the bridge to Bridge Street. I know yeah. Lombok Key's done it all. I think they're all done now, right? Lombok Key's done all theirs now? I'm not sure about that. I think they that, are. But... Yeah, I think they mm -hmm. are. So good job. And I do, when I'm bored, I live vicariously through all of you, and I just drive up and down Bridge Street when I'm bored because I can't go uh, out. I, you know, I don't go out that much anymore, but I love, uh, you've done a good job on Bridge Street. The, the bricks look great, the lighting looks great, and everybody's having a great time. So good job, John. You deserve well, it. Hopefully maybe the county can uh, support uh, uh, Bradenton Beach's appropriation request for $4 million to do the rest of uh, Golf Drive for undergrounding, you know? Yeah. Nice, nice gesture. Let's just get through this first. <laughs> um, Vanessa? Yeah, uh, a quick question for yes, Chad. Okay. Um, Chad, you brought up about the park and ride. And I think that's, you know, I'm excited about that and I'm hoping that it's successful. What are we doing to get the word out on that to the citizens it's so they're aware? I think that's something we've talked about since I've been on this board, so it's exciting to do it every see year. the pilot program. Yeah, we do it. I mean, the main point that we start with, uh, with a number of press releases is the main thing that we do, but then it's a Facebook and it's a Twitter post from the mm -hmm. county. Uh, Many times the park has their own account, Public Works has its own account, and then Nick also is assisting us with what we're trying to do on, on spreading the word. I mean, it's a little bit of a constant reminder because it's not every day. It's weekends and holidays, December through March. Okay. Uh, one thing that we might do, I, I'm fairly certain that all of the commissioners here have their own social media pages as well, so we could get the word out. And, you know, maybe we could get. Um, you know, ABC 7, or we've got the East County Observer here, and uh, well, the Islander, they're already there. But, you know, we could maybe get some media coverage of that and when it is. I just think it's a great idea. I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm hoping it's very successful. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Mayor or anybody in the staff? Good job. So what's the next step, John? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, let me just run by it real quick in terms of make sure we heard everything appropriately. Okay. So as we know, there's no motion to vote on, so we just to make sure we got it straight for you. Uh, so it sounds like, gener generally speaking, you're okay with the concept of back-end parking. Um, so we can work with the city mm -hmm. on that, that design. You're okay with um, <coughs> us working with them on designated a, a, a Bridge Street parking area as well on the east side. For of, employees, for right? For employees Everybody? on Gulf Drive. And you're also okay with some additional parking on top of that. What we'd like to do is work with the city. And the city is a great partner with us on those busy beach holiday weekends. We actually meet ahead of time. We have a, our EOC. We have our, our emergency operations center coordinates an incident action plan for every beach weekend. We work with all of our partners, uh, sheriff's office, city police, all the public works entities, and having uh, basically an all hands on deck for every be busy beach weekend. And they know exactly what we need out there stage where we work, can work with them via the inter interlocal agreement to make sure we set aside those areas that we need for those times. So I think we can accomplish uh, what we talked about today uh, was we, we bring back the interlocal agreement and an updated sort of plan that you saw today uh, that meets, I think, some of the things that you all talked about. So I think I hit the main three points. I'm looking for my boss for help here. One more from me. I don't need to this is great that we're looking at it it's we're the city is looking to do a pilot project it's just going to be a very busy upcoming potential year on the island from another construction point of view uh oh, coquina yeah. phase two will be fixing to get underway right in that january time frame we have another large utility project that may go hand in hand with some utility undergrounding as far as the city's concerned but all right in the same south island area so uh, uh we have some major coordination to do with the city to time things out what is the best time on uh, actually saying are we getting a fair test to the pilot i love that one ear hanging i'm sorry uh but i just want to remind that there's a lot of things still going on on the uh yeah. on the island right. yeah. uh kevin did you want yeah so uh i would just add to uh to that lighting security cameras down there at the end yes sir and that you know, remember that the taxpayer is the customer, and while of course we need 
room for our vehicles and in our workspace down there i think that the top priority needs to be the increased parking for our customers which are our taxpayers so let's be sure that we're maximizing the number of spaces down there uh, but we do have major underground sewer going right now sure that takes quite a bit of property as you probably know it's even on uh three i want to say three piers area but you know what i'm talking about right now and they're not done with Bradenton Beach yet, correct, Chad? I mean, I think you're on 8th Street now, and don't you have to head, are you heading south, or? Yeah, I didn't to... review the status well uh, enough before I came here, but that's finishing up the project that's underway now. There's another project that's. And what's that, a force the, main? Another gravity sewer rehab. And where is that, what streets is that? Uh, like 13th back up to 5th. So that's down at the beginning <clears throat> of Coquina, all the way up to where the, yeah, see, we're going to have to really so, coordinate. We, correct. Uh, we do everything. need the equipment to be stored. Sure, and I, I wasn't necessarily Im implying the timeline, but okay. you know, when when it's available, you know, yeah. when the project is completed. You want more spaces, right? Got and it. and there is remember on the west side at Coquina in the Coquina parking lot, there's a huge grassy area right there for future projects. We could possibly stage parades, could possibly start in that location as well. Yes, sir. So, um, Misty. Yeah, and just to piggyback on what Kevin's saying, um, yeah, lighting and cameras are great, but we're so restricted because of the turtle activity and the type of lights that we can use. And as someone who's working on my HOA right now, trying to get cameras in, um, you need good lighting for those cameras to work. So I, I don't know, maybe we need a report on that, on how that could all function, because we need all that stuff, but we also have the turtle right. nesting to contend It can be directional, with. though. You, know, the, you can set up lighting that is blacked out on the west side and is directed east. Yeah, that's you know, how they do the island be an issue. for turtle right. season. Right. Yeah, okay. So have, there are ways around it. Yeah, they have shields. Um, Sherry? We do have some lighting in that area. As indicated, let us put that also on in the report, sure. and then we can come back and show you what's already existing. It may just be the directions, or it may be the intensity, and um, we can bring that back. Good. To, okay. Uh, Madam Chairman, just over here, Charlie, uh -huh. just uh, just remember that uh, it's um, the light wavelength that turtles uh, respond to. Uh, sometimes shielding one direction still gives you a moonlit glow uh, if it's the right uh, wavelength. So we, we've been able to have full lights with the wavelength that doesn't bring the turtle view and response there so it's possible. I just wanted to say that sometimes people say we can shade it, but we have we have found that partial shading still gives that that dim moonlight glow uh, and a problem. So it's the wavelength of the light bulb itself sure. that does I'm, it. I'm looking Thanks. at this from a 50,000 foot level. Yeah, okay. You guys Sorry. are the pros. I'm not going to tell you what light yeah. bulb to put in the damn thing. Yeah. You know, I, I figured as long just as it's lit and the cameras work, everybody's yeah. safe, yeah. we're happy. It's First all about we heard wavelength. A, and now we've heard damn. <laughs> Whoa, my little glasses just fell off. <laughs> Anything else? But you know, you know who's a pro at that is Ed Childs because he's got the beach house, you know, with the turtles. So it looks almost like night in there, but you could, it's still light. So, yeah. But we do have to because there's federal laws protecting the turtles, so we can't mess that up. So yeah. So we're going to rely on your expertise, Charlie. Okay. Anybody else? Mayor, you did a wonderful job. This is a big step, mm -hmm. and um, we appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, we, I would really like to, uh, and your CRA, thank you for letting us know that your CR, CRA will maintain these, and you'll let us, you guys will work out the details about mm -hmm. the parking lot, who's paying for that with the employees, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, any other questions for the mayor? Okay, thank you, John. Um, we are doing beach parking next. I don't know if he wants to stay or... Okay, does anybody want a five-minute break or no? Yes. Okay, a five-minute break, and it is 2.21. Good. Vanessa, thank you.
Welcome back to our work session. It is 2.31 and we are on beach parking and our Deputy County Administrator John Osborne will be the presenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, little, uh, I think a little more 30,000 foot level now. We just had a, a conversation about uh, City of Braden Beach and now just zooming out a bit about talking about beach parking overall. And so today's just the topic is really just kind of give you an update of what's been going on for our new, uh, the benefit of our new uh, county commissioners. And we have some thoughts and some opportunities maybe for some improvements. And this came out, uh, this presentation is here today because of back in June, we had an item on the board's agenda uh, to discuss parking availability on the island. And you can see what I hi have highlighted in bold here. So this is that part of the present of that motion where uh, the board then discussed uh, the city's removal of many of the non or the off street, or excuse me, the on street spaces uh, in on Anna Maria Island. And uh, so the topic was also to bring back a discussion of you know, beach parking and also uh, the concept of a parking garage as well. So we're going to talk about what's been going on a little bit out on, on the beaches where the trends have been uh, a little bit of background of parking on the island. Um, we're also going to talk about the relationship between uh, beach renourishment and having parking for the public on the island. And are there any opportunities out there to add any additional parking? And I think Charlie Hunsicker wanted to add a quick statement. He's my co-presenter today. I apologize, Charlie, I didn't have you on the slide for, for that, but he is the other tag team member. So come on up if you want to. Or you could sit over just there. Charlie's going to do it from his his seat. I'll take the co I'll take the co spot. I'll take the uh, co presenter spot. Um, at this moment, I just wanted to uh, interject. Uh, while we're going to talk about the relationship to beach nourishment later in the presentation, uh, for a little bit of clarity and distinction and, and distinction, I wanted to. I wanted to identify that beach parking for the sake of obtaining federal and state grants um, are, are very specific with respect to providing public access to beaches that the state and federal government spend their money along with our money uh, to build. And if you can imagine the Gulf of Mexico coastline and the islands and getting a very, very long roll, roll of police tape and setting back one quarter mile from the sandy beach and paralleling that beach with a, a one quarter mile back, a line of police tape all the way down the island. What I want to talk about is everything happening between the water and that police tape, that quarter mile. That's where we focus on maintaining a minimum number of parking spaces for each access point out to that beach. Beyond a quarter mile, it doesn't count, no matter how many spaces we have behind us. So everything for us is inside that police tape to the beach. And we want to remember that as we talk about as changes, as cities change their parking allowances, post more streets for parking or not parking, if it's, ha if it's happening outside a quarter mile, it doesn't affect our federal beach parking a grant availability or our state grant availability. And maintaining that availability is very important because these are multi-million dollar projects and loss of eligibility if we mess up inside that quarter mile zone means millions of dollars of local cost it doesn't, doesn't prevent you from having a beach uh, renourishment program. It just increases your local share uh, proportionate to the loss of public parking spaces. So we're fixated in a way of, of taking advantage of and having adequate public parking in that important zone. And so I, that's, that's the difference in terms of, well, what about the rest of the island? For beach funding, it doesn't matter. So thank you, and we'll get on more detail later. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. So um, back to the slideshow in terms of trends. Uh, we're all very familiar with what's been going on on the island in the recent decades. Uh, the demographics have been certainly changing out there. Um, there's definitely uh, fewer folks perhaps living out there and the number of uh, seasonal residents 
the number of uh, you know, short-term rentals and things like that have certainly increased. But we also have a growing population, not just in the county, uh, but in the region as well, who uh, have, have come to enjoy and realize the beauty of Anna Maria Island. Um, so it's definitely a regional attractor for not just the, our long-term vacation folks and for our snowbirds, but also for um, the overnight stays and the day trippers as well. And the, the occupancy has also changed on the island from the, the non-owner occupied to uh, less owner occupied, obviously. Uh, we're actually tr been trying to get some data in terms of homestead exemptions. We couldn't quite get it before this presentation to see how the, the trend of the homestead exemptions have been going over the years. And we get that, we'll certainly provide that uh, data to you. Uh, back in 2019, during the summer, uh, Elliot Falcioni, our CVB uh, director, uh, had his um, one of his um, uh, tourism consultants do a survey uh, out on uh, the beach on a couple different uh, holiday weekends. And you can see some of the results of that data here. And you can see I've highlighted just visiting for the day. So July 4th and September 2nd, we have a, certainly a pretty consistent number of folks that tend to be our day trippers out there on the island or going to the island and seeking that ever precious parking space. So you'll hear us from time to time, uh, uh, talk about parking and the types of parking and the typical parking lot you'll sometimes refer us will refer that to off street parking so it's the type of parking that is not on a street it's not like parallel parking and the parking that is like that or on the street like a parallel parking situation uh, that is called on street parking sometimes we'll hear us say things like that just so you know fill you in a little bit about what we're talking about it's probably pretty obvious but just in case so beach parking on the island, as we all know, has been historically uh, free. We've had some uh, very, been blessed with some very large public lots uh, through Coquina, uh, through Manatee Public Beach and Cortez Beach, Coquina Beach. Uh, we also have the opportunity to, for the cities, to have a certain number of on-street spaces. And historically, there have been some private lots that have had, that have allowed beach parking. There's not really that anymore. Uh, some of those have uh, closed the, that opportunity uh, recently. But beach parking is important really for some of the reasons here on the screen, but also uh, for what Charlie mentioned was it's very important for us to maintain sort of that maximum grant to benefit for beach renourishment. Um, you can see the quote here. This is from a 2016 uh, parking study that was done out there on the island. Again, this is that sort of that quarter mile from the shore study. You know, reduction in parking or beach access could result in a reduction of federal and state cost sharing. So it's very important for us in that quarter mile area, like Charlie said, to maintain uh, that, that, that maximum grant benefit and maintain that parking. So we had this uh, study back from 2016 that inventoried the parking uh, for uh, Anna Marie Island, it had a pretty detailed inventory. And we have interlocal agreements with the three beach cities to basically sort of set it in stone that we're gonna maintain a certain amount of parking in this quarter mile area. And this is an excerpt, this uh, table from that study. And you can see uh, the number of beach access points, the number of eligible spaces, and we actually, there's an equivalency ratio uh, for bicycle parking spaces as well, for bus trolley stops. So you can see the total eligible spaces between the three cities is about over 2,000 spaces. And the minimum required is just a little over 1,000, 1,023. So there is uh, uh, certainly enough parking there as of the 2016 study, so to kind of think you know, pre-COVID, of what was available then versus you know, kind of what's required to meet maximum funding. And John, could I check? Go ahead, John. Slip in at this time. A uh, lot of people would also say, well, you know, if, if we have to have a minimum number of parking spaces, and we got a thousand parking spaces at Kikina Beach, that ought to do it, right? And uh, that doesn't uh, do it. Uh, again, because the state and federal government believes that access within a reasonable walking distance is important. So it's not so much having the max, just maintaining the maximum total spaces for your length of shoreline, but again, uh, a minimum of 50 spaces within a quarter mile of each access point. And so if you have 40 spaces within a quarter mile, you're not going to meet the, the public access requirements to maintain our full grant funding. So even though we say the city of Anne Maria minimum required spaces is 265, they can't do that with just one parking lot. They'll have to do that distributed down the beach at, with access to each access point. Now, luckily for us on Anna Maria, every public street that's perpendicular to the Gulf is a public access point. 
try that in Jensen Beach over there on the Atlantic side. You may have find five access points along a six-mile stretch. You know, uh, yeah. here we have plenty of access points, but we have to make sure we have at least 50 spaces feeding into those. They can overlap, as they obviously do, because they're more than they're less than a quarter mile apart. But again, I just want to emphasize that we can't meet these requirements with a single parking lot somewhere and say that we're good. Okay. Good point. So the 2016 study also um, had some conclusions to it that are important for you all to, to know. Um, but the, it had a recommendation that the reductions of parking spaces was really not recommended. Uh, the grant eligibility rules could certainly change at any time. Uh, that could negatively impact our funding status. Um, there was also more, there's also more and more competition for that grant funding, and they recommended to maintain a strong as position as possible to, to maintain higher amounts of parking than the study uh, accounted for. Um, but also any changes of parking should be uh, basically presented to the DEP uh, to ensure it doesn't jeopardize our maximum uh, funding that we enjoy today. The study also identified over 400 spaces where parking not allowed signs were in place and these uh, areas didn't really have uh, any other um, features to them in terms of there wasn't a fire hydrant there there wasn't it wasn't too close to an access point there wasn't any other feature why it wasn't necessarily why it should be signed as no parking but they did it, the study did identify some other areas where you could have parking and again this I think pre-covid and pre pre change pre recent changes but the cities and the, the property owners out there uh, certainly have issues with the on-street parking, or many residents do. And we've, we've uh, certainly read the papers and seen uh, some of this out there if you visit out there uh, frequently. Um, certainly on-street parking does have some, some uh, negative features to it as well. Uh, while we enjoy certainly that access and that parking space when we go visit the beach, uh, you can see some of the, certainly the, some of the, the negative aspects for the folks that perhaps live there. Um, and some of the recent changes with on-street parking by the cities, um, you know, when COVID occurred, everybody was really sort of hunting for some outdoor space to get out, and the beaches got uh, really, really busy uh, when they were open. And uh, so the, some of the changes occurred uh, to the parking. The cities out there did some of that, and then there's some, perhaps some more updated information that Charlie or one of the beach mayors could address. But uh, there has been a reduction in some parking out there that we've seen uh, in recent months. In terms of uh, the board direction from back in June was, you know, is, is there anything else out there that could be added to the parking inventory for the public? And we looked at our own assets out there and we don't have, other than what's already available for parking today uh, along our, our public accesses and our beaches, uh, our public beaches, is the beach library. Of course, this would be the off hours kind of thing and it's not a lot of spaces, but it's cer certainly something. And the cities have some assets as well um, that may, may perhaps could be available to add some beach parking, uh, the elementary school as well. Uh, but the challenges are uh, for these uh, organizations and entities is to sort of maintain a certain amount of parking from when they're where they're open for business, but also the distance from the beach. I don't know about y'all, but when my kids were little and we went to the beach, they brought every possession known to man, and it seemed to be the, uh, quite the distance and effort to get to the beach. Uh, but the distance to the beach is really critical. If you can be within an eighth mile of where you park at least, that's a reasonable kind of walking distance um, or for a maximum kind of walking distance for a lot of folks with carrying all the stuff they usually carry to the beach. Um, but in terms of privately owned parking assets, um, you know, if you just look at Google Earth and start looking around, you know, where else could, could people park out here just conceptually? Uh, there's certainly, you know, you see some parking lots that are some of the churches out there and things like that. And Cross Point did allow parking at one point. They don't anymore for the public. And there's certainly some underutilized commercial sites. Um, I've got an extended family member that owns property out there. I go out there quite a bit to check on property for them. And uh, so I notice this on the weekend sometimes or out there after hours and notice some places that aren't, aren't that busy perhaps when other places are busy. So there could be something there as well. But, uh, you know, this is something that could it be a profitable venture for somebody. That's not really us as unincorporated county government to suggest because these are their own businesses. So these are their own nonprofits or their own churches. If they desire to participate in something like this, they would work with their city that they're in and work, uh, and for, as an example, an unincorporated county. If somebody wanted to share their parking with somebody else, they would do a shared parking agreement likely uh, for that. It would be an agreement that... Uh, if it was something that we would do like at a, at a, for a rezone, if they didn't have enough parking on a site, we would work out a shared parking agreement, it would go through us. And that'd be something that these businesses out there or in nonprofit would coordinate with their 
their city because every one of these cities has their own zoning, has their own land development code and those their own regulations to enforce uh, parking. So it's certainly not up to us. It's, that'd be something between private property owners and those cities. Another concept that was discussed too was, you know, what about a parking garage out there? What would, what would that be like? Uh, any parking garage would be uh, come under the relevant city's land development code out there, just like us. If somebody wanted to build a parking garage, as you'll experience uh, in your uh, once a month land use hearings, you'll get to uh, review and consider a lot of different types of land development projects. Uh, in Manatee County, Unincorporated County, some of these go before uh, Board of County Commissioner, some of these are done administratively. And these cities, the city of Brady Beach, the city of Anna Marie Island, uh, and Holmes Beach all have their own land development code, their own comprehensive plan and their own standards, how, what they would allow out there. And us as the county, we come under their building permitting, their zoning. So whenever, anytime we do anything to any of our properties, we actually fall under uh, their regulations. We apply for building permits when we do something to one of our properties on Anna Marie Island, to whatever city that is. Uh, just like in, uh, in downtown Bradenton at our county administration building, we do something to the building, we get an electrical permit or whatever from the city of Bradenton. So we fall under their permitting processes. So it's not completely up to us when and what we do with our, with our property. So there are some, uh, there are a few existing sites outside of the existing county owned properties that are in walking distance. Keep in mind, whenever you build a parking garage, uh, you sort of have that, that mass flight of people going from that garage to that attraction. Um, so what, what is that, that attraction? How far is it away from the beach? Um, is it a lifeguarded beach? Are the restrooms there? So you're going to put a lot more people to one particular location. It's got to be, you think about that when you're, if we ever start thinking about a parking garage. So concerns by the county for, you know, any, any site for a garage would be, you know, how does it reflect upon uh, the area, the compatibility? Um, how does it work with, uh, in terms of how we're going to pay for it if we decided to do, consider a parking garage? Parking garages are not cheap. Is it something you would use your tourist development tax for, whatever? But you think of about, when you think of a parking garage, think of about $13,000 to $15,000 per space is about the going rate wow. for a parking garage. And by the time you actually go to build it, if you did decide to do that years later, of course, those numbers will be uh, a little bit higher with consistent with the price of concrete and steel. So also, you know, That's maintenance, great. funding the operation of it. Um, but there are uh, existing county-owned sites out there, you know, Coquina Beach, the Manatee Public Beach, Bayfront Park, uh, the Coquina Beach, you know, does the city of Brady Beach allow garages these days? Would Manatee Public Beach, being a city homes of beach, would they allow, a, you know, a low garage there? Uh, Bayfront Park is probably too small for something like that. But those are some of the things that uh, when you start thinking about a parking garage, you know, where, where would you put one? Where's the best place to put one? Does the board even want to consider something like this? Or is there some type of private property out there that would be available uh, for a parking garage? Um, what kind of commercial properties that would exist within an eighth of a mile, generically speaking, of an area of the county beach that could receive you know, a quantity of, of people like that in a reasonable walking distance? Um, you know, if directed by the board, we could you know, research you know, what's available. But what we'd want to do first, though, would be also to come up with the criteria and you know, get that blessed by the board before we started you know, looking at anything like that, if you were looking at you know, public or private property, um, what type of, you know, where, where the utilities are, what type of size garage would be beneficial, uh, price range, and what would, based upon certain areas of the beach community, depending on what the zoning required and what, how big and the height limitations, you may find that you, it may not be worth building a parking garage. I don't know, it depends on how many spaces you could feasible, feasibly add could you double the amount of parking at a site or not? And there's a lot of things to consider when you go to build something like this or consider the construction of something like this. So again, prior to any activity, we would seek clarification and approval of any type of process before going forward uh, with a, any type of uh, parking garage. And this would include uh, board approval on any of the specifics, the process we use, the due diligence, the feedback, the type of report you'd want to see coming back, you know, that kind of thing. So it'd be a very specific conversation if the board wanted us to go down that road of considering and looking for a, a parking garage, even on our, on our public property or on looking at some other private properties uh, for a garage. What do other communities do? Uh, I spoke to Elliot a little bit, Elliot Falchone, our CVB director, um, 
he, when you what other what other communities do. And many of y'all who've like me get get around a little bit. I, I like I mentioned before, I grew up in Pinellas County, went to Madeira Beach and Reddington Beach, and Florida Beach. Most of my young adult life, um, <clears throat> most of those beaches even today have uh, a lot of online. Uh, stuff that helps you make a, an informed decision when you start making your trip to go to the beach, right? You can go on an app, you can go onto Facebook, you can actually, there's uh, like a commissioner survey was saying, there's, as you get closer to the beach and you're driving out there, there's some signage usually that tells you if there's a parking issue out there. Um, a lot of the cities and counties also cooperate too with having a beach uh, parking plan. So they work together and identify the areas that uh, where you can publicly park. It's very clearly mapped. And uh, a lot of times these days on the busier beach areas um, on the other coast and you know, Miami and also is in some parts of Pinellas, you'll be able to get access to information as you're heading out there to see, you know, what the, what the quantity is like. Uh, do I have a chance of getting parking out there today and so on? You'll find most of the, um, the parking garages that we found were associated typically with resort hotels instead of uh, with perhaps a public parking facility. But a parking management system seemed to be a very common uh, denominator when we researched other larger beach communities and how they uh, handle parking on the beach. Um, you can see that the list of communities there that had also paid parking. That's, that's it. We're not saying that needs to be the thing or not, but a lot of uh, places did have at least a parking management system and provided more information to their traveling public about what was it like out on the beach. On our busy beach holiday weekends, we implement our beach incident action plan, that partner group we have with our cities through our emergency operations center and the sheriff. And we actually put additional uh, billboards um, or those portable message boards out further out on Manatee Avenue and Cortez as well. We also work with the DOT on those message boards on Manatee Avenue and Cortez, those fixed ones that you see as you approach the beach. And, and we've also on the busier beach weekends, we've even provided information on the I-75 signage board about if our beaches were busy, closed, whatever. So we actually do do that now on the busy beach weekends. It's not something we do on every busy weekend, but at least on the holiday busy beach weekends, that's something we, we do already. Um, you all find other counties also um, are having uh, the same discussions. Back in February, Sarasota County uh, directed their staff to look at a variety of things to help address uh, beach parking. Um, you know, everything from you know, bike sharing to valet to um, you know, the, again, that cell phone app that seems to be pretty popular, identifying open parking spaces and commute times. Mm -hmm. um, and they are also looking actually uh, at some paid parking as well. And one particular option, uh, we're going to present to you, you know, a few options, and all our options aren't you know, the end-all, be-all. Uh, we're looking for that conversation today, obviously, uh, in that direction. But uh, one option would be perhaps beneficial <laughs> is a bit of a parking study. We think this could be a resource that would be uh, useful, not just during uh, busy holiday beach weekends and for our, for our own incident action plan efforts, but also having a sort of a, a geographic information systems type layer and map that identified all the parking areas. So when, when changes did occur, we'd all be on the same page about them, something we could communicate about. Uh, but also we could work with um, the beach communities, our own parks folks, about having that more of that detailed inventory, especially as we work with the uh, city of Brayton Beach about any parking changes out there and getting that down pat about the number of spaces, their availability, what's for what, and that kind of thing. We th think that might be a useful tool for us all and help identify that best mix of you know, parking options for the people that visit. Um, and maybe that, when is it viable to have uh, a, you know, an off beach parking area that transit, that, that transit uses? And there's a lot of other things that are optional to help out people to have it more of a, of a positive mobility environment and getting around on the island more when they come out there, uh, having those things a little more laid out, kind of a little bit like the city of Sarasota did, or excuse me, Sarasota County did. Um, uh, an option we could look at, you know, the concept of paid parking fees, that's up to y'all. Uh, the, the constant thing we have heard when this topic has come up before though, is that you know the county residents uh, would not have to pay. We've heard that uh, loud and clearly okay, and uh, John, before if that was, that John. came up. Charlie, if I answer it right there. Um, also, want to remind you that uh, paid parking is possible under a beach renourishment uh, funding scheme. The only limitation the state places on any parking um, moderations or modifications is that it, there's also a, a desire to let's, so let's set up some you know, reserve parking spaces, maybe for the city or for the county only. And I, I want to point out that. If we or the cities take action to to identify a parking space as reserved for anybody, 
city, county, just Florida plates, uh, raccoons. Uh, any of those, anytime you reserve a parking space, you take it out of the public inventory. Mm-hmm. So if there's a, if there's a what, what if we do reserve parking? If that occurs within our quarter mile zone, we lose those spaces to eligibility. And again, um, maintaining the, the minimum spaces per access point is very important. I might also add uh, that the state has a long memory. Um, for instance, we were funded in 2014 and 2017 and now uh, with renourishment on the basis of strength that we met the minimum requirements. If, if by action of the cities that have this jurisdiction, those minimum numbers fall below 100% eligibility, uh, the statutes are clear. The state has the opportunity to come back and ask for repayment from the county for that portion of eligibility lost you know, during the so-called life of their project, which is you know, decades. So uh, we have to be cautious there. That's why um, we're going to be doing another uh, update to our parking study uh, for next year to keep current with city changes. Uh, that's why we ask the cities to keep in contact with the county whenever they're considering parking changes. And that's why we insist that before those parking changes are implemented, because of the dire financial consequences of doing something the wrong way, we ask that DEP weigh in and say that a proposed change does not affect the county's eligibility for the renourishment. Okay, thank you. And the last uh, slide before you, commissioners, is just this. Again, this is not the end-all, be-all of, of options, um, but uh, we will we will keep communication certainly open with the cities. We we work really well with the cities, especially with our incident action plan meetings and those coordination the coordination we do for all of our beach holiday weekends. Um, there that opportunity though to have perhaps a master parking public plan that sort of. Uh, it, it adds on to the, the study that Charlie mentioned in terms of there's that, that required study for beach nourishment, but, but what about the rest of the island, what the rest of the area that perhaps could be some other parking opportunities? What about the options for the use of technology? What about the options for the use of additional signage? What about the other options? You looked at some of the stuff that city of the Sarasota County was doing. Uh, to have a little bit more of an in-depth plan to bring back to y'all, perhaps maybe maybe beneficial for us and perhaps even the cities and even our tourists that visit here. Because I know if you go to our website for uh, Manatee County and tourism, it does show you a map and there's a couple, it shows you our public beaches, but really not much uh, more than that in terms of uh, parking opportunities. Um, you certainly could ask us to, to start looking at a, uh, you know, a private uh, or excuse me, a public parking garage, or even just a, a, an additional lot of sorts that could something be a direction for us. Uh, we would bring back some criteria and a plan for that. That would be our first step if that was something you all wanted us to do. Um, and is there any other options perhaps? Then, uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. We have George, me, Misty, Kevin. Oh, we're already done with the commissioner thing? Yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah. Uh, I just had one quick I'll question. I'll do it at a regular meeting. <laughs> this is a work session. You can actually wear jeans. I just, work you can call me whatever you want. Uh, uh, this was a quick question, actually, from something that just came up with Charlie. If we end up with a clawback situation for losing too Call many back. parking spaces, what? clawback, like, like the state can In come back and, oh. and ask for previously granted funds. Okay. Uh, is that an all or nothing clawback, or is it proportional to the number of parking spaces that we end up short of the minimum? Uh, Charlie Hansiker, it is proportional. Okay, it's proportional. So this isn't like we drop down one. This isn't like, you know, we're too short per quarter acre or quarter mile, and all of a sudden we have to pay back tens of millions of dollars. This is, right. I'm not saying we want to do that either, but I'm just saying this isn't the death of our yes. beaches if we miss it somehow. Yes, sir. But City is always a but. Uh, as quickly as I answer that, I'm, I'm making that recollection from, a light, from about five single space pages of regulations that the state has published on this issue. And I might take just a moment to phone a friend on that question. <laughs> um, back in the back, uh, Erica Carbetts, uh, who did the 2016 parking study, is working for the consulting firm who is managing our beach renourishment programs and keeping us abreast of those parking requirements and advising on that almost monthly. And I was wondering if I could throw that question back to Erica. It is proportionate, is it not? Uh, Erica, you have to come up on the mic, please. 
Yeah, Charlie, absolutely, you're right. It's proportionate. And your name? My name's Erica Carr Betts from Aptum. Okay. Yeah, Aptum Consulting Company. Consulting. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? And Commissioner uh, Cruz. And, and, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right now, uh, what kind of cushion are we looking at relative to that minimum? Are, are we in a position where this is this is imminent to look at? I mean, I know it's imminent because we need the parking just because people want to use it, but uh, we're not bumping up on that minimum right now, right? Like some of the proposals of taking away street parking, things like that, aren't going to tip us. Well, Madam Chair, Mr. Commissioner, uh, we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we, are. We're, okay. we are very close in some very. circumstances, particularly in Holmes Beach now. <laughs> and uh, because Bradenton Beach is so narrow, uh, we're very tight there, too. We are full eligibility, but Erica, can you elaborate just a little bit? I can, I, this is Erica again from Aptum, and I completely agree with Charlie. I worked um, with the um, chief of police at Holmes Beach, mm -hmm. and we were right on the cusp of um, not being, uh, not having full eligibility. And he was able to work with me, and we were able to get full eligibility for that um, portion of the shoreline. But with these things being taken, there was spaces being taken away, we have to be very careful at this point to make sure that the spaces are adequately distributed mm -hmm. along the shoreline. And actually, he, Holmes Beach had to add space. This is yeah. what they're not telling you. No. That, but I'll, I that, live there, yeah, so that, I can correct. tell you. Yeah. That, that's right. correct, Madam Chairman. We, we, had, um, we had to make them add spaces. Yeah. Literally on a street-by-street -street basis. Right. And that, that's why I'm, I'm very concerned. You know, when you end up with, you have to have six spaces on the street, uh, Mr. Tolkinger, Chief Tolkinger. And so they, they went from five to six. Okay, here it is. Well, if there's anything that happens to drop up to five, only because there's so much money involved, um, a lot of people have been looking at this, including our state partners. So, and, and with each uh, news story that follows changes in parking, you know, Tallahassee doesn't have a representative living on Anne Marie Anne to, to watch it every day. But when the media picks up on the cities considering yet another parking change, there's some comments on that. And it comes back to us from Tallahassee to say, so, um, you're still meeting the requirements, and then we have to go forward and say, yes, we're certain we are. But we're very, very thin in some locations, and it's better to have like a 20% buffer here in many instances because parking changes all the time. Someone puts up a, a new fire hydrant someplace, or someone changes their parking around their driveway and puts up some obstacles. That happens. We used to have you know, hundreds of spaces of, of leeway uh, before the COVID actions, but now we're very tight, so we have to pay, pay much more attention to it. I'm sorry. Um, our attorney wants to make a comment. I, I just want to add to that, um, Madam Chair, that this is driven by the public purpose requirements of state and federal law, that we're supposed to use public dollars for public purposes. It's the same public purpose that applies to the county. So, for example, the tourist development tax statute says that we, that, that's what we use for beach renourishment. And that statute says it's for beaches that have public access and public use. This is the way the state is interpreted, and the reason it's such a big issue for the county is we take responsibility for the entire shoreline of Anna Maria Island. So they're having to go down that whole shoreline, the whole island, to find to make sure that every part of it that we're spending public dollars on, whether it's our dollars or state dollars or federal do federal dollars, meets that public purpose requirement. And that's why it's so challenging. It's not just like one place, Coquina Beach. It's the whole island, and there's a lot of private properties along that island. It's great that they have beaches, but it's questionable whether we can use public dollars to, to just re-nourish beaches in front of private homes. There has to be a public use there as well, and that's why we, we wrestle with this. That's the source of it. Okay. The clawback, I don't know that it's ever actually been done. I mean, you know, it's something that's in the regs, but I don't know if they've ever actually clawed money back. Not I don't so know far, if they've ever perhaps. done that. We've been good until now. Well, I mean anywhere in the state. Oh. I don't know if it's ever actually happened. I mean, it's, it's on paper as a, a right in theory, but obviously it could be a considerable amount of money, and that people would lawyer up in that situation, and, and you know, there would be a back and forth. So I don't know. Okay, Hi. so next myself, Misty, and then Kevin. Wait, uh, um, me, Erica, did you want? Yes, and in 2013, there was a project on Captiva Island, and the federal government was already to um, cross share on that, and they didn't. Okay. So, and it's parking and access um, problems. 
which happened. And now they're having to argue and fight and get that um, cost share back, the federal portion back. Oh. So they didn't claw back, but they right. did pull out of the project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Brainton Beach, uh, and I know the mayor's still here, so I'm not sure. I know there was three things on the referendum, and two things were approved, and I, I'm not really sure about the third one. I think they, um, the citizens voted for a parking garage, but there's something else in the rules that don't allow them in Brainton Beach. But the mayor's here when I'm done. I mean, he can explain that. Um, parking garage, uh, the Barnett Bank, wherever Kevin Kevin is, um, they uh, there is a place by Publix that's been abandoned for years. I brought that up um, that possibly we could look at a parking garage and tourist tax could pay for that. Um, that's an idea um, in the city. Uh, and um, that's something that we could look at. On, on your slide number 16, some of the churches have uh, historically allowed beach parking. Cross Point is White Avenue, as we all know for, I know Kevin would know that's where all the surfers go, that's the other place. Um, during COVID, it was closed. The chief of police asked to have it closed, and it was closed. And when it was reopened like normal, which it had been for 60 years, um, the residents complained. And so the, the um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moss, Reverend Moss, went and asked the neighbors to do a poll. And myself and the Rudisils were the only two that said put it back like it was. So there is no parking there except maybe 15 or 20 on the beach side, and in the church side, maybe 10 or 15, and they closed the rest of the parking lots off. Uh, Rosier Church that was mentioned, um, they have a interlocal agreement with the businesses on Pine Avenue that they allow parking for the businesses, so I don't think that would be an option. Uh, Gloria Day has put a daycare in their parking lot. They um, need financial help, so they tried to rezone the property and the city wouldn't allow it, so now they operate a daycare out of there, um, so that wouldn't be an option. St. Bernard has never allowed anybody unless you have a function in the church. Uh, and um, some commercial sites are underutilized. Uh, during COVID, I remember in Mother's Day, uh, some people parked in the parking shopping center where Hurricane Hanks and all that is, and minis, and I saw three or four police cars there towing their cars away because it was only supposed to be for commercial use only. So it hasn't, um, my city hasn't been very customer friendly. Tonight at a city commission meeting, they are talking about if you haven't paid your parking tickets, two of them, and you get a third one, they're gonna boot your car. <laughs> In Manatee County, I've never heard that. So, but this is city commission talking about it, doesn't mean it's gonna happen. Um, I don't support paid parking, um, but I may be the only one here who knows, but I feel our citizens get nickel and dime about everything else, and there's not much else enjoyment that we can um, offer. Um, you know, to our citizens, so I don't support that, and my, you know, my staff has known that. We're talking about a parking study. It sounds like, John, that um, we are gonna be doing one anyway, mm -hmm. so we wouldn't, hopefully we don't do it twice to waste money, because I think we did one in 2016, I think the MPO approved it, it was like $175,000 or something like that, yeah. ridiculous. Well, the, the parking study in 2016 that we're citing here, we did for our beach nourishment uh, function. Okay. So, do we pay funded by the, funded by the one cent? Uh, okay, the TDC. MPO paid for one also, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And that was a, about 175 to a couple hundred thousand. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I just want to make sure we're not wasting money. We all know there's no parking, so what do we need to do a study for? But I mean, I know we do. Mm -hmm. I know the elected officials said that every time. And the Episcopal Church tried to in my city. My city probably doesn't like me anymore because I I really call them out on it, but. Uh, they charge paid parking, and they're right next to the public beach, and the city closed them down uh, because they said you weren't zoned to do a business like that. So, you know, we got to figure out a way to get our citizens to the island, and I don't know how, and be customer-friendly, everybody, and I don't know how to do that. Kevin, you're next. And, 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 and Madam, Madam Chair, just one last distinction, and I, you can turn my mic off if you want. Oh, it was misty. But, I'm sorry. Just sorry. one last distinction. What we do for the renourishment program is we do a parking inventory, and a parking study would be much more comprehensive about you know other suggestions and options. Our, our tourist funds only pay for an inventory to assure that we are 
current with the minimum requirements. A parking study, as you mentioned, is a much more exhaustive effort, much more, much more expensive, and, and in much more in-depth. But when Erica works with us and her company, it's a parking inventory that we're doing. Okay, okay. Thank you. And City of Holmes Beach had 2,500 parking spaces before COVID. Today, they have almost maybe 500 now. They eliminated 2,000. 25 to 5. Is it 5 now? It was. They only have to give us 434, and they gave us a few. Well, once again, this, those, those fine-tuned numbers are, and parsed that way are so uh, uh, discouraging to me because we need a healthy buffer to work around these day-to-day -day changes. But What, what uh, is the number now? What's the number now? Well, uh, Erica, uh, what is the number now? I think it's Do you like know? five. I don't. I don't remember. I think it's four sixty something. But I oh, four sixty. I think I can look at my notes if you. If and you. it's required four thirty four, right, or something like that. Yeah. It, but again, again, yeah. again, remember, can't do that with one parking lot though. It has to be no, evenly know. distributed. We know. We know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Misty. Yeah, thank you. Great discussion. And um, I, I disagree with you a little bit, Carol, on the parking study. I'm in favor of that because I'm I think okay. that yeah. um, trends change so quickly with parking and transportation, and we're, we're not going to lose what we've already invested. We're going to build on that right. and hopefully get more information. Um, so I've, I wondered about um, Uber and Lyft because, you know, there's so many different ways to get to the beach, right? So you can do this down park and ride. You can drive your own car, which we're trying to discourage a little bit. Um, what about if we did a very convenient, well-located circular drop-off for those driving apps, you know, to encourage, and then you could haul your coolers, your floats, and all your stuff right up to the shoreline mm -hmm. and be dropped off. And how would that apply to the, the federal counts that we need to make? It, it, is that considered? I don't know. Probably but just an idea. And then we have an, an upcoming, um, uh, what do we call it? We were just talking about the meeting oh, with the city, Council the Council of Governments. of Governments. So is it possible that we could put this on the agenda with Holmes Beach and, or maybe all the island communities and, and have a meeting or a workshop at the Council of Governments where we talk through this? Hmm. Uh, because having that buffer, as you described, is, is so critical. And when it's that narrow, <laughs> you become nervous. And it reminds me of impact fees. You know, the same thing with impact fees. I like that buffer of what the fee should be, always making it a little bit lower to reduce the risk of lawsuits. I, I don't want to be the first that does clawback, you know, that where it may not have happened before, but I don't want to be the first. Right. So I think it's really important to protect that. Um, I did have a question about, um, I think about Whitney Beach where the parking has been closed off, and Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, um, for a while because of COVID concerns, right? Well, at least that was the reason that they gave. And it continues to be closed today, I think. And, and so my question is, does COVID uh, play into this at all? Is there any buffer for if we were to go below the parking number because of COVID? Oh, Erica? Um, so I'll answer the last question first. Right now, they're kind of, or at least previously, they were kind of closing their eyes to any COVID-related beach closure or like parking space closures. But I think that's going to wear off pr pretty fast. Yeah. Right. I think that yeah. if it's, if you extend that too long, they'll know that the EP and this, the federal government will know that it's on purpose, that you're not providing access to everyone equally. Um, I, we are going to include a, uh, a request that we change the rule to add um, a small eligibility amount, like shoreline length, to, for the Uber and Lyft designated spots. Okay. So we'll, we'll you know, discuss that with the DEP if they accept it then that will add to your eligibility if it's included in the rule. But currently, it's not. Bike spaces are, trolley stops are, and that the jitney, if there are additional spaces, that'd be included. But currently, Uber and Lyft aren't. And, so would it, would and it Erica, be, Erica, Erica, and remember when she says we, she means the state of Florida. Right. No, uh, no. Manti County won't yeah. be able to get a specific county exception here. Correct. It has to be a rule change uh, 
through a, almost a year-long process uh, to consider that option. But go ahead. They're also interested in, um, in uh, many, many municipalities are also interested in pushing for designated golf cart spaces. Mm -hmm. And the state is, is willing to hear that. Uh, how many eligible, how much eligible length of shoreline will be provided if you have a designated golf cart parking? Yeah, that's a great idea. And that's what the parking study is going to show also is in inventory. What, <laughs> an inventory, what types of cars are going to the island. So, you know, if we can create more compact spaces, if that's indeed what we're having, it may be an opportunity to grab a couple more spaces, uh, motorcycle spaces, bicycle spaces, all those sorts of things. Okay, well, that would be between the study and the inventory. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Misty, thank you. And Kevin, I don't know if you know this, but Holmes Beach, and again, I read it in the paper, I don't go to the meeting, gave extra um, parking spaces somewhere in the city for golf carts. For, you have to get a permit, or you got to get a sticker, and also um, they give them to hotel owners. But that's sure. it. I don't even know how many. Right, well, that's, that's primarily going to be for people who come in and rent an Airbnb weekly. It's really not going to affect it's to be for citizens day too. trippers. Yeah. Some, some citizens. And you know, so I would start off by saying that I've spoken to many residents of Holmes Beach. Uh, you can look at my Facebook page. I'm not going to name their names, but a lot of them are, are on there. And none of them support this, these actions that the city, the city commission has taken. They're, a lot of them are embarrassed by the actions of their city. It's an extremely unwelcoming. Um, it's, it's very disappointing. And you know, my family has, is from Anna Maria and, and Holmes Beach. And uh, they've been out there since the 1930s. That's just a few months before you moved out there, I think. Um, no, I'm just. <laughs> but it is. They've been out there since the 1930s, and uh, you know, my my grandmother is actually the longest living member of Roser Church. Um, really? She is. Oh. Um, and so this is this is very disappointing. It's it's troubling. Um, I would say to residents of District Three, many of them live in town and they work out on the island. So I would say to those employees, I would say to people who own businesses out on the island but may not live in Holmes Beach, um, that the the government is not against you, right? I would say this to those taxpayers. You you know, I ran on a pro business platform and I do support those workers and those businesses and I know that this hurts them. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways about this. Um, so I would tell you you have a friend in government and I will stand up for you. Thank you. Um, and I would say to Joe Hendricks, write this down, please. Ah, he will. <laughs> okay. So Mayor Titsworth and the Holmes Beach City Commission, they have jeopardized future beach renourishment projects in their city. I will not support county participation in beach renourishment projects in Holmes Beach until on-street parking levels are returned to pre-COVID-19 levels, period. Pun intended, I'm drawing a line in the sand, if you will. I'm open to hearing her concerns and the commission's concerns when it comes to additional patrols that are needed and enforcement that is needed. And I'm open to negotiating with the city when it comes to adding you know, county support for those patrols. Um, there are many other areas in this county that would love TDC funding, millions and millions of dollars in TDC funding. Misty's district, Reggie's district, right? You, you all represent some of the older districts, the older areas in this county. And you would absolutely love some of that, those millions and millions of TDC dollars to come into your districts, I'm sure, and to bring some economic opportunities into your areas. Um, if the city commission does not change their tune, I absolutely will not support added beach. And I understand the impacts of this. I've met with, um, with Charlie about this, and we've discussed the, the chain that needs to take place over years and years um, to ensure the beach renourishment funds um, are received. It takes like 10 years to ensure that that's received. Um, and I'm fully aware of that. However, the beach belongs to everyone. That goes to my position against pay, you know, paid parking at the beach. It goes to this as well, right? This, is, this is, belongs to the public. It's the gem of the entire county. That's why everyone lives here. That's why these people who live on the island, that's why they live on the island. And that's why this county is growing as fast as it is because people love the beach. They absolutely love it. And, it and the, the beach literally is county property. It belongs to every county taxpayer. And if you want all of them to participate in renourishing that beach and in caring for it and maintaining it, you have to provide them access to it. 
So I would like for the county to, I would like, Madam Administrator, I would like for you to enter into negotiations with some of these churches out there on the island. Maybe St. Bernard's will change their tune. Yeah, um, that's a big one. And if it's something that they can't be paid necessarily by. Um, Tourist tax. Yeah, maybe, they, maybe the, you know, TDC can pay. That. Let's look in possible ways that we can reimburse them. Um, for parking, you know, outside of Sunday mornings, basically. Also, if you could talk to the school district about weekend and holiday parking at the school. Elementary, yeah. Yeah, at Anne Marie Elementary. But also, I think this county, uh, one thing that we should look at is the state has minimum required levels of parking um, for the state to, and the feds to participate in beach renourishment funding. I would like this county to set much higher standards. I would like us to set pre-COVID levels of parking. I think if you're looking for a number, 2,500 parking spaces as a minimum in Holmes Beach is where we would start if they want us to participate in beach renourishment funding. So I'm going to take a very aggressive approach with this, but I'm just shocked uh, at the actions of the city of Holmes Beach. And I think it's a vocal minority. I think the vast majority of residents in the city of Holmes Beach and the business owners in Holmes Beach, they're really kind, welcoming people. And, and they know they live in a destination city and they want people to come to their city. Uh, and so as the representative, I would say, you know, I, I absolutely represent everyone out there. Uh, and those who are staunchly against this, you knew that you moved to a destination city when you moved there. And it is not a private island. It is open to the public. It's open to everyone in this community, regardless of where they live in this community, whether they're in Samoset or Palmetto or West Bradenton, the beach belongs to everyone. Uh, Thank you. You are my commissioner, you know that. And I am so um, happy on your comments. I have, uh, I, the, the police chief of Holmes Beach, I've asked him not to contact me since all this happened again. Um, there, I, I am so happy that um, you've done what you're doing. I, I don't have it into me to be as direct as you, Hello. so, but you're my commissioner and um, I'm happy that somebody in the leadership of Manatee County that represents that district has actually said it publicly. Uh, to lose 2,000 parking spots, even though they weren't within so many feet of the beach that have been going on since your grandma was there. Your, her, his other grandma was my school bus driver, just an FYI. But ever since uh, 60 years or longer, and to see everything dwindling away, thank you. And I actually kind of heard your comment about paid parking, I, as you, you probably have heard in the past, I support, I don't support paid parking either. But um, I would recommend that you have a, and I don't know if you want to, but I think it would be good from the district commissioner to have a sit down meeting with the mayor of Holmes Beach and the chief. You've made yourself public, Joe, Joe, it'll probably be on Facebook tonight in his Islander. Yeah, I've, I've met there. with, <laughs> well, I've, I've met with. Uh, They're watching probably. I, I have met gotten... with the chief um, and I, when I was campaigning, I reached out to the mayor a couple of different times and even left my card at City Hall and um, we had breakfast pushing a year ago, but uh, since then when I've reached out to her, I've not heard back. And she is a Holmes from Holmes Beach and like I said at the beginning of the meeting, I have people that say horrific things about me, threaten to drag me out of my house and hang me. And you all see, I block some of those people and I don't know, but I hear what they say. I still reach out to them. Yeah, and I know Judy, I've known her Your for whole a long life. time since, yeah, this is a long time. And uh, she's a very good person. Yep. Um, we just disagree politically on this issue. And that's fine. And I'm hoping that you would make it easier as a district commissioner for the staff to be able to work with what our directors may be about the city of home speech and before we're done i would like to know what the rules are in bradenton beach i know mr satcher's next um if the mayor could come up because i'm not sure about the referendums i'm you know again i only get my info from reading the papers and i should read them better but i've been kind of busy with my husband so but i'm gonna ask mr satcher to come up first i mean to speak first and then if anybody else and then if the mayor would come up um I don't know that there's all that much left to say. <laughs> yeah, Kevin kind of um, made it pretty plain. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want to just say that I, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't feel like we picked a fight at all. I feel like it came to us. Um, you know, it's just egregious on its face to go from 2,500 spaces uh, to 500. It puts us at risk. Mm -hmm. um, 
with the money that uh, you know has been given. Um, so I think it's wrong, and uh, and so I'm, a, I'm I would like to see also uh, along the same lines is let's see where we are most likely to get what we need as far as uh, places to park cars. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this close to, you know, like in home speech would probably be good. Um, and honestly, uh, let's file for those permits. You know, I, I mean, I say let's file for those permits as soon as possible. Um, and if we end up not going through with it, which would be uh, fine, that's what we all want is uh, for things to go back to a sustainable level the way they were. Um, but if that's not an option, then we need to uh, we need to look to letting our people be able to go there. And so I agree 100%. Are you talking about permits for letting the, the 2000 park again? What I'm talking, talking about building up. I'm, I'm oh. saying hopefully I feel like this issue should not be um, have been put upon us, mm -hmm. um, but it has been. So then I'm looking for other options to solve the problem. Okay. And so the one that I can see just, you know, is to build a parking deck as close okay. within that quarter mile if we can get it. Um, and, I mean, honestly, to me it looks like, uh, you know, there, this was purposeful. And so that I could see somebody trying to change the regs pretty fast. I'm on television, so I guess I'll see this. But, uh, but um, so I'd like to file for it as soon as possible. Um, with the uh, with whatever gives us the biggest chance of succeeding. Okay, uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge and then Commissioner Baugh. So, Mr. Satcher, I would just caution you on right. moving too quickly with the parking garage. That would be detrimental to the character of the island. Right. And remember, mayors and uh, city commissions come and go. Every two years. Right. And so it's you know the political landscape could easily change in Holmes Beach, and then we'll have built a permanent parking garage. You know, which fundamentally changes the character of the island and political landscape changes, and now we have our parking spaces back. But we've made a permanent decision with a parking garage. Go ahead. Yeah, I would I'm so filing for the permit. So if we file for the permit, then we have the option if we can get the permit. So that's more. I'm not saying, obviously, there's going to be budget and appropriations and all that to actually start building. Um, but filing for the permit um, seems like something that we could move ahead with. Um, Mr. Sasser, just so you know, every city has... Um, Oh, yeah, Commissioner Satcher, sorry, has a uh, land development code and a comp plan and height restrictions and no parking garages, I think, so they don't allow them. So that's when, like Kevin's right, we have to have dialogue with the commissions to see what the future would be. Yeah. Commissioner Baugh? That's what we can do. Yeah. That's what I want to do. Well, you know, this whole afternoon has been extremely interesting and, and one that I have truly enjoyed. Um, I will say that I totally agree with Commissioner uh, Von Austinbridge. I think that uh, I can, I will tell you that I feel like that it's gotten out of hand in Holmes Beach. Uh, I think they have forgotten that, you know, we all work together as a team, and I think they forgot that. So I would love to see some communication going on with the mayor. Chief of Police, he will do whatever the mayor tells him, as far as I can tell. I think that's where it really comes from, predominantly. So, um, you know, I, I think that there needs some communication, and um, we need to get back to the way things were. Because if not, they're going to look real funny if their beaches uh, don't continue to be renourished. I don't know if they realize that or not, but they certainly can't afford to pay for the dredging. So we need to work together as a team and hopefully they'll remember that and try to meet us halfway that would be my hope but uh, commissioner you are coming in strong I knew you would and I appreciate it very much thank you um, Commissioner Servia and then the mayor yes thank you and Sherry if it's not too late could we put this on the agenda for Council of Governments meeting and invite the island communities and and let's have a discussion you know um, I, I agree but do you remember what council of governments is it's the fire departments it's every city it's the school board they get invited so um, you know how when we had single or Lombok Key, remember how we had single item issues where Lombok Key wanted to meet with us about being what is it beer can island and all we did it separately so I don't know it's we can do it all I'm just telling you that the other people may get upset or maybe they'll enjoy it. Well, we, we have, you've had <laughs> requests before from 
City of Palmetto and City of Bradenton School for specific board. issues. What you might want to do is just order it in the agenda so that okay. as it edits at the end and, and those that are interested can stay for that. Okay. Others can move on. That's I think it's point. time to hit it head on. Yeah, me too. Head on. Commissioner Satchel. And just real quick from getting the lay of the land, I'd just like to uh, thank Mayor Chappie for being uh, so reasonable and, uh, you know, so anything we can do how to work together with him. It's exciting to see somebody that's trying to work together to get things done. So we're going to ask Mayor Chappie to come up because so he could tell us what's going on in Bradenton Beach, if you could, about the referendums. And I'm sure you don't want to get involved with the Holmes Beach thing. Oh, why not? <laughs> or maybe you do, John. <laughs> um, first things, um, to answer a question that was posed or information you didn't have, in Bradenton Beach, homesteaded property uh, is only 10% of our properties in Bradenton Beach is homesteaded. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That, that was brought up earlier. John, say that again. I'm sorry. 10%. Only 10% of the properties in Holmes Beach or in Bradenton Beach are homestead. Wow. So I just thought I'd let you know that um, we are transient. Um, it's the way it's always been. Um, the, I, I text uh, um, our city attorney just to get it exactly straight. Yeah. As you know, we had, a re we had ref two referendums on the ballot this year with regards to parking garage. So I'm just going to read what it says. Private group of citizens forward a referendum to prohibit all parking garages in our charter. The city commission put forward a, com um, a, complete, a competing referendum to allow one garage with, the features, with future garages provided only by a referendum vote. Both passed the voters. Or go, or go the, uh, they mean they both failed. So today, the way it is, that oh. the only way a parking garage can uh, be built with a, uh, would have to be with changes to our zoning, um, LTD, and comprehensive plan. And of course, an application would have to be made for a parking garage uh, to the city and uh, could only be approved with public hearings with code changes to do so. Okay, That's so, the way it stands right now. So that means the board. The, whatever boards in the future, the boards now, the only way a parking garage can come is if you change your comp plan, your land development code, just like we would have to hear, right? Got yes. It. Okay. Good. Zoning, LDC, yeah, comp plan. Okay. Absolutely. And right now you don't allow it in your LDC, your car, comp You'd plan? To, you have to go for a change. Right. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. So. Anybody have questions for the mayor about Bradenton Beach? Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anything else on this issue? I think we've covered it nicely. Yeah. <laughs> no, Madam Chairman, I think we, um, you know, have clear what um, I need to do and have no problem reaching out to Home Speech and Anna Maria. Those mayors, you know, work with us on a variety of different issues, so I'm sure we'll be able to discuss it. So and we'll get it scheduled got clear for direction. the Council of Governments. Yes. I know we're not counting heads here, but I think it's pretty obvious that multiple commissioners are entertaining the idea. You might relay that message. Mm -hmm. I think they I probably will re watch it on YouTube. Okay. Um, with that, there's nothing further on the agenda. I'll go around the room to um, for comments. Commissioner Bellamy. Uh, groundbreaking for the, oh, for the pool. Yeah, Thursday. On Thursday. Thursday. Two p.m. Thursday at the Lincoln Park Pool in uh, Lincoln Park in Palmetto. Please, everyone, attend. It'll be an exciting project started. It's on your calendars. Thank you. Dress and it's up. outside and we dress accordingly. We don't have to dress up, correct? Correct. It's outside. Thank you. Me. Well, you may, but I'm going to wear jeans. <laughs> um, Commissioner Van Austenbridge? Yes. So first of all, it's an honor to be here. I'm my first, I guess it's not a meeting, it's a workshop, but uh, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, thank everyone who, who ultimately put me in this seat. Um, there was something I wanted to ask the county attorney about. Um, it looks as if Joe Biden is likely to be our next president, and a I lot of the people. No opinion okay, on that, right, okay. That's all right. Let's say there's a, there's a possibility. Okay? okay, and a lot of people that are likely to be in his administration are voicing um, the need for a federal shutdown of our economy, mm. and we went through that once already. When I was when I was running for office, the feedback that I got by we even did some polling, and by far the number one issue was keeping the economy open. And so my question to you would be, could you put together a, a workshop or some kind of presentation for us so that we as a county commission know what our options would be to defend and protect our local economy, protect our businesses, 
and our employees, the people around here, they don't want stimulus checks, right? They want paychecks. And so I, we have a lot of businesses in District 3 out on the island, hotels, restaurants. How can we, um, what, are the, what are our constitutional rights? What are the constitutional rights of our constituents and our business owners to keep them working and keep our economy going? I'm trying to protect our, our citizens. Well, we can certainly look into that if that's the prerogative of the board. That's going to take some work. I have to be okay. upfront with you about that. So we'd probably ask for a motion and vote. I mean, I can start looking into it and talk, bounce it around in the office, but probably at the next meeting we'll where the, the board can take action. You could do it in commissioner comments at the land use okay. meeting, and I'll be here for that if that's what you choose to do. Okay, so that's not till December 10th or right, 15th. I'll, we can start looking into it, but it may, it may you know, there's a two hour rule in the office if it's more than two hours of time. We like board action. Um, at some point we'll probably ask for a motion and vote on it because that's a project. I mean, I'm thinking just in terms of in the back of my head of how that would work. Sure. There is a commerce clause in the Constitution that has been used by the federal government sure. to regulate. Right, and it's a not just lot. businesses. Obviously, yeah. you know, freedom of religion comes into play as right. well. Right, I do understand there freedom are First assemble. Amendment issues. Sure. Yes, sir. We've been through um, that. So, um, you know, we'll start bouncing it around, but I may ask for a motion and vote on that. At the, 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 as soon as the board has the could, opportunity to do so, could we do that at the port authority? Um, no, no. Uh, but but what we can do is the attorney has a, a consensus. I mean, yeah. he has a feeling that we're okay with them proceeding with it, yeah. and I don't think it would not get voted for. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. I don't I mean, see anybody shaking their heads. Absolutely so. no. So that's how you do it. We'll get started on it, but I'm probably going to come back and ask you for a motion and vote just because it's we probably himself. will invest okay. some hours. Yeah, that's mainly to the protocols of the office and to make sure we're acting within the direction of the client. Okay. But we can certainly look into that for you and do some is research Is there something in between, like an, we don't want an emergency meeting, but is there no, like a special well, something? Well, we can always have a special meeting for that and the chairman can call it. I would... Uh, could, could you do that, like if we're at the Port Authority meeting, we're already there, maybe before it or right after it? I could do that. Um, I have no objection to that if that's the chair's I could have us... What, we have it. Where's we have one Thursday? Yes. Yeah, Thursday. This Thursday. Yes. Um, and we would have want to have a special meeting for. Say it again. Oh, to uh, essentially to direct the to county direct. attorney, right? To prepare a workshop. So you need to have at least twenty-four hours notice on the special meeting. So you have Tuesday. to. So we you have to do that tomorrow. Yeah, okay. we had enough time. Yeah. Okay. You do. So it's tight, but you could do it if as long as as long as. Sherry staff is aware we'd need that notice tomorrow. What time is the port meeting Thursday? Nine o'clock. Nine. Okay, we'll have it after the port meeting. Okay. D directly following the port meeting, Sherry? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will plan to be up there then for the port meeting. It's not the a port deal. meeting is here. It's here. Is it going to be here? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. We're, we're still here. There. Yeah, I guess we're, we're trying still to be here safe. I, yeah. I actually prefer it yeah. here, but I know yeah. we can't do that forever. So, All right. okay. anything else you've Really shook up the. <laughs> Good job, Kevin. Um, you sure, Kevin. Madam Chair, there, there, just as oh. a side note, there is a planning commission meeting at one o'clock on Thursday in this room. Oh, we'll be done. It's okay. a quick just, motion. Just a side note. Thank you for telling us that, though. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Bob. I didn't talk. No, he didn't. You made up for it. <laughs> um. Well, it's been an interesting day, an interesting workshop, and I've said all along that I knew um, our three commissioners would bring a new field to this board, and I can honestly say I do believe that's happened already. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be serving with our new commissioners. Um, it's really nice to have you on board. Thank you, all three. That's all. Um, Madam um, sec uh, Administrator, Madam Secretary. <laughs> Uh, you already mentioned the Lincoln Park pool groundbreaking. I just also wanted to let everybody know that um, last week, under the guise of Hurricane Etta, the Convention of Visitors Bureau um, adopted the World's Strongest Man oh, competition right. here for two days, moved it from the beach into the main hall. Um, really want to commend them for offering that. Sp had, uh, spoke to IMG, who was thrilled to have it here. They were completely engulfed in... Um, global um, visitors and then um, help them to move that back to the IMG campus on Saturday. So I want to commend them for that. Thank you. 
And who puts that I know IMG? Is it on like ESPN or? It, they have not announced the dates for the preliminary rounds for December, but they will come out here soon and um, they will show the um, finals in a two hour segment on December 26th. And the Bradenton area uh, logo and brand is, is what will be widely seen on that throughout those entire things. So you can see segments once they announce that we can broadcast this, but on December 26th for two hours, they have the finals. Please commend staff. How, uh, how many, you only had 24 hours notice or? I believe they had less than about 12 hours, 12 hours notice, notice to, to offer it and move it in. It okay. Really Please amazing. commend staff for that. They yes. did a good job. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I just want to real quick uh, echo Kevin's sentiments. It's great to be here finally and uh, get moving forward. I think we're going to have a great board. I think we have a lot of good ideas. I think we're all going to work well together and do a lot of great things for Manatee County. And It's been a long few months gearing up, the longest interview I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, Amen. We're all used to that. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here and I look forward to working with, uh, with all of you and everyone in Manatee County. So thank you. Mr. Servia? Yes, and I just want to say welcome again. It is a real pleasure to work with you guys at our first workshop, um, and I think that we have great things ahead. Um, I do have just a couple of issues very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking with Charlie Hunsicker over one of the breaks, and I know that several of us are going to the FAC conference. I don't know who is, has signed up to go, who's going in person, but Charlie and I have been talking about, because of the COVID standards and you know traveling up there together would not necessarily be a problem but once we're in an environment with so many people traveling back may present a risk and so we were talking about if we should drive separately separate cars if we should fly up you know what what is the best option so i'd kind of like to kick that around and decide what we're going to do um, I just want to share, I think everybody, well, some of the newer commissioners weren't there at the moat groundbreaking. It was a, a beautiful celebration. It's so exciting that moat is going to have their um, moat C uh, has been started and will soon uh, be appearing over by UTC. Very, very proud of that. Um, and then I would also like to suggest that we bring up the subject again of horseback riding in Palmasola Bay. I've had a number of emails about that, people asking me about it, and um, I, I don't know what the latest status is. So can pro I can provide you with the latest status. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I know uh, in Pinellas, uh, through the DEP, they banned horseback riding in the bay. Is that correct? And I've I've had a number of emails asking that we have that discussion again. Madam Chair, oh wait, that's me, sorry. I, uh, the, we brought uh, this up so many times that the last, and it's one person complaining who I love to death, Mr. Lombardo, but I have actually, um, I kicked it off to my son-in-law, who's the attorney at the city of Bradenton, and they kind of kicked it back to us, and um, then we have many citizens, as long as, um, I can say Kevin's grandmother lived there, there's always been horseback riding on the causeway, what the problem to me, and we don't know if it's a health problem, is because when we test the quality of water, the health department tests the south side of the causeway. They do not test the north side where the horses are. So we're saying that there's no issues, but we really don't know. That's a health department issue. But I don't have any appetite to get in the middle of this again because it is in the jurisdiction of the city of Bradenton. We did talk about the seagrasses at one point, but we wind our canal that goes into Robinson's to 150 feet. We made that channel bigger so that the, the um, Palmasola would um, flush faster in the last few years. So um, I have no appetite. And I saw all these cards going up. So Sherry first and then Vanessa. Well, I just and, wanted, and I'm ahead. not I'm done. Sorry, I, go right ahead. I just wanted to say that um, it, it's a little bit complicated because the county says it's the city's responsibility. The city says it's the DEP's responsibility. DEP says they need to talk to the county and the city. And so may, Sherry perhaps can clarify all of that for okay. us. But 
Well, we, we have worked on it um, a number of times. The city has allowed uh, that particular enterprise to happen mm -hmm. and to be conducted there. And so it is a question that we need to bounce back to, I believe, the new mayor, sorry, um, to see if that is something that they want to continue to do. Uh, you mentioned here we have a Council of Governments meeting coming up. It could be another topic that you want to you know, talk about all the different options because right now, we have not um, we have not got had an opportunity to have any more leverage in that conversation. We have worked the issue as much as we can for the citizen, and we have talked with both the city, um, the city, the city council, and we have also talked to DEP and FDOT and all of those organizations. Right, and I guess my biggest concern is I I don't fully understand if we have seagrasses there that are in jeopardy because of this activity. I'm not clear on that, and so that's what I'd like some information on because as we know, the seagrasses help to keep our water clean, and it's very important to maintain those. Are they being trampled by the horses or not? Um, I've heard so many different opinions, so um, discussing it at the Council of Governments would be a great thing if you guys are up for that. Um, might Madam, be the appropriate place. Madam Chair, can I just ask? Uh, our county attorney, and then I forgot right. who was next. Well, I have had a conversation with the city attorney about this issue. And it is true that the city controls the park improvements along that causeway. But from what he's explained to me, FDOT owns the entire causeway from shoreline to shoreline as right-of-way, not just the paved road, but the whole causeway, and the city is in there with FDOT's permission. And FDOT's view is, under Florida law, you have the right to go down a state right-of-way with a horse, just like you do with a tractor and all sorts of other traditional modes of transportation other than vehicles. So their view is that they cannot exclude horses from that right-of-way, which includes the park. So the discussion we had was the only way to remedy that would be for FDOT to, to transfer the right-of-way that is outside of the actual paved road and shoulder to a local government who would then have the ability under Florida law to exclude horses. That's the conversation we had maybe a month and a half ago. That's very helpful, Bill. Um, who has jurisdiction over the waters? Is it DEP? That is DEP. Right. Yes. So DEP would be the one making the call on whether or not that's appropriate in the water. Is that correct? Yeah, probably. Okay. Probably. But it's not us. Um, I'm Vanessa. sorry, I lost track. It's Vanessa and then Reggie. Yeah. Um, Deputy County, I have to stop and think. Whatever, I, I can't keep Just up with your Bill. title Bill's right fine. now. Bill's fine. Yeah. Bill's fine. We're uh, first name I, basis now. I'm glad you said what you did because that's exactly what I had planned on saying. It is up to DOT. Uh, I can tell you that I don't have any appetite for this Neither only because, um, you know, number one, I've, I've looked into this uh, heavily and there is no evidence that the grasses are being hindered. Um, and it really depends on when you're talking to the resident, you know, what their views are on it. But from what I've been told by people in the know, um, the grasses are not being damaged. So, uh, and with it being DOT, et cetera, et cetera, um, I, I just don't have any appetite to, at this point, I think we have many issues in this county, a lot more important that we probably need to tackle than to try and take that on at this point. That's just me. I thought I would just share okay, that. Okay, and Reggie? Nope. Okay. So um, the discussion is, again, uh, say, uh, re uh, round it up one more time so that we can, so the public hears what you said, and then hopefully this will be over with. Are you, are you asking me, Madam Chair? Yeah, yeah well, I think the discussion would be we could, we could talk to the city about going to FDOT and asking them to convey or transfer the beach areas to either the city or the county. Um, but with that comes the maintenance responsibility we of that, that property. But that would be the way that one or the other local government could acquire the right to prevent horses from going through there into the water. Okay. So we got that? Okay. Is that all, Misty? Thank so. you. Yeah.
on that. Did you so want to, Reggie? Th sum this up. That's not our responsibility. We can't do anything about it. That's the right. bottom line, that's, right? That's, that's line. exactly right. I'll write it in. Okay. <laughs> Clear that up. If they want to bring it up at the Bam. Council of Governments, they can, but we'll make sure that our attorney's with us yeah, here. Okay, Mr. S uh, Satcher? Commissioner Satcher? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, just want to let everyone know I appreciate you, and uh, it's good to be here. And just a special thanks to the citizens of Mantilla County and, um, and the Lord. He's been so good to each of us, and, uh, and so I'm grateful. Thank you. Very nice. Well, in the meantime, I've been getting held by the mayor of Holmes Beach. <laughs> so, uh, I, and they're watching, so I just want to uh, read what she wrote. Why are you <laughs> allowing your commissioners to state untruths? You know that Holmes Beach has 1,307 parking spaces for beach access. Um, I should have also invited them. I didn't actually know this was on the agenda until Sunday night, and I didn't really read it till yesterday, so I apologize to the mayor on that. And she did not wasn't aware of the... And I mentioned that Commissioner Chappie's here, and um, and this is public record, Judy. I'm sorry, but I have to read it um, because um, it's sunshine. If I don't, public records um, said she also said Kevin, Kevin had not reached out to her to discuss anything on this issue, which is true. Um, but uh, we brought up at this meeting that he may be meeting with you guys to talk about it or with the county administrator. Um, she assumed this was just a Brainton Beach parking agenda. And I did say to her, I had been trying to call her in the past, I didn't leave messages, and I guess she wanted me to leave a message. You know, I live in the city of Holmes Beach uh, for many, many years. I was in her position as mayor and as a city commissioner, and um, you need to stay on top of what's going on. Um, I did not put this on the agenda. I don't even know who did. Um, uh, we had asked to have this brought yes. up a long time ago, right? Yes, this is a this is a holdover item um, that has been since May, I think, April or May of last year, when there were so many issues out on the beach during the parking for okay. the really high times with COVID. And it was presented in the strategic plan as being done today. It, it seemed to go along well with the Jitney discussion, and um, that's why... And um, she says we have 1,307 parking spots. I don't know if that's on top of the 434 that we have in Beach Renourishment or if that's on top. It's still not the 2,500. Are they open? But, yeah, if um, I know, I told you I read in the paper that certain parking spots are for golf carts and you have to get some kind of sticker. I told you all that. So I'm not sure. Madam um, Chair, which commissioners are your commissioners? All the commissioners. She, she asked why you allowed your commissioners. Oh. to speak certain ways. I was wondering which commissioner well, is yours. Well, I just think as me being that's chair, true. she meant I let okay. my commissioners. That's how, as, that's as the, just as the mayor, terminology. As the mayor, I'd wonder which of the city commissioners are hers as well. <laughs> okay. I think you guys need to have a talk. <laughs> no, uh, I know the city of Home Speech is listening, and I know they're having their meeting tonight. I hope they... Um, me as a home speech citizen, I did send an email, didn't get a response back about the boots on the, on the cars if you've had two parking tickets in my city. Um, saw it on Facebook, it's a bunch of citizens are bringing this up. Um, I'm hoping I know she'll talk to the commissioners about it. I don't really think um, the mayor was behind that. I think maybe some of the city commissioners were because the mayor is, does not vote in home speech, they're only the administrator. So um, as far as this other parking issue, Mayor, I wish you would call Commissioner Van Austin Bridges or, or vice versa and you guys talk and then somebody put something in writing about the 1,307 parking spots and what is, if that includes the um, required parking by beach, beach renourishment because for somebody that lives there, you think I would know and I don't know. Yes, no problem. Well, I know we, we have that. We'll get that from the, the mayor. Yeah, and the main number I'm looking for are the exact number of beach parking spaces prior to COVID-19. Um, that the contract allows or that the city had allowed? I want to know how many the city of Holmes Beach had prior to COVID-19. Okay, and the mayor, I know, is listening, so hopefully we'll get those That's numbers. The That's not what I was going to bring up. Anyway, today is usually a work session, so you can dress it however you like on these days. Um, just so you know, but today was our swearing in. It was a special day, so just wanted to let everybody know that. Uh, we do have some board members that left that were on various boards, Madam um, Administrator. Uh, how do we used to like appoint 
commissioners to take their places until January when uh, whoever the new chairman is appoints to the boards or they sign up for them. How do we handle that? Which boards are you, if you're talking about, um, there is a decision in December that the, um, at your December meeting, are you talking about no, I'm uh, talking looking about, at the vice chair? It, no, 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 I'm not talking about that board. I'm talking about like boards. Peace River, um, MPO, any of those boards meeting before um, the before, next meeting, we, us we usually put somebody in those slots. I'm not interested in it because I have enough to do with my husband, but I've got my boards. Yeah, yeah we can bring that list back into to this board. Um, uh, it's kind of like a Kevin thing. Maybe if uh, if somebody can make a list and see what's open and see what commissioner would like to cover until we, till whoever the new chair is um, and you guys applied that we do a formal thing. I think we've always done that in the past, and I was thinking about that earlier. Yeah, we can take a look at what the three outgoing commissioners were seated Peace on River, and bring that list yeah, back to Yeah, Sarasota you. Bay Estuary, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Baugh? Yeah, uh, you know, we're only talking about a month. I know, and but I we think still do most it. Of, I think most of the positions that you're referring to have alternates. I, I think I don't know. That's why I want to ask. Well, yeah, we'll check. MPO, we don't. I don't believe we have a meeting in December. No, Vanessa's right. Yeah. yeah. So okay, I don't know. Well, I don't know what other... in place to oh. handle those things, and it's only for one month. Right. I don't so. know uh, what okay, other we'll boards find we have, out who the and if there were any are, meeting, because yeah. I know Reggie has a meeting yeah. uh, with your board that you have, or did you already have it this week? Yeah. Which one? Um, public Wednesday. safety yeah, that's, court. That's Wednesday. Coming. Okay. I know that there's other boards that they attended, so I just wanted to make sure. And also, you mentioned the Blackstone ribbon cutting in it. Um, it was a good day today, and I appreciate everybody's Lincoln. hard work. And with that, I don't know, it is uh, 3.57. We're going to adjourn this meeting.
Council meeting, Wednesday, October 28, 2020. Um, City Council Chambers will be open to the public. All are welcome to attend this meeting. Social distancing and screening will be enforced. Any member of the public wishing to comment may do so at the meeting. Citizens may also submit their comments in writing to City Clerk at cityofbradenton.com or voicemail by calling 941-932-9437 on the Tuesday before the meeting. Uh, Mayor and Council may not receive your comments before the meeting if not received by this deadline. And as always, we begin our deliberations with an invocation in the Pledge of Allegiance. The invocation will be led today by Tom Pelt, lead pastor at the Church of Bradenton. Pastor, please come forward. Please stand. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we just bless your holy name this morning. You are high and lifted up. You are rightfully adored, and yet you are you're right here among us. You gave your life for us. Lord, and you walk with us this day, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray wisdom for these, your servant leaders, um, a spirit of discernment when they don't have the luxury of choosing between uh, right and wrong, black and white, just something easy. But Lord, when they've got to choose between two or three less than ideal options, give them that discernment. Lord God, may a spirit of unity and peace just reign over this council. Lord God, we pray together that you would continue to come against this plague, uh, Lord God, over COVID-19, that those that are here in this city, in our county, Lord God, that are struggling with this would find healing, that you would uh, just be the strength and comfort for their family members, Lord God. Lord, I pray for each one of these council members, for our mayor and each one represented. Lord, long after, uh, none of us have the titles that uh, we hold today, the roles that we play today. We're just people. And Lord God, I'm, 